Tract 41 from Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by B. Swiss Candle. Via Media, Number 2, by John Henry Newman. Oh, I'm come for some further conversation with you, or rather, for another exposition of your views on church matters. Oh, I'm not well read enough to argue with you, nor, on the other hand, do I profess to admit all you say. But I want, if you will let me, to get at your opinions. So will you lecture if I give the subjects? To lecture, as you call it, is quite beyond me, since at best I have but a smattering of reading in church history. The more's the pity, though I have as much as a great many others. For ignorance of our historical position as churchmen is one of the special evils of the day. Yet, even with a little knowledge, I am able to see certain facts which seem quite inconsistent with notions at present received. For my practice, I should be ashamed of myself if I guided it by any theories. Here the letter and spirit of the liturgy is my direction, as it is of all classes of churchmen, high and low. Yet, though I do not lay a great stress on such views as I gather from history, it is to my mind a strong confirmation of them that they just account for and illustrate the conclusions to which I am led by plain obedience to my ordination vows. If you only wish to keep to the liturgy, not to change, what did you mean the other day by those ominous words in which you suggested the need for a second reformation? Because I think the Church has in a measure forgotten its own principles, as declared in the 16th century. Nay, under stranger circumstances, as far as I know, that have attended any of the errors and corruptions of the Papists. Grievous as are their declensions from primitive usage, I never heard in any case of their practice directly contradicting their services. Whereas we go on lamenting once a year the absence of discipline in our church, yet do not even dream of taking any one step towards its restoration. Again, we confess in the Articles that excommunication is a solemn duty of the Church under certain circumstances, and that the excommunicated person must be openly reconciled by penance before he is acknowledged by the faithful as a brother. Yet excommunication, I am told, is now a civil process, which takes place as a matter of course at a certain stage of certain law proceedings. Here a reformation is needed. Only of discipline, not of doctrine, Again, when the church, with an unprecedented confidence, bound herself hand and foot, and made herself over to the civil power in order to escape the Pope, she did not expect that infidels, as it has lately been hinted, would be suffered to have the absolute disposal of the crown patronage. This again might be considered matter of discipline. Our reformation of the 16th century was one of matters of faith and therefore we do not need a second reformation in the same sense in which we needed a first. In what points would you say the Church's faith was reformed in the 16th century? Take the then received belief in purgatory and pardons, which alone was a sufficient corruption to call for a reformation. I conceive the presumption of the Popish doctrine on these points to lie in adding to the means of salvation set forth in Scripture. Almighty God has said his son's merit shall wash away all sin, that they shall be conveyed to believers through the two sacraments, whereas the Church of Rome has added other ways of gaining heaven. Granted, the belief in purgatory and pardons disparages the sufficiency, first of Christ's merits, and next of his appointed sacraments. And by received belief, I suppose you mean that it was the popular belief which clergy and laity acted on, not that it was necessarily contained in any particular doctrinal formulary. Proceed. Do you not suppose that there are multitudes both among clergy and laity at the present day who disparage, not indeed Christ's merits, but the sacraments he has appointed? And if so, is not their error so far the same in kind as that of the Romish church, the preferring Abana and Fapa to the waters of Jordan? Take the sacrament of baptism. Have not some denomination of schismatics invented a rite of dedication instead of baptism? And do not churchmen find themselves under the temptation of countenancing this papist-like presumption? Again, there is a well-known sect which denies both baptism and the Lord's Supper. A churchman must believe its members to be altogether external to the fold of Christ. Whatever benevolent works they may be able to show, 
Still, if we receive the Church's doctrine concerning the means generally necessary to salvation, we must consider such persons to be mere heathens, except in knowledge. Now, would there not be an outcry raised, as if I were uncharitable? Did I refuse the rights of burial to such an one? The outcry would not proceed from the better informed or the rulers of our Church. Happily, we are not as yet so corrupted as the era of the Reformation. Our prelates are still sound, and know the difference between what is modern and what is ancient. Yet is not the mode of viewing the subject I refer to a growing one? And how does it differ from the presumption of the papists? In both cases, the power of Christ's sacraments is denied. In the one case, by the unbelief of restlessness and fear. In the other, by the unbelief of profaneness. Well, Supposing I grant that the church of this day is in a measure faulty in faith and discipline, more or less, of course, according to the diocese and neighbourhood, now in the next place, what do you mean by your reformation? I would do what our reformers in the 16th century did. They did not touch the existing documents of doctrine. There was no occasion. They kept the creeds as they were, but they added protests against the corruptions of faith, worship and discipline, which had grown up round them. I would do the same thing now if I could. I would not change the articles. I would add to them. Add protests against the Erastinism and the Latitudinarianism which have encrusted them. I would append to the Catechism a section on the power of the Church. You have not mentioned any corruptions at present in worship. Do you consider that there are such, as well as errors of faith and discipline? Our liturgy keeps us right in the main, yet there are what may be considered such, though for the most part occasional, to board over the altar of a church, place an orchestra there of playhouse singers, and take money at the doors, seems to me as great an outrage as to sprinkle the forehead with holy water and to carry lighted tapers in a procession. Do not speak so harshly of what has often been done piously, George the Third was a patron of concerts in one of our cathedrals. Far be it from my mind to dare to arraign the actions of that religious king. The same deed is of a different nature at different times and under different circumstances. Music in a church may as reverently subserve the feelings of devotion as pictures or architecture, but it may not. You could not prevent such a desecration by adding a fortieth article to the thirty-nine. Not directly. Yet, though there is no article directly condemning religious processions, they have nevertheless been discontinued. In like manner, were an article framed, to speak by way of illustration, declaratory of the sanctity of places set apart to the worship of God and the reception of the saints that sleep, Doubtless churchmen will be saved from many profane feelings and practices of the day, which they give in to unawares, such as the holding vestries in churches, the flocking to preachers rather than to sacraments, as if the servant were above the master who is lord over his own house, the luxurious and fashionable fitting up of town churches, the proposal to allow schismatics to hold their meetings in them, the off-hand project of pulling them down for the convenience of streets and roads, and the wanton preference, for it is frequently wanton, of unconsecrated places, whether for preaching to the poor or for administering sacred rites to the rich. It is visionary to talk of such a reformation. The people would not endure it. It is, but I am not advocating it. I am but raising a protest. I say this ought to be because of the angels, but I do not hope to persuade others to think as I do. Oh, I think I quite understand the ground you take. You consider that, as time goes on, fresh and fresh articles of faith are necessary to secure the church's purity, according to the rise of successive heresies and errors. These articles are all hidden, as it were, from the first, in the church's bosom, and brought out into form according to the occasion. Such was the Nicene Confession against Arius, the English Articles against Popery, and such are those now called for in this age of schism, to meet the new heresy, which denies the Holy Catholic Church, the heresy of Hoadley and others like him. Yes, and let it never be forgotten that whatever were the errors of the convocation of our Church in the beginning of the 18th century, 
it expired in an attempt to brand the doctrines of Holy. May the day be merely delayed. Or I understand you further to say that you hold to the reformers as far as they have spoken out in our formularies, which at the same time you consider as incomplete, that the doctrines which are wanting in the articles, such as the Apostolical Commission, are the doctrines of the Catholic Church, doctrines which a member of that church holds as such prior to subscription, that, moreover, they are quite consistent with our articles, sometimes even implied in them, and sometimes clearly contained in the liturgy, though not in the articles, as the Apostolical Commission and the Ordination Service. Lastly, that we are clearly bound to believe, and all of us do believe, as essential, doctrines which nevertheless are not contained in the articles, as, for example, the inspiration of Holy Scripture. Yes, and further I maintain that, while I fully concur in the articles, as far as they go, those who call one papist do not acquiesce in the doctrine of the liturgy. This is a subject I especially wish drawn out. You threw out some hints about it the other day, though I cannot say you convinced me, or have misgivings, after all, that our reformers only began their own work. Do not say they saw the tendency and issue of their opinions, but surely, had they lived, and had the opportunity of doing more, they would have given in to much more liberal notions, as they are called, than you are disposed to concede. It's not by producing a rubric or an insulated passage from the services that you can destroy this impression. Such instances only show that they were inconsistent, which I will grant. Still, is not the genius of our formularies towards a more latitudinarian system than they reach? I will cheerfully meet you on the ground you propose. Let us carefully examine the liturgy in its separate parts. I think it will decide the point which I contended for the other day, viz. that we are more Protestant than our reformers. What do you mean by Protestant in your present use of it? A number of distinct doctrines are included in the notion of Protestantism, and as to all these, our church has taken the via media between it and popery. At present, I will use it in the sense most apposite to the topics we have been discussing, viz. as the religion of so-called freedom and independence, as hating superstition, suspicious of forms, jealous of priestcraft, advocating heart worship. Characteristics, which admit of a good or a bad interpretation, but which, understood as they are instanced in the majority of persons who are zealous for what is called Protestant doctrine, are, I maintain, very inconsistent with the liturgy of our church. Now let us begin with the confirmation service. Will not the baptismal be more to your purpose? In it, regeneration is connected with the formal act of sprinkling a little water on the forehead of an infant. It is true, but I would rather show the general spirit of the services then take those obvious instances which, it seems, you can find out for yourself. Is it not certain that a modern Protestant, even though he granted that children were regenerated in baptism, would, in the confirmation service, have made them some address about the necessity of spiritual renovation, of becoming new creatures, etc.? I do not say such warning is not very appropriate, nor do I propose to account for our churches not giving it. But is it not quite certain that the present prevailing temper in the church would have given it, judging from the prayers and sermons of the day, and that the liturgy does not? Were that day like this, would it not have been deemed formal and cold, and deficient in spiritual mindedness, to have proposed a declaration such as has been actually adopted, that, to the end that confirmation may be ministered to the more edifying of such as shall receive it, None hereafter shall be confirmed, but such as can say the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments, etc. Nothing being said of a change of heart, or spiritual affections. And yet, upon this mere external profession, the children receive the imposition of the bishop's hands, to certify them by this sign of God's favour and gracious goodness towards them. From the line you are adopting... I see you will find services more anti-Protestant, in the modern sense of Protestant, than that for confirmation. Take again the catechism. What can be more technical and formal, as the persons I speak of would say, than the division of our duties into our duty towards God, 
and our duty towards our neighbour. Indeed, would not the very word duty be objected to by them as obscuring the evangelical character of Christianity? Why is there no mention of newness of heart, of appropriating the mercies of redemption, and such like phrases, which are now common among so-called Protestants? Why no mention of justifying faith? Faith is mentioned in an earlier part of the Catechism. Yes, and it affords a remarkable contrast to the modern use of the word. Nowadays, the prominent notion conveyed by it regards its properties, whether spiritual or not, warm, self-renouncing. But in the Catechism, the prominent notion is that of its object, the believing all the articles of the Christian faith, according to the Apostles' Declaration that it is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Or understand, and the creed is also introduced into the service for baptism, and still more remarkably, in the order for visiting the sick. More remarkably, both because of the season when it is introduced, when a Christian is drawing near his end, and also as being a preparation for the absolution. Most comfortable, truly in his last hour, is such a distinct rehearsal of the great truths on which the Christian has fed by faith, with thanksgiving, all his life long. Yet it surely would not have suggested itself to a modern Protestant. He would rather have instituted some more searching examination, as he would call it, of the state of the sick man's heart, whereas the whole of the minister's exhortation is what the modern school calls code and formal. It ends thus, I require you to examine yourself and your estate, both toward God and man, so that accusing and condemning yourself for your faults, you may find mercy at our Heavenly Father's hand for Christ's sake, and not be accused and condemned in that fearful judgment. Therefore I shall rehearse to you the articles of our faith, that you may know whether you believe as a Christian man should or no. You observe the rubric which follows. It speaks of a further examination. True, still it is what would now be called formal and external. Yet it mentions a great number of topics for examination, whether he repent him truly of his sins and be in charity with all the world, exhorting him to forgive from the bottom of his heart all persons that have offended him, and if he hath offended any other, to ask them forgiveness, and where he hath done injury or wrong to any man, that he make amends to the uttermost of his power, and if he hath not before disposed of his goods, let him then be admonished to make his will and to declare his debts, what he oweth, and what is owing to him, for the better discharging of his conscience and the quietness of his executors. Here is an exhortation to repentance, charity, forgiveness of injuries, humbleness of mind, honesty and justice. What could be added? You will be told that worldly and spiritual matters are mixed together. Besides, not a word said of looking to Christ, resting on him, renovation of heart. Such are the expressions which modern Protestantism would have considered necessary, and would have inserted as such. They are good words. Still, they are not those which our Church considers the words for a sickbed examination. She does not give them the prominence which is now given them. She adopts a manner of address which savours of what is now called formality. That our Church was no stranger to the more solemn kind of language, which persons now use on every occasion, is evident from the prayer for a sick person where there appeareth small hope of recovery, and the commendatory prayer. Still, she adopts the other as her ordinary manner. What can corroborate what you just now observed about the creed, but what I lately read in some book or books advocating a revision of the liturgy, it was vehemently objected to the Apostles' Creed that it contained no confession of the doctrine of the Atonement, nor, I think, of original sin. It is well to see persons consistent. When they go full lengths, they startle others, and perhaps, please God, themselves. Indeed, I wish men would stop a while and seriously reflect whether the mere verbal opposition which exists between their own language and the language of services, to say nothing to the difference of spirit, is not a sort of warning to them, if they would take it, against inconsiderately proceeding in their present course. But nothing is more rare at this day than quiet thought. Everyone is in a bustle, being bent to do a great deal. 
We preach and run from house to house. We do not pray or meditate, but to return. Next, consider the first exhortation to the communion. Would it not be called, if I said it in discourse of my own, dark, cold, and formal? The way and means thereto to receive worthily is, first to examine your lives and conversations by the rule of God's commandments, etc. Therefore, if any of you be a blasphemer of God, an hinderer or slanderer of his word, an adulterer, or be in malice or envy or any other grievous crime, repent you of your sins, etc. Now this is what is called, in some quarters, by a great abuse of terms, mere morality. If I understand you, the liturgy, all along, speaks of the gospel dispensation under which it is our blessedness to live, as being, at the same time, a moral law, that this is its prominent view, and that external observances and definite acts of duty are made the means and the tests of faith. Yes, and that, in thus speaking, it runs quite counter to the innovating spirit of this day, which proceeds rashly forward on large and general views, sweeps along with one or two prominent doctrines to the comparative neglect of the details of duty, and drops articles of faith and positive and ceremonial observances as beneath the attention of a spiritual Christian, as monastic and superstitious, as forms, as minor points, as technical lip-worship, narrow-minded and bigoted. Next, consider the wording of one part of the commination service. He was wounded for our offences and smitten for our wickedness. Let us therefore return to him, who is the merciful receiver of all true penitent sinners, assuring ourselves that he is ready to receive us and most willing to pardon us, if we come unto him with faithful repentance, if we will submit ourselves to him and from henceforth walk in his ways, if we will take his easy yoke and light burden upon us, to follow him in lowliness, patience and charity, and be ordered by the governance of his Holy Spirit, seeking always his glory and serving him duly in our vocation of thanksgiving. This, if we do, Christ will deliver us from the curse of the law, etc. Did another say this, he would be accused by the Protestant of this day of interfering with the doctrine of justification by faith. You have not spoken of the daily service of the church or of the litany. I should have more remarks to make than I like to trouble you with. First, I should observe on the absence of what are now called exclusively the great Protestant doctrines, or at least of the modes of expression in which it is at present the fashion to convey them. For instance, the collects are summaries of doctrine. Yet I believe they do not once mention what has sometimes been called the Articula Santus Vel Cadentis Ecclesiae. It proves to me that true and important as this doctrine is in a controversial statement, its direct mention is not so apposite in devotional and practical subjects as modern Protestants of our Church would consider it. Next, consider the general confession, which prays simply that God will grant us hereafter to live a godly, righteous, and sober life. Righteous and sober. Alas, this is the very sort of words which Protestants consider superficial. Good, as far as they go, but nothing more. In like manner, the priest in the absolution bids us pray God that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy. But I have given instances enough to explain my meaning about the services generally. You can continue the examination for yourself. I will direct your notice to but one instance more, the introduction of the Psalms into the daily service. Do you think a modern Protestant would have introduced them into it? They are inspired. Yes, but they are also what is called Jewish. I do certainly think, I cannot doubt, that had the liturgy been compiled in a day like this, at most, but a selection of them would have been inserted in it though they were all used in the primitive worship from the very first. Do we not hear objections to using them in singing, and a wish to substitute hymns? Is not this a proof what judgment would have been passed on the introduction into the service by reformers in the 19th century? First, the imprecatory psalms, as they are called, 
would have been set aside, of course. Yes, so I cannot doubt it, though some of them at least are prophetic, and expressly ascribed in the New Testament to the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And surely numerous other passages would have been pronounced unsuitable to the spiritual faith of a Christian. I mean all such as speak of our being rewarded according to the cleanness of our hands, and of our walking innocently, and of the Lord's doing well to those that are good and true of heart. Indeed, this doctrine is so much the characteristic of that heavenly book, that I hardly see any part of it could have been retained, but what is clearly predictive of the Messiah. Oh, I shall now take my leave, with many thanks, and will think over what you have said. However, have you not been labouring superfluously? We know all along that the Puritans of Hooker's time did object to the prayer book. There is no need of proving that. I am not speaking of those who would admit they are Puritans, but of that arrogant Protestant spirit, so-called, of the day, in and out of the church, if it is possible to say what is in and what is out, which thinks it takes bold and large views, and would fain ride over the superstitions and formalities which it thinks it sees in those who, I maintain, hold to the old Catholic faith. And as seeing that this spirit is coming on apace, I cry out betimes, whatever comes, it is that corruptions are pouring in, which sooner or later will need a second reformation. End of Tract 41Tract 42 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Bishop Wilson's Meditations on His Sacred Office. Number 1. Sunday. By Thomas Wilson. Question from the Office of Consecration. Are you persuaded that you be truly called to this ministration, according to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ in the order of this realm? Answer. I am so persuaded. Almighty God, who by thy providence hast brought me into thine immediate service, accept my desire of serving thee, and grant that, in the sincerity of my soul, I may perform the several duties of my calling, and the vows that are upon me. Blessed be thy good spirit, that ever it come in my heart to become thy minister. May the same good spirit make me truly sensible of the honour and danger of so great a trust, and of the account I am to give, and give me grace to make amends by my future diligence for the many days and years that I have spent unprofitably, and this I beg for Jesus Christ his sake. He that doth not find himself endued with the spirit of his calling hath reason to fear that God never called him. Marks of a True Pastor St. John, chapter 10, verse 1. He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. A lawful entrance, upon motives which aim at the glory of God and the good of souls, an external call and mission from the apostolic authority of bishops. The sheep hear his voice, that is, when he speaks to their hearts and to their capacities. He that calleth his sheep by name, that is, he knows them so well as to know all their wants. He goeth before them, and they follow him. He leads such a life as they may safely follow. The stranger they will not follow. That is, they ought not to follow such as break Catholic unity. I am the door. It is by Jesus Christ, not by us, that the flock is kept in safety. Without him we can do nothing, neither by our learning, our eloquence, or our labours. This is to rob Christ of the glory of saving his sheep, and to enter into the ministry only to plunder the church of her revenues. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, either by spending it in the ministry, or suffering, if there be occasion, never sacrificing the flock to his own ease, avarice, or humours. The hireling careth not for the sheep. He lords it over them, makes what advantage he can of them, and counts them his own no longer than they are profitable to him. He leaves them, that is, when dangers threaten. Then the good shepherd and the hireling are discovered. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 4 
No man taketh this honour unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 2. High priest, who can have compassion on the ignorant, and on them that are out of the way. A pastor, who is sensible of his own infirmities, will not fail to treat sinners with meekness and compassion. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17. They watch for your souls as they that must give account. A most dreadful consideration, this. Insomuch as that St. Chrysostom said, upon reflecting upon it, it is a wonder if any ruler in the church be saved. It will be work enough for every man to give an account for himself, but stand charged and to be accountable for many others. Who can think of it without trembling? Oh, God! How presumptuous was I to be persuaded to take upon me this charge! Who will value himself upon ecclesiastical dignities, who considers that Judas was chosen to be an apostle? O oh, good shepherd, I beseech thee for myself and for my flock to seek us, to find us, to lead us, to defend us, and to preserve us to life eternal. If God be satisfied with a pastor, it is of little importance whether he please or displease men. Titus chapter 2 verse 15 These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all our authority. Let no man despise thee that is, for want of exercising ecclesiastical discipline. The following are truths which cannot be preached too often. It is the bondage of man by sin, the necessity of a deliverer, the manner of our redemption, the danger of not closing with it, the power of grace to deliver us, etc. A pastor should do all this, and act with the dignity of a man who acts by the authority of God. The authority of bishops. We are willing enough to desire to imitate Jesus Christ and his apostles in their authority, without thinking of following them in their humility, their labours, self-denial, etc. A bishop is a pastor set over other pastors. They were to ordain elders. They might receive an accusation against an elder. They were to charge them to preach such and such doctrines, to stop the mouths of deceivers, to set in order the things that were wanting. And lastly, this was the form of church government in all ages, so that to reject this is to reject an ordinance of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19 Whosoever shall do and teach the commandments, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of God. It is in this the true greatness of a bishop does consist, not in the eminence of a sea, multitude of attendants, favour of princes, etc. Bishops were called to sit in Parliament, to give their counsel according to God's law, as the civil judges were to give their advice according to the temporal laws in matters of difficulty. Mark chapter 10, verse 44. Whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. The greatest prelate in the church is he who is most conformable to the example of Christ, by humility, charity, and care of his flock, and who, for Christ's sake, will be a servant to the servants of God. O sovereign pastor of souls, renew in thy church, and especially in me, this spirit of humility, that I may serve thee in the meanest of thy servants. If I lie under the necessity of being served by others, let it be with regret, and let me exact no more service than is necessary. Luke chapter 10, verse 3. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. It belongs to thee, O Lamb of God, to guard both me and my flock from wolves who assault us, either openly or in sheep's clothing. I depend entirely upon thee, in whatever relates to my own preservation, or that of the people committed to my care. Luke chapter 19, verse 20. Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. O oh, my Saviour, I tremble to think how I have followed the example of this slothful servant, and what reason I have to dread his doom. Rest is a crime in one who has promised to labour all the days of his life, and in me, therefore, it is a great evil not to be always doing good. 
pardon me, my God, for what is past. And let me not imagine that, because I am free from gross and scandalous crimes, that therefore I lead a good life. O Lord, give me grace proportionable to the talents I have received, and to the account I am to give, that I may faithfully perform all the duties belonging to my state. Amen. Whoever is associated in the priesthood of Christ ought, in imitation of him, to sacrifice himself for the advantage of his church, and for all the designs of God. Luke chapter 22, verse 26. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. A bishop does not know his office in the church, if he pretends to distinguish himself by power, imperiousness, and grandeur, or by any other way than by humility, and by a great concern for souls. Marks of distinction are rather a burthen, which he bears out of necessity, but complains of them secretly to God. He considers himself as the servant, not as the Lord of souls. Even Christ Jesus made himself our pattern in this. Translation of Bishops and Pastors Self-love is too often at the bottom, and not the glory of God or the good of souls. When men's labours are attended with tolerable success, yet, because either they can better their temporal condition, or think that a more public station will be more suitable to their great capacities, they leave their station for one more full of dangers, without any prospect of being more serviceable to God or to his church and the souls of men, not considering that this is the voice of pride, self-love and covetousness, and an evil example to others, to whom we do, or should, preach humility as the very foundation of Christianity. The greater share we have in the authority of Jesus Christ, the greater we must expect to have in his sufferings, the cross being the reward of faithful pastors. To leave a clergy and a people to whom one is perfectly well known, to go to another to whom one is a stranger, and this for the sake of riches which are supposed to have been renounced, this was unknown to the first ages of Christianity. He is but the vain image of a pastor, an idle shepherd who chooses to abandon his flock and leave them to the conduct of those who have no concern for them, and entrust the salvation of those souls to others, for whom he himself is responsible to God. He may be learned, he may be employed, etc., but he cannot be a good shepherd. Church Government Colossians chapter 4 verse 5 Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Prudence is very necessary in dangerous times, it being no small fault to give occasion to the raising of storms against the church and her ministers, for want of having a due regard to the times and to the passions of carnal men. Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 and 27. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. God, give me a true and prudent humility to have nothing of the air of secular governors, to attend the flock of Christ as a servant, to look on him as my pattern, to study his conduct and spirit, to spend and be spent for my flock, that I may never desire to increase my burden, that I may be better qualified to be ministered unto, and that I may never strive to live at ease, in plenty, in luxury, repose, and independence. Amen. The name of a servant ought to be esteemed honourable to the eye of faith and a real privilege, since Jesus Christ took upon him the nature of a servant. Bishops and priests, saith St. Ambrose, are honourable on account of the sacrifice they offer, the power of the keys and the exercise of that power, the due use of confirmation, and, previous to that, examination. A strict examination into the learning lives and characters of such as are designed for holy orders are matters of infinite and eternal concern. 
and man may be ruined by those very means which were designed to enable him to discharge his duty with more convenience. And bishops have too often been put into such easy circumstances as to forget that they were bishops. Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 And he had in his right hand seven stars. Make me, O Jesus, a shining star in thy church. Support me by thy right hand. Guide and direct me by thy light. Let me never become a wandering star. A primitive bishop will be careful to avoid, as much as possible, worldly equipage and retinue, excess, pomp and ostentation. Bishops are called angels in the Revelations, intimating that they should have no interest on earth at heart so much as that of the good of the church and the honour of God. At the Lord's Supper, before the service begins, may it please thee, O God, who has called us to this ministry, to make us worthy to offer unto thee this sacrifice for our own sins and for the sins of thy people. Accept our service and our persons through our Lord Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. O reject not this people for me and for my sins. Upon placing the arms upon the altar. All that we possess is the effect of thy bounty, O God. Of thy own do we give thee. Pardon on our vain expenses, and accept of this testimony of our gratitude to thee, our benefactor, for the Lord Jesus' sake. Upon placing the elements upon the altar, vouchsafe to receive these thy creatures from the hands of us sinners, O thou self-sufficient God. Immediately after the consecration, we offer unto thee, our King and our God, this bread and this cup. We give thee thanks for these and all thy mercies, beseeching thee to send down thy Holy Spirit upon this sacrifice, that he may make this bread the body of thy Christ, and this cup the blood of thy Christ, and that all we who are partakers thereof may thereby obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And together with us, remember, O God, for good, the whole mystical body of thy Son, that such as are yet alive may finish their course with joy, and that we, with all such as are dead in the Lord, may rest in hope and rise in glory for thy Son's sake, whose death we now commemorate. Amen. May I adore thee, O God, by offering to thee the pure and unbloody sacrifice which thou hast ordained by Jesus Christ. Amen. But how should I dare to offer thee this sacrifice, if I had not first offered myself a sacrifice to thee, my God? May I never offer the prayers of the faithful with polluted lips, nor distribute the bread of life with unclean hands. I acknowledge and receive thee, O Jesus, a sent of God, a prophet, to make his will known to us, and his merciful purpose to save us, as our priest, who offered himself an acceptable sacrifice for us, to satisfy the divine justice, and to make intercession for us, and as our king, to rule and defend us against all our enemies. May I always receive the Holy Sacrament in the same meaning, intention, and blessed effect with which Jesus Christ administered it to his apostles in his Last Supper. Concerning Confirmation By faith we receive the Spirit which is of God. I will put my Spirit within you, saith God. We are truly Christians by receiving the Spirit of Christ. This is the great blessing of the Gospel, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, with the desire of which we conclude our daily prayers, with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Effect and Blessing of Confirmation It is to convey the inestimable blessing of the Holy Spirit of God by prayer, and the imposition of the hands of God's ministers, that he may dwell in you, and keep you from the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Confirmation is the perfection of baptism. The Holy Ghost descends invisibly upon such as are rightly prepared to receive such a blessing, as at the first he came visibly upon those that had been baptized. 
As the Holy Spirit is present in our baptism to seal the remission of sins and to infuse the seeds of Christian life, so is he present in confirmation to shed further influences on those that receive it, for stirring up the gift of God bestowed in baptism, etc. Prayer after Confirmation Matthew chapter 19, verse 15 And he laid his hands on them. O oh, Holy Spirit of grace, I make my humble supplication to thee in behalf of those servants on whom I have this day laid my hands. Be thou their wisdom, to give them the knowledge of religion, their understanding to know their duty, their counsel in all their doubts, their strength against all temptations, their knowledge in what belongs to the state of life in which thy providence shall place them their piety and godliness in all their actions. And be thou their fear all their life long. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. End of Tract 42。Tract 43 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Richard Nelson, number four, length of public service, by Thomas Keeble. What a weariness is it? Malachi chapter one, verse thirteen. Oh, they be blessed that may dwell within thy house always. For they, all times, thy facts do tell and ever give thee praise. Yea, happy, sure, likewise are they, whose stay and strength thou art, who to thy house do mind the way and seek it in their heart. Psalm 84, verses 5 and 6. Among all the boys of our Sunday school, none have given me so much trouble as Absalom, Plush, and two of Farmer Yorn's sons. They are almost always behind their time. At school they are very inattentive, and at church their conduct has been repeatedly so disgraceful that it even attracted the attention of one of the church wardens who gave them a severe reprimand and threatened to send for a constable since which they are conducting themselves rather more decently. Perhaps my readers may be inclined to ask why I suffer them to remain in the school, their behaviour having been so bad. My answer must be that, as they are but little boys, for Absalom is the eldest and he is not more than eleven, if so much, I still hope they may improve. And if I were to put them out of the school, I fear I should lose all chance of gaining any influence over them. However, I have made up my mind that if they behave in this sort of way again, they shall go. There is too another consideration which has rather disposed me to be sorry for these boys in the midst of my displeasure. Namely, that if they had been well instructed, and a good example had been set them at home, they would perhaps have behaved differently at school and in church. The young plush does not want for sense, though he is so unruly. And as to the little yawns, they are not naturally of bad dispositions, but so determinedly indolent and unwilling to make any exertion for their own improvement that it is a great trial of one's patience to endeavour to teach them. I am, however, sorry to say, the examples they have before them at home are not such as to encourage them to turn to good account the instruction they may receive at church or at the school. This I was fully aware of from the first, and, accordingly, as it is my usual custom when the children behave ill at school, to take the first opportunity of mentioning it to the parents and friends, with the hope of throwing in a word which may be for their good too. I determined that I would do so in these instances. An occasion soon offered itself for speaking to Farmer Yorn, whose house is very near to mine. But before I state what passed between us, I should say that I had, that same morning, talked over the matter with my friend Richard Nelson, in whose class Absalom was, as well as the elder of the two yawns. Sir, replied Richard, in answer to my question respecting the conduct of these boys, as to Lawrence Yawn, well, I cannot say that he applies much to his book, or, as I think, ever means to do so. Indeed, I have heard that he should say he likes to be at the bottom of the class, because then he has a chance of leaning against the wall, or resting on the corner of my chair. But Absalom Plush is much more untractable and inclined to be impudent too. To give you an instance, sir, what happened only last Sunday, 
He came in very late, as he frequently does, and when I spoke to him about it, he only laughed and said he could not come sooner, and under breath, as I thought, he should not, and he seemed to me occasionally to be humming to himself some kind of song. A song? said I. What, in the school? That is something new indeed. However, proceeded Nelson, according to your advice to us in such cases, I took no notice at the time, but in the evening, as he happened to come along the path by our garden, I said to him, Absalom, I do wish you would pay a little more attention at school. I really fancy today that you were singing something of a song. Well, said he, suppose I was. What then? "'Twas only a bit of a tune that a man was singing in at Father's one night last week, and Father said that altering the words a little, it would just suit us boys of the Sunday school. "'There is no harm,' he continued, "'in the words. I will tell you what they were. "'But they seemed to me, sir, to be part of a very mischievous ballad, "'signifying that instead of churches and prayer books, "'people had better sit in public houses and study newspapers.' that church-going is time-wasting, and so forth. So it is plain that the boy is encouraged at home in his bad ways. If you ask me the question, sir, my fear is not much better with the two yawns, for I dare say you must have observed that there are six or seven people who always come late into church, rain or shine, morning or evening, and among them Master Yawn comes in as regularly as possible just about the end of the first lesson. Yes, I said, I have observed it, and have long wished for an opportunity of inquiring into the cause of such a practice. After some other observations, we parted, and as it happened, as I before observed, that on that same day my neighbour Yawn came to our house to borrow a milking bucket, which I very readily lent him, though not with my servant's goodwill, and such articles seldom returned from the farmers in exactly as good a condition as they went. Seeing him then go out of the yard with the bucket in his hand, I met him at the garden gate, and said to him at once, I do wish, Mr. Yorn, you would speak to Lawrence and the little boy, for by their irregularity and extreme idleness they vex me very much, and do harm to the other boys in the school. Sure, he replied, making a low bow. I am very sorry indeed to come troubling again so soon for a bucket, but our people are so careless. No, oh, never mind about the bucket, I said. Only please let it be thoroughly cleaned. But I want you to tell me what will be the best way of treating that idle fellow Lawrence and his little brother. Sir, he answered, I am very sorry indeed that they should have done anything to offend you, but you may depend on it they shall always for the future come to school in good time and mind what is said to them. Otherwise their mother or I will give them the stick as sure as every Sunday morning comes round. Mr. Yawn, I replied, I should be very sorry to have Sunday made the day for such unpleasing performances in your house or in any other. I do not at all wish any boys to come to the school against their will, especially if their friends only send them to please me. Oh, sir, he said, I'm sure it's not at all against our will. No, certainly, it is a longish while for the children to stay, from nine to half past twelve or more, and I don't altogether wonder that the boys are tired, but they shall come for the future and stay too, tired or not tired, for I shall be very sorry if we should do anything to offend you, sir. You have told me so now three times, Mr. Yorn, I answered, so of course I ought to believe it. But at all events, I hope I shall not offend you if I take this opportunity to ask you why you and Edward Gape and two or three others make a rule of treating our church service in such a careless, and may I say scornful way. Me? Treat the church with scorn? He replied. Why, sir, what can you be thinking of? Why, I scarcely ever miss a Sunday. T'would be a good thing for you clergymen if everyone else was as regular. As to that, I replied, that's no sort of difference to us whether the people come or stay away, except so far as that we ought to be thankful when they do right, and grieved when they neglect their duty. In this respect, Mr. Yorn, we are the really independent ministers. But what I allude to is your strange, unaccountable custom of coming into church so late. I have been here now nearly six years, and in all that time, though by your own account you have come to church regularly once every Sunday, 
Yet I doubt if ever you have been within the walls till after I had begun reading the lessons. Yes, sir, I have, he said. You are mistaken there. Come now, he said. If I have been here five years and a half, I have been here 286 Sundays. And I think I may venture to say that during all that time, you have not been in church time enough to hear all the first lesson more than 20 times. Perhaps not, he said. 20 is a good many. <laughs> well, I replied, I will venture to say not more than 10 times. Oh, I'm not sure of that, he answered. But I am sure of it, I said. Sure that you have not been in by the time I mention even five Sundays. Oh, can remember at least three times, he answered. Once when I mistook the clock, but once when old Thomas Pout brought his new bassoon, and on the first day I was in at the Psalms, I am confident. But I don't wish to make an argument about the matter, I will tell you, sir, plainly, that I have a great deal to do on a Sunday morning, more than you think of, and that instead of finding fault with me for being so late, you should thank me for coming at all. Think, sir, how many don't come at all, and there am I in the pew as regular, pretty near, as old Job the clerk, only half an hour later. Yes, he said, you are very regular in your irregularity. But, Mr. Yawn, let me ask you this one question. Do you come to church to do any good to Almighty God, or to me, or to yourself? Is it any profit to the Almighty that you serve him, if such an imperfect attendance as yours can be called service? Or to me, is it any profit or advantage in the way of worldly interest? You know full well, my friend, that yours is the danger. Yours will be the loss if you persist in thus dishonouring the holy, jealous God. To this, his only reply was that he'd been used to do it for a good way in forty years, that it was not to be expected he should alter now. And with this observation, he walked slowly away with the bucket over his arm. But thinking, I suppose, that he had not been quite civil to me, he turned around with the intention, as I hoped, making some sort of promise of amendment. But my hope was groundless, for he came back and said in rather a low voice, oh, I hope so. Nothing I have said will prevent you from taking your butter off us as usual. And as to the boys, oh, I promise you, they shall be well punished every Sunday morning. And then, sir, if they do behave ill, you know it will not be my fault or my wife's. I made no answer. As I walked back to the house, I was led sadly to reflect on the tendency of a worldly and selfish spirit to deaden not merely your serious sense of religion, but even the natural affection of a parent for his children. Some few evenings afterwards, as I was returning homewards from a distant part of the parish, Nelson overtook me. When I told him of the conversation I had with my neighbour Yorn, adding that I had little hope his boys would ever come to any good, especially as their father seemed determined to keep to his bad habit merely because it was his habit, without giving any sort of reason or excuse for it. Oh, sir, replied Nelson, he fancies he has a very fair reason, only he did not like to mention it to you. He thinks, or at least pretends to think, for I do not imagine he puts his mind much to anything, that the church service altogether is too long and tedious, and he and some others have of late been much encouraged in this their notion by a travelling man, whether he comes from Hull or Preston, I'm not sure, who quarters it plushes occasionally, sometimes for a fortnight at a time, and is so kind as to offer to enlighten us in this dark corner of the world. I have heard of him, I said. Seems then he dabbles in religion as well as in politics. Yes, sir, replied Richard, that he certainly does, for I had the whole account of him from a man who was working with me the week before last. You know him, sir, I dare say, William Burnett. Oh, yes, I know him, I said. Very well. Anything like the prospect of a change in religion or politics, William dearly loves, without troubling himself much to inquire whether or not it is likely to be a change for the better in either case. But what did the wise man from Hull say about the church service? Why, answered Nelson, as I was never in company with the man myself, perhaps it would be the best way for me to tell you, sir, if you'd like to hear it, what passed between Burnett and me on the subject. And indeed, it's not Burnett only, but a good many others who are of the same way of thinking, more than used to be formerly. Yes, said I. Their number increases, I fear, very rapidly. And if so, all who love truth and the prayer book ought to be on their guard. 
But now will you please to tell me how you answered Burnet's arguments? Sir, he replied, I will tell you as near as I can remember what passed between us on this subject. Though I do not promise to be able to repeat his exact words, and certainly nothing I said is worthy to be called an answer to arguments. Make no apologies, I said, but proceed. Well then, sir, said Nelson, thus it was. Burnet was constantly commending this friend of his, who was then lodging at Plush's, and wishing me to come along, if it were but one evening, that I might judge for myself how beautiful he could talk, and expound on any subject a person might choose to mention, politics, trade, agriculture, learning, religion, and what not. But I said to him, No, Will, I have something else to do of an evening than sit in a beer shop listening to your friend Tip Top, for that is the man's name. But I dare say you can give me some account of his wise sayings. What was he upon last night? Last night, said Will, after some little consideration, last night he was lecturing about the church prayer book, a subject that he's often spoken very well upon in my hearing, but never better than he did yesterday evening. What was his argument? I asked. Judge by this, said Will, taking a printed paper out of his pocket. It is one of Mr. Tiptop's perspectuses, as he calls them. I have this paper with me, said Nelson to me, and with your leave, sir, I will read some of the heads. The church service, lengthy, tedious, and prolix, in this respect, lamentably prejudiced to the spread of vital religion, vast numbers of highly talented individuals unable to devote their time and attention to these procrastinated forms, consequently compelled to neglect religion altogether, surprising effects if the service was abbreviated at least one half. The church is immediately sure to be filled with crowds of devout worshippers, this with facility accomplished by merely shortening the lessons three-fifths, omitting all superstitious forms such as the absolution, creeds, etc. The Lord's Prayer repeated usque ad nauseam. At this expression, Will said all the company expressed their approbation very vehemently, some even clapping their hands, but he did not like to ask what it meant, for fear of appearing ignorant. And so Mr. Tiptop finished with saying that in his opinion, about a couple of pleasing hymns, a dozen verses out of the Testament, three or four prayers and a sermon in quantity and quality according to the taste of the audience, this would be enough for him in all conscience, and he supposed for others, too, and need not altogether take up more than thirty-five or forty minutes at the outside, allowing fifteen or twenty for the sermon. But will, said I, do you really and seriously imagine it would be well if such alterations as these were made in the church service? To be sure I do, he answered, and so do many other people who understand these things better than I or you do. Indeed, Mr. Tiptop told us that some gentleman had actually taken the matter up and that it would be brought before the Parliament very speedily, and such alterations would be made as should suit the spirit of the age. Above all, that the service must be shortened, otherwise the church would be entirely deserted and the establishment upset. God forbid, I said that the church should be governed by the spirit of the times, I trust she is governed by a very different spirit. I trust she may be willing to be, as you threaten, utterly deserted, rather than herself desert the station allotted to her by the chief shepherd. And as to the establishment being in danger, it may be perhaps true, yet I'm sure nothing more dangerous can befall it than for our governors to hearken to the counsels of such orators as Tip-Top, though encouraged by all the plushes in England, each with a company of puffers and smokers about him. But Dick, he said to me, what is the use of a church, my friend, if people are tired of it and won't go to it? To this I answered, you might as well ask what is the use of our Saviour's precepts if people are tired of them and won't obey them. You will not, I suppose, say that the holy rules of the gospel ought to be publicly set aside, merely because they are so generally neglected? No, he replied, of course I do not mean that. Well then, said I. Neither should you affirm that it is the duty of the church to withdraw or alter her rules, merely because people are weary of complying with them. That may be true, he answered, but you must remember that the church herself did not mean that the service should be so long. What we have all at once was formally divided into two or three parts, as I have understood. Why should it not be so again? 
What you say, I believe, no more than the truth, I replied. I've been lately reading a little book upon the subject, and from that I understood that there were first the early morning prayers, and then perhaps after two or three hours the litany, and then again after a short interval the communion service, including a sermon at considerable length, an hour possibly, and afterwards the administration of the sacrament. But this last service alone would be much beyond Mr. Tiptop's limit of forty minutes, and in this way the spirit of the age would be more opposed even than it is now. Oh, he said, oh, I never thought of having the sacrament administered every Sunday. Then, replied I, you forgot one of the principal intentions of the church in having the services so divided. If the bishops and clergy thought well, I do not deny that it would in many respects be edifying if this ancient custom in all its parts could be revived. But yet I will tell you plainly that I do not think it would have the effect you seem to imagine of bringing more people to church. For, to my knowledge, it was tried by a clergyman in a parish near Sheffield, and to his great surprise, many of his parishioners stayed in consequence quite away from the church. Some said they would not think of going to hear half a service. Others who had a mile or two to come to church said they were scarcely allowed to rest themselves, but that as soon as they got in, it was time to go back. So the clergyman thought it best to return to the old, or rather I should say the modern custom again, of uniting the services. And yet, said Burnet, the American church has shortened the lessons very much, Mr. Tiptop told us. It may be so, I answered, but it does not follow that it is a wise measure, nevertheless, though far be it from me to say that it is otherwise. Still, of the two, the daughter should take the pattern from the mother, rather than the mother from the daughter. And, for myself, I must say, that I've often been glad that the lessons are of considerable length, for two reasons specially. What are they? he asked. The one is, I replied, that in very short readings it is not so easy to discover the general meaning and argument, and the other, that if I have from any cause been inattentive in one part, I have not been so throughout. So also with respect to the Lord's Prayer, I have often and often been glad to have a second and a third opportunity of joining in it with increased attention. Therefore, Will, I, for one, shall never give my vote to have this service shortened in either of these ways. And as for Mr. Tiptop's fine perspectus, or what he calls it, I don't think it was worth a rush. To this Burnet answered that it was plainly in no use to reason with me, as he saw I was determined to keep to the old ways. That I am, said I, and I think I have pretty good authority for it. Authority is somewhat more to be depended on than Mr. Tiptop's opinion. But, continued Will, I do still persist in affirming that great numbers of people are weary of the length of the service, and that it would be but common kindness to see what could be done to relieve their grievance. And since nothing can be more easy than just to omit a few prayers and other old-fashioned forms and shorten the lessons, it will be a shame not to try it. And when it is done, everybody will be pleased, and the church establishment will be greatly strengthened. Well, said I, Whatever effect such a measure might have on the establishment, I'm confident it would deeply injure the church. And as what you say about relieving a grievance, I wish you to consider this argument which I met with in a book of sermons that was lent to me a few weeks ago. If people were weary merely of the length of the service, they would be at least attentive at the beginning, and their weariness would come on by degrees. But we know it is not so. Of the two... They are often more tired in the early part of the service than in the later. I do not remember the exact words, but such is the meaning. Yes, he said, that is because they care more about the sermon than they do about the prayers and lessons. Very well, I replied, you have supplied me with a strong argument against your own views. For by whose opinion do you think the church ought to be chiefly guided? That of the few, if they be few, who delight in the prayers and lessons or that of the many, if they be many, who are weary of them even from the beginning. Why, he replied, I thought it was now almost universally agreed that what most people think is true, what most people determine is just, what most people like is good. Mr. Tiptop called these the three grand parliament principles, and we all admired them. But will, I said, Suppose it should happen that what most people like might be to get rid of the restraints of religion altogether. 
I reckon you would not consider this a safe and good principle to be guided by. Yet you may be sure that this, and nothing less than this, lies at the root of all these pretended church reforms. And as to the principal contriver of these deceits, the great reformer himself, well, I do not choose to mention his name to you, but I think you will find him spoken of, and his character awfully set forth in the 8th chapter of St. John, if I recollect right, the 44th verse. But really now, Will, I'll continue, will you be kind enough to tell me what are people hindered from by the length of the service? How comes it means time is so much more precious now than it was formerly? If the service were made shorter, how would they be better employed than in hearing God's holy word and praying for his blessing on themselves and their friends? I say, Will, what do Farmer Yawn and Ned Gape and the rest of you do who walk always so late into church? Are you spending your time any better than as if you came into God's house before the bell ceases? As to that, said he, laughing, we generally sit on the wall, at least when the weather is dry, and look at Ned's pigs, or talk over the news, or anything, just to pass the time. But the farmer's rule is to begin shaving just as the bells chime. Then he comes in at the first lesson, as exact as clockwork, and we after him. Then, said I, why should you and he trouble about having the service shortened? For I suppose, whatever were its length or shortness, you'd always come in twenty minutes after it had begun. That would be as we should please he said. However, I see plainly I shall never be able to reason you out of your bigoted old-fashioned notions. I only wish I could bring you and Mr. Tiptop together. I think he would soon settle you and your arguments too. He would quickly turn the laugh against you, I can assure you, Master Nelson. To this I answered that I had no reason to be afraid of Tiptop, his arguments or his jests, but that I would never willingly go or stay in the company of persons who could make light of serious matters. And I told Burnet, that I was sure, sooner or later, he would allow that I was right in this resolution. This, sir, was the substance of my conversation with Will, and if you should be disengaged next Sunday evening and disposed to see me, I should be glad to have a few more words with you on the same subject. To this I readily agreed, so we parted at his garden gate, and as I heard his door shut, I could not but say to myself, If happiness is to be found on earth, it is in that cottage. And what is the precious secret whereby it has been attained? No secret at all, I answered myself, but simply the practice of pure and undefiled religion, patient continuance and well-doing, with glory, honour and immortality in view. When he came to me in my study on the Sunday evening, according to appointment, he said that he was really anxious to know whether there was any truth in the report which Tip-Top and others had so confidently spread about that some alteration of the prayer book was intended, especially, as they said, for the purpose of making the Sunday more short and compact, and suitable to the taste of the times. I answered that of course it was out of my power to say what our governors in church or state might wish, but that I feared that in religion, as in other matters, there was some reason to apprehend too great regard might be paid to popular fancies, even by those who were as far as possible from approving of them. Sir, he replied very earnestly. I hope and trust the church services will never be shortened one sentence, line or word. Grown people, sir, are but children in religion. If once you begin to yield to their indolence and dislike of trouble, you sanction the bad feeling, and it will go on increasing till it has eaten out the very heart of piety. Yes, I replied. I fully agree with you. And to say the truth, it is my firm opinion that if any alteration is necessary, it is the other way, that the service should be longer instead of shorter. I mean, for instance, that the prayer for Christ's church militant should be regularly used as appointed after the morning sermon when there is no communion, at least where it can be done without any great inconvenience, which possibly in some churches may not be the case. It is, to my mind, one of the most perfect of uninspired compositions, and it is greatly to be wished that it might be made familiar to every ear and every heart. Sir, said he, I have often thought so. Still, at the best our weakness is great. The corruptible body, as the wise man says, presses down the soul. And I suppose it is the case with all of us occasionally. And even when we would most earnestly deplore and strive against it, that our thoughts are apt to wander and our devotions to be cold. Whenever, therefore, I have found myself disposed to be weary of God's house and service, or have heard others complaining of the tediousness of the prayers and lessons, I have said to myself, if David, 
The Prince of Penitence were here now. Would he speak or think thus? He who desired to abide in God's tabernacle forever? Who envied, as it were, the sparrows and the swallows their continual abode under the sacred roof? Who, when shut out or far away, longed, yea, even fainted for the courts of the Lord, as a heart thirsting for the water brooks? If holy Daniel, that greatest of statesmen, that real man of business, if he were among us now, he who in a far distant land and prime minister to the greatest of earthly kings, would yet let no day pass in which he would not thrice find or make leisure to offer solemn prayers to the God of his fathers, his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, where lay the temple of his God in ruins, that as he could not be there in person, he would be so in heart and mind. Would he say that our church service is too long? If St. Paul, that most heroic, and, if there were such a word, that most unselfish of men, if he were now among us, would he be weary of our lessons, prayers and creeds? He whose conversation and home was in heaven, who desired to depart and to be with Christ, and who calls on all true Christians to hold fast the form of sound words in Christian faith and love. Or the beloved John, the last and greatest of prophets, weary not of his Lord's service, but of being kept so long from his presence. Would he and all the other holy men of every age, prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors and saints, whether of the patriarchal, Jewish or Christian churches, would they complain of our services being too long? Oh no, sir, that is not to be imagined. So neither ought we to complain, heirs with them of the same promises, and looking to meet them hereafter in our one great eternal home. Richard, I replied, you say true. As it is dangerous for an individual to take for his guidance any but a perfect pattern of Christian conduct, so it is dangerous for the church to follow any but a perfect model of Christian worship, so far as perfection can be obtained. Her rules should be framed not according to what people are, but to what they ought to be. Otherwise, you must plainly see that a door will at once be open for numberless errors, as well as in doctrine as in practice. Yes, sir, I see it, he replied. And therefore, it seems to me that when on such subjects popular opinion runs vehemently in a wrong direction, or if not wrong, at least questionable, that then it is not the best time, but the very worst possible, for yielding to its fancies. So that even if it should be at any time necessary or expedient, which I cannot think it ever will be, to shorten the church services, yet then is the very worst of all times to set about it when there is the greatest demand for it. You are quite right, I said, beyond all doubt. But I think it would be a great support to the good cause, that is, to the cause of God and truth, the church and the prayer book, and also a great encouragement to such among us of the clergy as desire to stand in the old paths, if in every parish a few serious thinking persons would consider of drawing up and signing a solemn address to their respective bishops, plainly saying that they utterly disapprove of all plans whatever for shortening the church service, unless some urgent cause should arise, stronger than they have ever yet heard, and that, as churchmen, they never can or will consent to any such plans of miscalled church reform. For you know, Richard, laymen are quite as much part of the church as the clergy, and it is your right and duty to stand up in its defence as much as it is ours. Sir, he replied, you may be sure I would gladly sign such a declaration as this you propose, and I think I know four or five more who would sign it also with all their hearts. That will be sufficient, I said, for our parish, for no doubt the bishops will estimate the value of such addresses, not by the quantity, but by the quality of those who sign them. Not by the number of names, but by the worth of those who bear them, their honesty, piety, and truth. So we agreed that an address of this kind should be prepared, kept ready to be presented to the bishop whenever circumstances should seem to require. Not, of course, that we were so vain as to expect that our exertions could be of much avail. But still, as Richard said, we cannot stand by and see the noble old prayer book pulled to pieces just to humour a mob of tip-tops, gapes and yawns. End of Tract 43《Tract 44 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
read by Beeswax Candle. Bishop Wilson's Meditations on His Sacred Office, Number 2, Monday, by Thomas Wilson. Question from the Office of Consecration. Are you persuaded that the Holy Scriptures contain sufficiently all doctrine required of necessity to eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? And are you determined, out of the same Holy Scriptures, to instruct the people committed to your charge, and to teach or maintain nothing as required of necessity to eternal salvation, but that which you shall be persuaded may be concluded and proved by the same? Answer. I am so persuaded and determined by God's grace. Question. Will you then faithfully exercise yourself in the same holy scriptures, and call upon God by prayer for the true understanding of the same, so as you may be able by them to teach and exhort with wholesome doctrine, and to withstand and convince gainsayers? Answer. I will do so by the help of God. O God, the fountain of all wisdom, enlighten my mind that I myself may see and be able to teach others the wonders of thy law, that I may learn from thee what I ought to think and speak concerning thee, and that whatever in thy holy word I shall profitably learn, I may indeed fulfil the same. Direct and bless all my labours. Give me a discerning spirit, a sound judgment, and an honest and a religious heart, that in all my studies my first aim may be to set forth thy glory by setting forward the salvation of men. And if, by my ministry, thy kingdom shall be enlarged, let me, in all humility, ascribe the success, not unto myself, but unto thy good spirit, which enables us both to will and to do what is acceptable to thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Luke 24, verse 45 Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. O oh, Jesus, cause me to read, to understand, to love, to practice, and to preach thy word. Luke 22, verse 32. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. God grant that we may all of us consider the absurdity of going about to convert others without being converted ourselves. To understand the Holy Scriptures aright is to understand them as the primitive church did. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Speak to my heart, that I may obey thy word. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. It belongs to God to give the true understanding of his own word. Matthew chapter 7, verse 5 Thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. That is... Purify your own heart from all worldly aims. Mortify your own passions, which are the cause of your blindness. Study that word which alone can enlighten you, and lay aside all prejudices which are contrary to piety. A pastor should never undertake to teach a virtue which he has never practised himself. Luke 5, verse 5. We have toiled all the night and taken nothing. So does every preacher who does not beg God's blessing upon his labours. It is impossible for any man to teach well who does not live well. John 7, verse 16 My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. To preach our own thoughts, forsaking God's word, is like an ambassador who neglects his prince's instructions and follows his own fancy. With what truth can it be said that the sheep hear his voice, when the shepherd speaks of things, or in such a manner, as is above their capacity. Sermons Should be instructions, not declamations, or displaying curious thoughts, which may amuse but not edify Christians. If God suffers even an holy pastor not presently to see the fruits of his labours, it is to convince him that the success of his labours belongs to God, that he ought to humble himself and pray much, and fear lest the fault should be in himself. Pride and irreligion meet with darkness in the midst of light, raise vain disputes, unprofitable reflections and inquiries, while humility attains to light in the midst of darkness and difficulties. Whenever God vouchsafes to open the heart, be the understanding and parts never so small, we see the reasonableness and beauty of his word, 
we taste the sweetness and feel the power thereof. John 12, verse 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. We often read scripture without comprehending its full meaning. However, let us not be discouraged. The light in God's good time will break out and disperse the darkness, and we shall see the mysteries of the gospel. Grant me, O Lord, a persevering love of thy word, and so much light as is necessary for myself and those that hear me. John 12, verse 30 Jesus said, This voice came not for me, but for your sakes. The way to profit by reading the sacred scripture is to apply to ourselves that which is spoken in general to all. This truth, this command, this threat, this promise, this intimation is to me. Acts 1, verse 1 The former treaties have I made of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. This is the whole of a pastor's life. For a man to preach the gospel before he has practised it is to be a very bad imitator of the Prince of Pastors. More sinners are converted by holy than by learned men. Who can say it is not owing to himself that his flock are ignorant of their duty? Colossians chapter 4 verse 4 That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. All preachers do not speak as they ought. A man may have the skill to give Christian truths and turn agreeable to the hearers without affecting their hearts. Second Timothy 4 verses 1, 2, etc. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and gravity. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, etc. Preaching is a duty, but not the only duty of a pastor. He is to take all occasions to instruct those that seek the truth. Refute such as oppose it, reprove those that do not practice it, and confirm such as have embraced it. And the more we perceive the times of apostasy approaching, the more zealous ought we be to defend sound doctrine. It will be no comfort to a pastor that the world praises him for some one part of his duty, while God condemns him for the neglect of another. Reading Scripture John 16 verse 13 the Holy Spirit shall lead you into all truth. O oh, Holy Spirit, make me to understand, embrace, and love the truths of the gospel. Give, O oh God, thy blessing unto thy word, that it may become effectual to my conversion and salvation, and to the salvation of all that read or hear it. Let thy gracious promises, O oh God, contained in thy word, quicken my obedience, let thy dreadful threatenings and judgments upon sinners fright me from sin and oblige me to a speedy repentance, for Jesus Christ his sake. Grant, O Lord, that in reading thy holy word I may never prefer my private sentiments before those of the church in the purely ancient time of Christianity. Give me a full persuasion of those great truths which thou hast revealed in thy holy word. From hardness of heart and contempt of thy word, good Lord, Deliver us. Matthew 13, verse 36. Declare unto us this parable. This should instruct us that the knowledge of God's word and the mysteries of the gospel are favours which we must always beg of God. End of tract 44. Tract 45 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beesmax Candle. The Grounds of Our Faith by John Henry Newman Every system of theology has its dangers, its tendencies towards evil. Systems, short of the truth, have this tendency inherent in themselves, and in process of time discover it, and work out the anticipated evil, which is but the legitimate, though latent, consequence of their principles. Thus we may consider the present state of Geneva the fair result on the long run of the system of self-will which was established there in the 16th century. But even the one true system of religion has its dangers on all sides, 
from the weakness of its recipients, who pervert it. Thus, the Holy Catholic doctrines in which the Church was set up were corrupted into popery, not legitimately or necessarily, but by various external causes acting on human corruption in the lapse of many ages. St. Paul's command of obedience to rulers was changed into the tyrannical rule of one bishop over all countries. His recommendation of an unmarried life for certain religious objects was made a rule of celibacy in the case of the clergy. Now, let us ask, what are the bad tendencies of Protestantism? For this is a question which nearly concerns ourselves. We are nearly 300 years from its rise in this country. Have any evils yet shown themselves from it? It is not here proposed to examine the question at large, but a hint on one part of the subject may be made an answer to it. At the Reformation, the authority of the Church was discarded by the spirit then predominant among Protestants, and Scripture was considered as the sole document both for ascertaining and proving our faith. The question immediately rose, is this or that doctrine in Scripture? And, in consequence, various intellectual gifts, such as argumentative subtlety, critical acumen, knowledge of the languages, rose into importance, and became the interpreters of Christian truth. Exposition lay through controversy. Now, the natural effect of disputation is to make us shun all but the strongest proofs, those which an adversary will find substantial impediments in his line of reasoning, and therefore to generate a cautious, discriminative turn of thought, to fix in the mind a standard of proof simulating demonstration, and to make light of mere probabilities. This intellectual habit, resulting from controversy, would also arise from the peculiar exercises of thought necessary for the accurate scholar or antiquarian. It followed that, in the course of time, all the delicate shades of truth and falsehood, the unobtrusive indications of God's will, the low tones of the still small voice in which scripture abounds were rudely rejected. The crumbs from the rich man's table, which faith eagerly looks about for, were despised by the proud-hearted intellectualist, who, as if it were a favour to him to accept the gospel, would be content with nothing short of certainty, and ridiculed as superstitious and illogical whatever did not approve itself to his own cold, hard and unimpassioned temper. For instance, if the cases of Lydia, of the jailer, of Stephanus, were brought to show our Lord's wish as to the baptism of households, the actions of his apostles to interpret his own commands, it was answered, This is no satisfactory proof. It is not certain that every one of those households was not himself a believer. It is not certain there were any children among them. Though surely, in as many as three households, the probability is on the side which the church has taken, especially viewing the text in connection with our Saviour's words, suffer the little children, etc. Again, while the observance of the Lord's Day was grounded upon the practice of the apostles, it was somehow felt that this proof was not strong enough to bind the mass of Protestants, and so the chief argument now in use is one drawn from the Jewish law, viz., the direct scripture command contained in the fourth commandment. Our Saviour has noticed the frame of mind here alluded to in Mark chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, where his feelings and judgment upon it are also told us. The Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit, and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them. We are warned against the same hard and tractable temper in the book of Psalms. I will inform thee, and teach thee, in the way wherein thou shalt go and I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not like to horse and mule which have no understanding, whose mouths must be held with bit and bridle lest they fall upon thee. Psalm 32 verses 9 and 10 This stubborn spirit, which yields to nothing but violence, is determined to feel Christ's yoke ere it submits to it, will not see except in broad daylight, and like the servant who hid his talent, is ever making excuses, murmuring, doubting grudging obedience 
in stifling, docile and open-hearted faith, is the spirit of ultra-Protestantism, i.e. that spirit to which the principles of Protestantism tend, and which they have in great measure realised. On this subject, the reader may consult numbers 4, 8 and 19 of this series of tracts. Now to apply this to the doctrines, at present so much undervalued, which is the especial object of these tracts to enforce. When a clergyman has spoken strongly in defence of episcopacy, a hearer will go away saying that there is much very able and forcible, much very eloquent and excellent in what he has just heard. But after all, there is very little about episcopacy in Scripture. This is the point to which a shrewd, clear-headed reasoner will retort. After all, we come round and round to it. The doctrine advocated is plausible, useful, generally received hitherto, granted, but Scripture says very little about it. Now, it cannot be for a moment allowed that Scripture contains little on the subject of church government, though it may readily be granted that it obtrudes on the reader little about it. The doctrine is in it, not on it, not on the surface. This need not be proved here, since the subject has been variously considered in former numbers of the series. But it may be useful in a few words to show how the state of the argument and controversy concerning episcopacy illustrates the above remarks, and how parallel it is to the state in which other religious truths are found, which no churchman dares to dispute. 1. Now, in the first place, let us suppose, for the sake of argument, that episcopacy is in fact not at all mentioned in Scripture. Even then it would be our duty to receive it. Why? Because the first Christians received it. If we wish to get at the truth, no matter how we get at it, if we get at it, if it be a fact that the earliest Christian communities were universally episcopal, it is a reason for our maintaining episcopacy, and in proportion to our conviction is it incumbent on us to maintain it nor can it be fairly dismissed as a non-essential, an ordinance indifferent and mutable, though formally existing over Christendom. For who made us judges of essentials and non-essentials? How do we determine them? In the Jewish law, the slightest transgression of the commandment was followed by the penalty of death. Vide Leviticus chapter 8, verse 35, chapter 10, verse 6. Does not his universality imply a necessary connection with Christian doctrine? Consider how such reasonings would carry us through life, how the business of the world depends on punctuality in minutes, how great a matter a mere spark dropped on gunpowder kindleth. But it may be urged that we Protestants believe the Scriptures to contain the whole rule of duty. Certainly not. They constitute a rule of faith, not a rule of practice, a rule of doctrine, not a rule of conduct or discipline. Where, for example, are we told in Scripture that gambling is wrong? Or again, suicide? Our article is precise. Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, etc., is not to be required of any man, that it should be believed as an article of faith. Again, it says that the Apocrypha is not to be applied to establish any doctrine, implying that this is the use of the canonical books. 2. However, let us pass from this argument, which is but founded on a supposition, that episcopacy is not enjoined in Scripture. Suppose we maintain, as we may well maintain, that it is enjoined in Scripture. An objector will say that, at all events, it is but obscurely contained therein. It cannot be drawn out from it without a great deal of delicate care and skill. Here comes in the operation of that principle of faith in opposition to criticism, was above explained. The principle of being content with a little light where we cannot obtain sunshine. If it is probably pleasing to Christ, let us maintain it. Now take a parallel case, e.g. the uh, practice of infant baptism. Where is this enjoined in Scripture? Nowhere. Why do we observe it? Because the primitive church observed it, and because the apostles in Scripture appear to have sanctioned it though this is not altogether certain from Scripture. In a difficult case, we do as well as we can, and carefully study what is most agreeable to our Lord and Saviour. 
This is how our church expresses it in the 27th article. The baptism of young children is in any wise to be retained in the church, as most agreeable with the institution of Christ. This is true wariness in Christian caution, very different from that spurious caution which ultra-Protestantism exercises. Let a man only be consistent and apply the same judgment in the case of episcopacy. Let him consider whether the duty of keeping to bishops be not most agreeable with the institution of Christ. If indeed he denies this altogether, these remarks do not apply. But they are addressed to waverers and falsely moderate men, who cannot deny that the evidence of Scripture is in favour of churchmen, but say it is not strong enough. They say that if Almighty God had intended a uniformity in church government among Christians, he would have spoken more clearly. Now, if they carried on this line of argument consistently, they would not baptise their children. Happily, they are inconsistent. It would be more happy still were they consistent on the other side, and as they baptise their children, because it is safer to observe than to omit the sacrament, did they also keep to the church as the safer side. The received practice, then, of infant baptism seems a final answer to all who quarrel with scripture evidence for episcopacy. 3. But further still, infant baptism, like episcopacy, is but a case of discipline. What shall we say when we consider that a case of doctrine, necessary doctrine, doctrine the very highest and most sacred, may be produced, where the argument lies as little on the surface of scripture, where the proof, though most conclusive, is as indirect and circuitous as that for episcopacy, viz. the doctrine of the Trinity. Where is this solemn and comfortable mystery formally stated in Scripture, as we find it in the creeds? Why is it not? Let a man consider whether all the objections which he urges against the Scripture argument for episcopacy may not be turned against his own belief in the Trinity. It is a happy thing for themselves that men are inconsistent, yet it is miserable to advocate and establish a principle which, not in their own case indeed, but in the case of others who learn it from them, leads to Socianism. This being considered, can we any longer wonder at the awful fact that the descendants of Calvin, the first Presbyterian, are at the present day in the number of those who have denied the Lord who bought them? End of Tract 45《Tract 46 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Bishop Wilson's Meditations on His Sacred Office, Number 3, Tuesday, by Thomas Wilson. Question from the Office of Ordination. Are you ready, with all faithful diligence, to banish and drive away all erroneous and strained doctrine, contrary to God's word, and both privately and openly to call upon and encourage others to do the same? Answer, I am ready, the Lord being my helper. Blessed be the good providence of God, who in great compassion for this church and nation has hitherto preserved us from heresies and schisms. O Lord, continue to us this great mercy, and grant that we, who are appointed to watch over thy flock, may employ our learning and our time in promoting of true piety, that we may never grow secure and careless, but that we may endeavour to secure the power as well as the form of godliness. Have pity upon all Christian churches that are distracted by contending parties, and reduce all that wander out of the way. Enable us to preserve this church in peace and unity, by all means becoming the spirit of the gospel. Keep us steadfast in the faith, that we may never be tossed about with any wind of doctrine or the craft of men. Let the zeal and industry of those that are in error provoke us to be zealously affected in a righteous cause, in labouring to make men good, and in converting sinners from the error of their ways, which God grant for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. But the bishop, himself also, as his important affairs will permit him, shall use his best endeavour by instruction, suasion, and all good means he can devise to reclaim both them and all other within his diocese so affected. Canon 66. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. 
The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Nota bene, we are now in these sad times, and it behoves all faithful pastors to know it. It is not the doctrine of the gospel if it favours men's lusts. They that will not receive or who reject the truth are often judicially punished with a greediness to receive errors, falsehoods, and fables. Verse 5. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, make full proof of, or fulfil, thy ministry. He that is wanting in any essential part is wanting to his own salvation. Lord, Thou art just in all the troubles which thou hast brought upon this church and nation. Yet, O Lord, have mercy upon us, and restore to us that peace and unity which we once enjoyed. Matthew 7, verse 20. By their fruits ye shall know them. This rule, though given by Christ himself, is seldom observed. The best fruits are counted as nothing, are overlooked, and often condemned by those who have none good to show. Hence all the evils the church suffers. Matthew 13, verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. O Jesu, awaken the pastors of thy flock and open their eyes, that they may perceive the tares which choke the seed, the wolves which destroy thy sheep. A mixture of good and bad in the church is necessary to instruct, exercise, purify, sanctify, and keep the righteous in humility. Matthew 13, verse 29. Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. A zeal, not regulated by this prohibition, allows no time to the good to grow strong in goodness, or to the wicked to forsake their evil ways, but chooses rather to destroy the good, provided they can but destroy the bad. Revelation 2, verses 14 and 20. I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. How dreadful is the government of the church, wherein a man must answer for those sins which he does not hinder, to tolerate by silence those who favour and promote sin, Jesus Christ rebukes in the persons of these bishops. O oh, my Saviour, thou who givest me this warning, enable me to profit by it. Assist me in this day of trial effectually to oppose and suppress that spirit of impurity, idolatry, profaneness and irreligion which is broken in upon us. If for fear of offending men, or from a false love of peace we forbear to defend the truth, we betray and abandon it. Acts 28 verse 29 And when he had said these things, the Jews had great reasonings among themselves. A preacher of the truth is not to be blamed for the contests which it gives occasion to carnal men to raise. Even Christ himself could not preach without disturbing sinners. And if he came not to bring peace on earth but a sort of division... His ministers ought to expect to do the same. It is not by the heat of disputation, but by the gentleness of charity that souls are gained over to God. And when controversy is necessary, as sometimes it is, let it never be managed with harshness, bitterness, or severity, lest it exasperate and harden, more than convert and edify. A prudent condescension has often prevailed upon the weak, and rendered them capable of hearkening to reason, when the contrary conduct would have removed them farther from the light. We ought to avoid evil men and seducers in order to shame them, to deprive them of that credit whereby they may do hurt, and to make them return to a right mind, and that we may avoid the snare ourselves. Disputes The primitive fathers were ever modest upon religious questions. They contented themselves with resolving such questions as were proposed to them, without starting new ones, and carefully suppressed the curious, restless temper. May I receive from thee, O God, at all times, the rules of my behaviour on these occasions. God judges otherwise than we do of these things. He knows the good he intends to bring out of evil, either for the sanctification of the righteous, 
conversion of the wicked, by his goodness in bearing with them, or leaving them without excuse. One single soul is worth the utmost pains of the greatest minister of Christ. But then, let us take care when it is brought into the fold, that he be a better Christian than before, that he be not twofold more the child of hell than before. End of Tract 46 Section 47 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Record 1. The Epistle of Ignatius to the Ephesians. The Holy Church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. St. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch and Martyr, is reported to have been the child whom Christ took into his arms in order to give his disciples a pattern of Christian humbleness. But, however this was, he certainly was a disciple and friend of the Apostles, particularly St. Peter and St. John. St. Peter and St. Paul are said to have laid on them their hands and made him Bishop of Antioch. In A.D. 106, when he had been bishop nearly forty years, the persecuting Emperor Trajan came to Antioch, and finding Ignatius resolute in confessing the faith of Christ, he ordered him to be carried prisoner to Rome, and there thrown to the beasts in the idolatrous heathen shows, a command which was strictly obeyed. During his journey, he wrote letters to various churches by way of taking leave of them, and to confirm them in Christian zeal, love, and unity. And these, by God's good providence, are preserved to us. They are especially valuable to us at the present day, as showing us how important it is, in the judgment of this blessed martyr, to honour and obey our bishops. They are as follows. Epistle of Ignatius, the friend of St. Peter, on the way to martyrdom, to the Ephesians. Ignatius, also called Theophorus, to her who is blessed in the greatness and fullness of God the Father, to the predestinate before all worlds to be ever in marvellous glory unchangeable, united and elect through the true passion, through the will of the Father and Jesus Christ our God, to the truly beatified Church, which is in Ephesus of Asia, all health in Jesus Christ and in unspotted grace. I welcome in God's behalf that well-beloved name, which ye have attained in all righteousness, according to the faith and love which is in Jesus Christ our Saviour, for that being followers of God, and kindling the inward flame by the blood of God, ye have perfectly accomplished the work that belonged to you. When ye heard that I came bound from Syria for the common name and hope, trusting through your prayers to fight with beasts at Rome, that so by suffering I may become indeed the disciple of him who gave himself to God, an offering and sacrifice for us. How many ye be that be called by the name of God, I have heard from Odysseus, whose love is beyond all words, your bishop according to the flesh, whom I beseech you by Jesus Christ to love, and that ye would all be like unto him. And blessed be God, who was granted unto you, who were so worthy of him, to enjoy such a bishop. As to my fellow servant Burrus, who is your most blessed deacon in things pertaining to God, I pray that he may abide with you to the honour both of you and of your bishop. And Crocus also, worthy both of God and you, whom I have received as the sample of your love, has in all things refreshed me, as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ shall also refresh him, together with Onesimus and Burrus and Euplus and Fronto, in seeing whom I have seen the love of you all. And may I always have joy of you, if I be worthy of it. It is therefore fitting that you should by all means glorify Jesus Christ, who hath glorified you, that by a uniform obedience ye may be perfectly joined together of the same mind and of the same judgment, and may all speak the same thing, and that being subject to your bishop and his presbytery, ye may be sanctified in all things. These things I prescribe to you, not as if I were somebody, for though I am bound for his name, I am not yet perfect in Christ Jesus. But now I begin to learn, and I speak to you as fellow disciples together with me. For I ought to have been stirred up by you in faith, in admonition, 
in patience, in long suffering. But forasmuch as charity suffers me not to be silent towards you, I have first taken upon me to exhort you, that ye would all concur in the mind of God. For Jesus Christ, our inseparable life, is the mind of the Father, like as the bishops, appointed even unto the utmost bounds of the earth, are after the mind of Jesus Christ. Wherefore, it will become you to concur in the mind of your bishops, as also ye do. For your famous presbytery, worthy of God, is knit as closely to its bishop as the strings to a harp. Therefore, by your unanimity and harmonious love, Jesus Christ is sung and each of you taketh part in the chorus. That so, being attuned together in one mind, and taking up the song of God, ye may, with one voice, and in a perfect unity, sing to the Father by Jesus Christ, to the end that by this means he may both hear you, and perceive by your works that ye are indeed the members of his Son. Wherefore it is profitable for you to live in blameless unity, so that ye may always have fellowship with God. For if I, in this little time, have held such communion with your bishop, I mean not earthly, but spiritual, how much more must I think you blessed, who are so joined to him, as the church is to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ to the Father, that so all things may agree in the same unity? Let no man deceive himself. If a man be not within the altar, he faileth of the bread of God. For if the prayer of one or two be of such force as we are told, how much more that of the bishop and the whole church? He, therefore, that does not come together into the same place with it, is proud, and has already condemned himself. For it is written, God resisteth the proud. Let us take heed, therefore, that we do not set ourselves against the bishop, that we may be set under God. And the more any seeth his bishop keep silence, the more let him reverence him. For whomsoever the master of the house sendeth to his own household, we ought so to receive, as we would him that sent him. It is plain, then, that we ought to look to the bishop, even as to the Lord himself. And truly, Anissimus himself doth greatly commend your good order in God, in that ye all live according to the truth, and that no heresy dwelleth among you. But ye hearken to no man above Jesus Christ, speaking to you in truth. For some there are who carry about the name of Christ in deceitfulness, and do many things unworthy of God, whom ye must flee, as ye would wild beasts. For they are ravening dogs, which bite secretly, against whom ye must guard yourselves, as hardly to be cured. There is one physician, both fleshly and spiritual, begotten, not made, God incarnate, true life in death, both of Mary and of God, first made subject to suffering, then liable to suffer no more. Wherefore, let no man deceive you, as indeed neither are ye deceived, being wholly the servants of God. For inasmuch as there is no contention nor strife among you to trouble you, Surely ye live according to God's will. My soul be for yours, and I myself the expiatory offering for your church of Ephesus, so famous to all ages. They that are of the flesh cannot do the works of the Spirit, neither they that are of the Spirit the works of the flesh. As also faith cannot do the works of unfaithfulness, neither unfaithfulness the works of faith. But even those things which ye do according to the flesh are spiritual, forasmuch as ye do all things in Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I have heard of some who have gone to you, having perverse doctrine, whom ye did not suffer to sow among you, but stopped your ears that ye might not receive those things that were sown by them, as being the stones of the temple of the Father, prepared for his building, and drawn up on high by the cross of Christ, as by an engine, using the Holy Ghost as the line by which to ascend, your faith being your support, and your charity the way that leads you up unto God. Ye therefore, with all the companions of your way, are full of God, of his spiritual temple, of Christ, 
of the Holy One, adorned in all things with the commands of Christ, through whom also I triumph, in that I have been thought worthy by this present epistle to hold converse with you, and to joy together that having regard to the other life ye love nothing but God only. Pray also without ceasing for all men, for there is hope of repentance in them that they may attain unto God. Suffer them therefore to learn from you, if only from your works. Against their raging be ye mild, against their boasting be ye lowly-minded, against their blasphemies oppose your prayers, against their errors be ye steadfast in the faith, against their cruelty be ye gentle, not striving to imitate them again, let us be found their brethren in all kindness, but imitators of the Lord. If any one be more than other, either injured or defrauded or despised, that so no plant of the devil be found in you, but ye may remain in all holiness and sobriety, both of body and spirit, in Christ Jesus. The last times are come upon us. Let us therefore be very reverent and fear the long suffering of God, that it be not to us unto condemnation. For let us either fear the wrath that is to come, or be thankful for present grace, one of the two, only to be found in Christ Jesus, unto true life. Besides him, let nothing be worthy of you, for whom also I bear about these bonds those spiritual jewels in which I would to God that through your prayers I might rise again, of which may I ever partake, that I may be found in the lot of the Christians of Ephesus, who have always agreed with the apostles through the power of Jesus Christ. You know both who I am and to whom I write, I, a man condemned, ye, such as have obtained mercy, I, exposed to danger, ye, confirmed against danger. Ye are the passage of those that are killed for God, the companions of Paul and the mysteries of the gospel, the holy martyr, the truly blessed Paul, in whose footsteps may I be found when I shall have attained unto God, who, throughout all his epistle makes mention of you in Christ Jesus. Let it be your care, therefore, to come oftener together, to give thanks and glory to God. For when ye meet often together in the same place, the powers of the devil are destroyed, and his mischief is dissolved by the unity of your faith. And indeed, nothing is better than peace, by which all war, both spiritual and earthly, is abolished. Of all which nothing is hid from you, if ye have perfect faith and charity in Jesus Christ, which are the beginning and end of life, the beginning faith, the end charity. And these two joined together are of God, and on them followeth all other goodness. No man professing a true faith goes wrong, neither does he who is charity hate any. The tree is made manifest by its fruit. So they who profess themselves to be Christians shall be known by what they do. For it is not now the time for profession, but for the power of faith, if a man be found faithful unto the end. It is better for a man to hold his peace and be, than to say he is a Christian and not to be. It is good to teach, if what he says he does likewise. There is therefore one master who spake, and it was done. And even those things which he did without speaking are worthy of the Father. He that hath the word of Jesus is truly able to hear his very silence, that he may be perfect, and both do according to what he speaks, and be known by those things in which he is silent. There is nothing hid from God, but even our secrets are nigh unto him. Let us therefore do all things, as becomes those who have God dwelling in them, that we may be his temples, and he may be our God within us, as also he is, and will show himself before our faces by those things for which we justly love him. Be not deceived, brethren. Those that corrupt other shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If therefore they who do this according to the flesh have suffered death, 
how much more shall he die, who by his wicked doctrine corrupts the faith of God, for which Christ was crucified? He that is thus defiled shall depart into unquenchable fire, and so also shall he that hearkens unto him. For this cause did the Lord suffer the ointment to be poured on his head, that he might breathe the breath of immortality unto his church. Be not ye therefore anointed with the evil savour of the doctrine of the prince of this world, lest he lead you away captive from the life that is set before you. And why are we not all wise, seeing we have received the knowledge of God, which is Jesus Christ? Why do we suffer ourselves foolishly to perish, not considering the gift which the Lord has truly sent to us? My life be an offering for the doctrine of the cross, which is indeed a stumbling block to the unbelievers, but to us salvation and life eternal. Where is the wise man? Where is the disputer? Where is the boasting of those who are called wise? For Jesus Christ, our God, was, according to the dispensation of God, conceived in the womb of Mary, of the seed of David, by the Holy Ghost, was born and baptised, that through his passion he might purify water. Now the virginity of Mary, and her delivery, was kept in secret from the prince of this world, as was also the death of our Lord. Three most notable mysteries, yet done in secret by God. How then was our Saviour manifested to the world? There shone a star in heaven above all other stars, and its light was unspeakable, and its strangeness wrought amazement. All the other stars, yea, the sun and moon also, were but its train, and it sent forth its light beyond them all. And there was trouble to think whence this unwonted strangeness might be. Hence all the power of magic was dissolved, and every bond of wickedness was destroyed. Ignorance was taken away. The old kingdom was abolished. God himself appearing in the form of a man, for the renewal of eternal life. Moreover, the full dispensation of God then took its beginning. From thenceforth all things were disturbed, for as much as he designed to abolish death. But if Jesus Christ shall give me grace through your prayers, and it be his will, I purpose in a second epistle, which I will shortly write unto you, to manifest to you more fully the dispensation, of which I have now begun to speak, under the new man, which is Jesus Christ, both in his faith and in his love, in his suffering and in his resurrection, especially if the Lord shall make it known unto me, that ye may all, and each of you, by grace, concur in professing the name of one faith and one Jesus Christ, who was of the race of David according to the flesh, the Son of Man and Son of God that ye may obey your bishop and the presbytery with an entire affection, breaking one and the same bread, which is the medicine of immortality, our antidote that we should not die, but live for ever in Christ Jesus. My soul be for yours, and for theirs whom ye have sent to Smyrna, to the glory of God. From whence also I write to you, giving thanks unto the Lord, and loving Polycarp, even as I do you. Remember me, as Jesus Christ doth remember you. Pray for the church which is in Syria, from whence I am carried bound to Rome, being the least of all the faithful which are there, amongst whom I have been thought worthy to be found to the glory of God. Fare ye well in God the Father, and in Jesus Christ our common hope. Amen. End of section 47. Section 48 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Epistle of Ignatius, the friend of St. Peter, on his way to martyrdom, to the Magnesians. Ignatius, which is also Theophorus, to the church that is in Magnesia, nigh to Meander, the blessed of God the Father, through Jesus Christ our Saviour, in whom I salute it and pray that it may have all joy, in God the Father and Jesus Christ. Being aware how righteously ordered is your love and charity in God, the gladness which I feel has induced me to address you in the spirit of Jesus Christ, 
For, admitted as I am to the noblest of titles and the bonds which I bear about me, I make my song to the churches, praying that they may possess a union of the flesh and spirit of Jesus Christ, who is our life for evermore, and of faith and charity which surpasseth all things, and, more than these, of Jesus and of the Father, through whom, when we have endured all assaults from the prince of this world after we have escaped, we shall be with God. Seeing now it is my privilege to behold you, through Damus, your most holy bishop, and your worthy presbyters, Bassus and Apollonius, and your deacon, my fellow labourer Socian, toward whom I am tenderly affectioned, because he is subject to his bishop as to a gracious gift from God, and to the presbytery as to an institution of Jesus Christ. I determine to write unto you. Your duty, likewise, is it, not to bear yourselves towards your bishop with the freedom proportioned to his youth, but, according to the power of God the Father, to concede to him all homage. As I am aware the holy presbyters do, you take no occasion from his apparent youthfulness for the station, but as men wise and a godly wisdom submit themselves to him, yet not to him, but to the Father of Jesus Christ, the Bishop of us all. Meet, therefore, it is, that for the honour of him who wills it, ye should present an obedience that is without guile, since in any delusion of your visible bishop you trifle rather with the bishop invisible, and so the question is not with flesh, but with God who seeth the secrets. It is men's duty not merely to bear the name of Christians, but such to be likewise. Whereas some there are who use the name of bishop, yet do all without consideration of the office. To me, such persons appear to be void of a good conscience, since they are a congregation of men not gathered together in strict conformity to the commandment. Now, as all things have their end, two alternatives are laid before us, death and life, and every man must go to his own place. For there are, as it were, two coins, one of God and one the world's and each of these has its proper mark upon it. Unbelievers, the mark of this world, and they who in love believe, the mark of God the Father through Jesus Christ, through whom, if we are not readily disposed to die after the likeness of his passion, neither have we his life in us. Seeing now that through the persons aforenamed I have seen you all gathered together in love and faith, take good heed, I charge you, that you do all things in a spirit of godly concord, the bishop holding presidency over you in the place of God, and the presbyters in the place of the council of apostles, and the deacons, my well-beloved, entrusted with the service of Jesus Christ, who was with the Father before the worlds, and appeared in the last days. Assuming, therefore, all of you this scheme of godly unity, give heed one to another, and let no man regard his neighbour in a fleshly spirit, but love ye one another continually in Jesus Christ. Let there be in you nothing which can divide you, but be ye made one in the bishop and in the superiors for an example and lesson of incorruption. As therefore our Lord, being united with the Father, without him, neither of himself nor by his apostles, did anything, so neither of you do anything apart from the bishop and the presbyters. Neither seek ye gratification in anything to your own selfish judgment, but be there in the same place, one form of prayer, one topic of supplication, one mind, one hope, in joy and love reproachless. There is one Jesus Christ who surpasseth all things, together therefore haste ye all as to one temple of God, as to one altar, as to one Jesus Christ who proceeded from one Father, and is in one, and to one returned. Be not led astray by strange doctrines, nor by old fables which are unprofitable. For if we still live under the Judaic law, it is a confession that we have not received grace. For in the faith of Jesus Christ the holy prophets lived. Wherefore also they were persecuted, being inspired with his grace, that unbelievers might be fully assured that there is one God who manifested himself in Jesus Christ his Son, who is his eternal word, not proceeding from silence, who in all things well pleased him who sent him. 
If then they who lived under the old dispensation have come to a newness of hope, superseding the sabbatical system, with that rule of life which is according to the Lord's day, wherein our life has arisen through the Lord and through his death, which some deny, from which mystery we received our faith, and thence take patience, that we may be found disciples of Jesus Christ, our only Master. How shall we be able to have life except through him? Whom the prophets also, being his disciples, expected in spirit as their master, and therefore he for whom they justly waited, did by his advent raise them from the dead. Let us not then be insensible to his goodness, for if he should imitate the way in which we act, we already have perished. Wherefore, becoming his disciples, let us live according to the religion of Christ. For whosoever is called by any other name but this is not of God. Put aside, therefore, the evil leaven, which hath grown old and waxed sour, and be ye changed into the new leaven, which is Jesus Christ. Be ye salted in him, that none among you may be corrupted, inasmuch as by your savour shall you be judged. The name of Jesus Christ cannot be joined with an adherence to Judaism, for the Christian faith goes not for its completion to the Jewish, but the Jewish goes to the Christian, that every tongue that believeth may be gathered to God. Beloved, it is my desire, not as knowing that any of you are so affected, but as seeing myself below you, to guard you against these things, so that you fall not upon the hooks of vain doctrine, but be fully assured of the birth and passion and resurrection which took place in the time of the government of Pontius Pilate, which verily and surely are things done by Jesus Christ our hope. And from that hope may none of you be turned away. May you be my joy in all things, if of that I be worthy, and bound though I am, I am above comparison with any of you who were loosed. I know that ye are not puffed up, for ye love Jesus Christ within you, and I know that from the abundance of my praise ye gather caution. As it is written, the just man accuseth himself. Study, therefore, to be confirmed in the doctrines of the Lord and of the apostles, that in all you do you may be well advanced in flesh and spirit, in faith and love, through the Son, Father, and Spirit, the beginning and the end, under your most excellent bishop and your presbytery, a well-twined spiritual garland, and the deacons according to God. Be ye subject to the bishop, and one to another, as Jesus Christ to his Father according to the flesh, and the apostles to Christ, and to the Father, and to the Spirit, that your union may be of the flesh and of the Spirit. Knowing that God dwelleth in you richly, I have exhorted you in few words. Remember me in your prayers, that I may be joined to God. Remember also the church which is in Syria, whereby I am not worthy to be called. For I require your united prayer and love to God, that the church in Syria may be refreshed with dew through your church. The Ephesians in Smyrna, whence I write to you, salute you, who are now here to the glory of God, like unto you, and have refreshed me in all things, together with Polycarp, bishop of the Smyrnians. Likewise, the other churches salute you in the honour of Jesus Christ. Be strong in the concord of God, possessing the spirit indivisible, which is Christ Jesus. End of section 48. Section 49 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Apostle John and the Robber, from the Church History of Eusebius. Listen to a tale which is no mere tale, but a true story which has been handed down and kept in memory of John the Apostle. For when the Roman Emperor was dead, and John had returned to Ephesus, from his banishment in the Isle of Patmos, he went over the neighbouring countries, in some places to appoint bishops, in some to establish new churches, in others to separate to the ministry some one of those whom the Spirit pointed out to him. At length, he arrived in a city not very far from Ephesus, of which some even give the name, and after he had refreshed the brethren, he turned at last to the bishop, whom he had appointed, and having observed a youth of goodly stature, comely appearance, and of ardent spirit, 
Here, he said, is a deposit which I earnestly commend to your care, in the sight of Christ and the Church. And after the bishop had accepted the charge and had promised all that was required of him, he had repeated the same request, and with the same solemn form of words. Accordingly, the elder, taking to his home the youth entrusted to him, bred, controlled, fostered, and at last admitted him to baptism. After this, he relaxed somewhat of his constant care and watchfulness, as having placed upon him the seal of the Lord, that last and best preservative from evil. But the other, having thus obtained his liberty too early, was taken hold of by certain idle and profligate youths of his own age, themselves habituated to wickedness. At first they lure him on by expensive revellings. Next they carry him along with them on a thieving expedition by night, and then they beg him to join them in some still greater crime. By little and little he became habituated to vice, and then through the hotness of his nature, starting like a hard-mouthed and spirited horse out of the right path, and taking, as it were, the bit into his mouth, rushed so much the more violently down the precipice. Finally, despairing of the salvation which is by God, he was no longer contented with more petty offences, but, as he was now altogether lost, would fain do some great thing, and disdained to suffer but an equal punishment with the rest. He took therefore with him these same companions, and having got together a band of robbers, became their ready leader, and of all the most violent, the most bloody, the most cruel. An interval elapsed, and upon some need falling out in the church, the men of the city again called upon John to visit them. After he had set in order the things for which he came, Come, said he to the bishop, give me back the deposit which I in Christ committed to thee in the sight of the church over which you preside. The bishop was at first amazed, for he thought that John was unjustly charging him with money which had not been really given him, and knew not either how to credit a demand for which he had never received, or how to discredit the apostle. But when he said plainly, It is the youth I demand of thee, the soul of a brother, the old man groaned from the bottom of his heart, and shedding a few tears at the thought, answered him, He is dead. How then did he die, and by what death? He is dead, he said, to God, for he has ended in becoming wicked and abandoned, and to sum up all, a robber, and now instead of the church, he is taken to the hills with an armed band of robbers like himself. And the apostle tore his garment, and uttering a loud wail, beat his head and said, A careful garden, truly, I left to the soul of my brother. But bring me a horse, and let me have someone to guide me on my way. So he rode away from the church, just as he was. When he came to the place, being taken by the outposts of the robbers, he neither fled from them, nor asked for mercy, but cried out, For this purpose came I, bring me to your chief. He, in the meantime, in the armour he wore, waited for his approach. When, however, he recognised St. John, as he drew near, he was filled with shame, and turned and fled. But the apostle followed after him with all his strength, forgetful of his years, and calling out, Why do you fly from me, my son, me your father, unarmed and stricken in years? Pity me, my son, and fear me not. Thou hast yet hope of life. I will give account for thee to Christ. Yea, if it be needful, I will willingly undergo the death for thee, even as our Lord the death for us. For thee will I render up my breath. Stay and believe. Christ hath sent me. But the young man, when he heard his words, first stood still, with eyes cast down to the ground, next threw away his arms, and then trembling, wept bitterly. And when the old man drew nigh to him, he threw his arms around him, and besought pardon as best he could with his groans, and was baptised, as it were, a second time, with tears, hiding only his blood-stained hand. But John, with promises and solemn protestations of his having obtained his pardon from the Saviour, besought him, nay, knelt to him, and kissed the very right hand he had withheld from him, as already cleansed by change of heart, and so brought him back to the church. 
finally interceding for him, sometimes in frequent prayers, sometimes striving together with him in long continued fasts, and sometimes soothing his spirit with various holy texts, he departed not, so they tell us, till he had fully reinstated him in the church, and had thus set forth a mighty example of true change of heart, and a mighty proof of regeneration, a trophy, as it were, of a visible resurrection. Here we see sinners baptized, taught, and brought to repentance by the Holy Church, at the hands of the bishops, whom the apostles have appointed. Conduct of the Apostle St. John towards the false teacher Corinthus from the church history of Eusebius. Dionysius, Bishop of Alexandria, noticing certain facts concerning the revelation of St. John derived from ancient tradition, makes mention of this Corinthus and affirms that the doctrine which he taught was that the reign of Christ would be upon earth and that it would consist, for so he wickedly dreamt in the pleasures which he himself desired, being a lover of the body and altogether carnal, of the gratification, that is, of the fleshly lusts, in meats, namely, and drinks, and marriages, or, as he thought in fairer words, to reach the same meaning, in feastings, and in sacrifices, and in the slaughter of victims. Thus far Dionysius. Moreover, certain of his more secret and false opinions are added by Irenaeus, who has also handed down to us in writing a story which ought never to be forgotten, and which he gives us on the authority of Polycarp, the disciple of St. John himself, and whom Irenaeus had known in his youth. John the Apostle, he says, entering for the purpose of bathing into some public baths, and learning that Corinthus was within them, recoiled from the spot, and rushed out of doors, not even enduring to be under the same roof with him, and exhorting them also that were with him to adopt the same conduct. In these words, let us flee, lest the very building should fall in, within which Corinthus, the enemy of truth, is abiding. Here we learn to avoid false teachers after the pattern of the blessed apostle, even though it inconvenience us to do so. End of section 49. Section 50 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Epistle of Ignatius, the friend of St. Peter, on his way to martyrdom, to Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. Ignatius, called also Theophorus, to Polycarp, of the church at Smyrna, Bishop and Superintendent, yea, rather himself superintended by God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, all hail. Welcoming thy disposition, which is to Godward, founded as upon an immovable rock, I glorify him, in that I have been honoured by thy presence, and praying that I may rejoice in it through God. I beseech thee, by the grace of God wherewith thou art invested, to press onwards in thy course, and to exhort all unto salvation. Maintain thy station in all diligence, both of body and soul. Study to preserve that unity, than which nothing is better. Endure all men, as the Lord has also endured thee. Continue, as thou dost, to bear with all men in love. Devote thyself to prayer without ceasing. Seek for more understanding than thou hast. Watch with an unwearied spirit. Speak unto every one as God shall enable thee. As a practised combatant, endure the weaknesses of all. For where labour abounds, there also abounds gain. For in that thou lovest the good disciples, what thank hast thou? Yea, rather with mildness bring into subjection the more mischievous. For every wound is not treated with the same application, but violent paroxysms are to be assuaged by emollient medicines. Be in all things wise as the serpent and harmless as the dove. For this end thou art formed of flesh and spirit, that thou mayest soften the things which are in thy sight. But pray that the things which are invisible may be revealed unto thee, that thou mayest want in nothing, but abound in every gift of God. The present season demands thee, as pilots the wind, as the storm-tossed mariner his desired haven, that thou attain unto God. Be temperate as God's champion. The reward is incorruption and eternal life, in which also thy faith is firm. In all things my soul is as thine, and so are my bonds which thou hast loved. 
Be not dismayed at those who seem worthy of trust and yet teach new doctrines. Stand firm as the anvil under the stroke, for he is a mighty champion, who, though buffeted, yet overcometh. But above all, for the sake of God, we must endure all, that he also may endure us. Become more and more zealous, study the times, await him who is above all time, the eternal, the invisible, who yet for us men became visible, the impalpable, the impassable, who yet for our salvation became subject unto suffering and endured all things. Let not the widows be neglected, for thou under the Lord art their guardian. Let nothing be done without thy sanction, neither thyself do anything without the sanction of God, which thing indeed thy constancy suffers thee not to do. Let your assemblies be held more frequently. Seek out and address all by name. Slight not the slaves, yet suffer them not to be puffed up, but let them rather serve the more diligently unto the glory of God, that from him they may obtain a more perfect freedom. Let them not seek to be emancipated at the public cost, lest they be found to be the slaves of their own desires. Avoid evil arts. Nay, Rather mention them not at all. Speak unto my sisters that they love the Lord and be content, in will as in deed with their husbands. Exhort also my brethren in the name of Jesus Christ that they love their wives, even as the Lord loveth the church. If any one can remain in chastity to the honour of the flesh of our Lord, let him do so in all humility. If he boast, he is already lost. Yea, if he reveal it to any one, save the bishop, he is corrupted. It is fitting for those who purpose matrimony to accomplish their union with the sanction of the bishop, that their marriage may be godly and not according to lust. Let all things be done to the honour of God. Hearken unto your bishop, that God may also hearken unto you. My soul is as the soul of them who are in subjection to their bishop, their presbyters, their deacons, and may my portion be with them in the Lord. Labour together, strive together, run together, suffer together, lie down together, rise up together, as the stewards, the ministers, and the servants of God. Seek to please him whose soldiers ye are, and whose wages ye receive. Let none of you be a deserter. Let your baptism remain, for it is your armour, your faith a helmet, your love a spear, your long-suffering a coat of mail. Let your deposits be your good works, that ye may finally receive the portion earned by your service. Be patient with one another in mildness, as God is with you. May I rejoice in you always. But, as it has been disclosed to me that the church of Antioch in Syria, through your prayers, is at peace, I have rather been of good cheer and secure reliance on God, if through suffering I shall attain unto him. That by your prayers also I may be found in the resurrection a true disciple. It is meet, O most blessed Polycarp, that thou shouldst call together a holy council and choose some one, well beloved and zealous, that he may be called God's messenger and appoint him to go into Syria, that he may make manifest your zealous love to the glory of Christ. The Christian is not master of himself, but is devoted to God's service. This work is God's and yours when you have accomplished it. For I trust in the grace which is in you, that ye are ready to every good work which appertaineth unto God, and therefore, as I know your zeal for the truth, my exhortation has been brief. Since I have not been able to write to all the churches, because I have been suddenly called upon to sail from Troas to Neapolis, do thou write to those which are nearest to thee, knowing that God's will is that they shall do the same onwards, sending, if possible, messengers, if not, entrusting their epistles to those whom thou shalt send, that ye may all be glorified for ever as ye are worthy. I salute all by name, and especially the wife of Epitropus, with her household and family, I salute Attalus, my beloved. I salute him who shall be chosen to go into Syria, that the grace of God may be with them alway in my prayer, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom may you continue in the unity of God and under his protection. Salute Alce, my well-beloved. 
Farewell in the Lord. End of section 50. Section 51 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Camp. Epistle of Ignatius, the friend of St. Peter, on his way to martyrdom, to the Tralians. Ignatius, which is also Theophorus, to the holy church that is in Tralies in Asia, beloved of God, the Father of Jesus Christ, chosen, godlike, having peace through the flesh and blood and passion of Jesus Christ, who is our hope and the following of his resurrection, which I salute in the plenitude of my apostolic character, and pray that it may have all joy. I know the reproachless spirit and unfailing unanimity that, not by occasion, but habitually belong to you, which also were set forth to me by Polybius, your bishop, who, by God's will and the will of Jesus Christ, was present in Smyrna, and so rejoiced with me and my bonds for Jesus Christ, that in his person you were all before my eyes, so that meeting with his godly kindness in him, I reckon on finding you, as I have also known you, the followers of God. For in that you were subject to your bishop as to Jesus Christ, you seem to me to be living not after the way of men, but according to Jesus Christ, who died for your sakes, that by believing in his death ye may from death escape. It is therefore your bounden duty, as it is also your practice, to do nothing apart from the bishop. Be subject, moreover, to the presbytery, as to the apostles of Jesus Christ our hope. May we be found to have had our conversation in him. It is requisite, too, that they who are deacons, ministers, of the mysteries of Jesus Christ, should be obliging to all men in every manner. For they are not ministers deacons, of meat and drink, but servants of God's church. They must therefore guard against reproach as against fire. Likewise, let all men give heed to the deacons as to an institution of Jesus Christ, and to the bishop as to the image of God, and to the presbyters as to the counsel of God and the company of apostles. Without these the name of church is not on which points I am persuaded that you hold with me, for I found and retain with me a specimen of your love in the person of your bishop, whose whole constitution of mind is an instructive lesson, and his meekness full of power. I suppose that even atheists respect him. Though able to write on this point, thus far only I mean to do so, lest a convict such as I should be giving laws to you like an apostle. God has granted to me the knowledge of many things, but I control myself, lest I perish in my boasting. For now I must be especially fearful, and hold off from them that puff me up. For they who make me their talk inflict a persecution upon me. I am well content to suffer, yet I know not that I am worthy to do so. My zeal, known but to few, is the more excited in myself. I have need, therefore, of that moderation, whereby the prince of this world is brought to naught. Am I unable to write to you of spiritual things? I am not unable, but fear lest I should bring an injury on infants such as you. Excuse, therefore, my doing so, lest from inability to receive my words you be choked of them. For even I, prisoner as I am, am not enabled to behold the things that are in heaven, the marshalling of the angels, the stations of the celestial powers, visible things and things invisible. But herein I am but a learner. For many things are placed beyond our capacity, lest we cease to have dependence on God. I exhort you, therefore, yet not I, but the love of Jesus Christ, to use only the Christian nourishment, and to abstain from the strange herb which is heresy. For the heretics, receiving credit on the score of worldly reputation, invest Christianity with poison, offering, as it were, their fatal drug in assault, and he who knows it not accepteth death with a ready and fatal welcome. From such men keep yourselves guarded, and guarded ye will be if ye are not puffed up, nor separated from Jesus Christ our Lord and from the bishop, and for the rules laid down by the apostles. He that is within the altar is pure. He that is without 
whoever, namely, acts independently of the bishop, the presbytery, and the deacons, is a man of unclean conscience. I am not aware that there is aught of this kind in you, but for the love I bear you, I put you on your guard, foreseeing as I do the snares of the devil. Do you therefore, gathering a spirit of meekness, establish yourselves in faith, which is the flesh of the Lord, and in love, which is the blood of Jesus Christ? Let none of you find a fault in his neighbour. Give no occasion to the heathen, lest on the score of a foolish, the godly many be evil spoken of. For woe unto him, because of whose levity my name is evil spoken of by any. Turn then a deaf ear to any man who departs in what he says from Jesus Christ, who was the seed of David, and born of Mary, who verily was born, did eat, and did drink, verily was persecuted under Pontius Pilate, verily was crucified and died, being seen of them that are in heaven, of them that are on earth, and of them that are under the earth who verily also was raised from the dead, his father raising him, in the likeness whereto us also who believe in him shall his father raise up through Jesus Christ, without whom the real life belongs not to us. But if, as some godless men which are unbelievers assert, it was only his shade that suffered, whereas they are but a shade, how came I to be in bonds? And why do I rejoice in the prospect of fighting with beasts. In such case I perish to no purpose, and belie my lord. Avoid then those mischievous offshoots, fruitful of death, the which if a man taste he shall die thereby, for these were not planted of the Father. For if they were, we should see them growing from the cross, and their fruit would be unto eternal life, in accordance whereto he in his passion inviteth you under the title of his own members. The head and the limbs cannot therefore have a separate existence, for God hath promised their union, and himself existeth therein. I send you my salutation from Smyrna, together with the salutation of the churches that are here with me, which have every way refreshed me both in body and spirit. My bonds supply you with a lesson, for I bear them for Jesus Christ's sake, praying that I may go to God. Continue in one mind, and assemble together for prayer, for it is right for every one of you, and for the presbyters particularly, to refresh your bishop's spirit, so that you may show honour to the Father, to Jesus Christ, and to the apostles. I pray that you may hear me in love, and that I may not, by writing this, be made a testimony against you. Likewise, do you for my sake pray, for I desire your love and the mercy of God, that I may be held worthy of that destiny which I press on to gain, and may not become a castaway. The love of the Smyrnians and Ephesians saluteth you. Remember in your prayers the church that is in Syria, whereby I am not worthy to be called, being last among them. Be strong in Jesus Christ, subject to your bishop as to the commandment, and to the presbytery likewise. Love one another, every one of you, with an undivided heart. My spirit saluteth you, not now only, but when I shall have gone to God. I have yet to fear for myself, but the Father is faithful in Jesus Christ to fulfil my prayer and yours. In him may you be found blameless. End of section 51section fifty two of Tracts for the Times, volume one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Accounts of the Martyrs of Lyon and Vienne from the Church History of Eusebius. In the seventeenth year of the Emperor Antoninus Verus, the persecution raged with fresh violence against us in some parts of the world by means of the attacks made on us by the populace of the several cities. We may conjecture from what occurred in a single country that myriads of martyrdoms took place throughout the earth. These are well worthy of immortal memory, and happen to have been transmitted to posterity in writing. The whole document which contains the fullest account of them is placed in my collection of martyrs, containing a description which is not merely historical, but also instructive. As much, however, as is connected with my present purpose, I will select and insert here. 
Others, in composing historical narrations, commit to writing victories in war and trophies over the enemy, and the exploits of generals and the valour of troops stained with blood and endless slaughter in defence of their children, their country, and their fortunes. But our narrative of the acts of a divine commonwealth will rather seek to inscribe on an everlasting monument those most peaceful wars for the peace of the soul, and the heroes who have fought in these, rather for the truth than for their country, and rather for religion than for the objects of their dearest affections. It will proclaim for eternal memory the perseverance and the enduring valour of the combatants in the cause of piety, and their trophies over devils, and their victories over unseen adversaries, and their crowns which followed. Gaul, i.e. France, then was the place of the conflicts of which we speak. The principal cities of this country, remarkable and celebrated above others, are Lyon and Vienne, through both which runs the stream of the Rhône, which passes with a rapid course round that whole region. The account of the martyrdoms, transmitted by the churches of chief note in these parts to those in Asia and Phrygia, thus describes the things done among them, and I will give their own words. Letter of the churches of Lyon and Vienne in the south of France to the churches of Asia and Phrygia. The servants of Christ that sojourn at Vienne and Lyon in Gaul, to the brethren in Asia and Phrygia, who have the same faith and hope of redemption with us, peace and grace and glory from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. The greatness of the sufferings in this country and the wonderful rage of the heathen against the saints, and how much the blessed martyrs endured, we are neither able accurately to declare, nor is it possible to be comprehended in writing, for the adversary rushed down upon us with all his might, as already anticipating his future coming without control, and went through all possible means in preparing and exercising his own beforehand against the servants of God so that we were not only excluded from the houses, the baths, and the market, but it was even forbidden for any of us to show himself in any place whatever. But the grace of God took the lead in opposition to him, and protecting the weak, set firm pillars and battle array against him, whose fortitude rendered them first to draw on themselves the whole violence of the evil one. Men who went forth to meet him, supporting patiently every kind of insult and torture, and counting the most he could do as little, were in haste to be with Christ, showing of a truth that the sufferings of this present time are not to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And in the first place, they nobly endured all the injuries heaped on them by the assembled populace, who hooted, beat, dragged about, plundered, stoned, and confined them, and did all such things as are wont to be done by a furious mob to those whom it hates, and counts its enemies. And lastly, when brought into the marketplace by the commander of the troops and the authorities of the city, and questioned before the whole multitude, they confessed, and were shut up in prison till the arrival of the governor. And when afterwards they were brought before the governor, and he showed the utmost cruelty towards us, Vettius Epagathus, one of the brethren, full of love toward God and his neighbour, and of so exact and perfect a life that, though a young man, he was equal to the testimony born to the aged Zacharias, in that he walked in all the commandments and judgments of the Lord blameless, and ready in every service to his neighbour, having great zeal toward God and fervent in spirit. This excellent man could not endure the unreasonable judgment which was passing against us, but testified his indignation and demanded to be heard himself in defence of the brethren. And when those about the tribunal hooted him down, for he was a man of note, and the governor would not allow the just claim he had put in on our behalf, but only asked if he too were a Christian, he confessed with a loud voice, and was himself taken, and so took his place among the number of the martyrs, being called the Advocate of the Christians, and having in himself the Advocate, or the Comforter, John chapter 14, verse 16. The Spirit, yet more than Zacharias, Luke chapter 1, verse 67, 
which he also showed by the fullness of his love, being ready to lay down his own life for the sake of defending his brethren. For he was, yea, is, a genuine disciple of Christ, following the Lamb wherever he goeth. Then also others began to be distinguishable. The first martyrs were conspicuous and prepared, fulfilling with all readiness the martyr's confession. Those also might be discerned who were unprepared and unexercised and still weak, unable to bear the strain of a great conflict. About ten of whom fell away, who also caused us much grief and unmeasured lamentation, and hindered the readiness of others who were not yet arrested, and who, though suffering all possible indignities, were in attendance on the martyrs, and did not desert them. Then, however, we were all greatly alarmed by the uncertainty of the confession, not fearing the cruelties that were inflicted, but looking to the end, and fearing that any one might fall away. Those, however, who were worthy were daily apprehended, filling up their number, so that there were taken up from the two churches all the best men, and those by whom things here were chiefly kept together. There were also taken up some heathen servants belonging to persons amongst our number, since the governor ordered a public inquisition to be made after us all. And they, by a device of Satan, fearing the tortures which they saw the saints endure, the soldiers urging them on, belied us as holding Thaistian feasts, and guilty of impurities like those of Oedipus, and such things as it is not allowed us to mention, or even to think of, no, nor to believe that they ever existed among mankind. But when these things were noised abroad, all were infuriated against us, so that, even if any had before shown moderation on account of connections, even these were greatly enraged and stung with malice, Acts chapter 5, verse 33, against us. And that was fulfilled which the Lord had foretold us, in John chapter 16, verse 2, The time shall come, when every one that killeth you shall think that he doeth God's service. Then afterwards the holy martyrs endured tortures beyond all description, Satan being ambitious of drawing some to blaspheme with their lips. But most eminently, did all the rage of the populace, the governor and the soldiers, light on Santos, a deacon of Vienne, and on Maturus, one newly enlightened but a noble champion, and on Athens, a pegames by birth, who had always been a pillar and support of those in this neighbourhood, and on Blandina, by whom Christ showed that the things which were lowly esteemed among men, and held by them mean and contemptible, are thought worthy of great honour with God for that love of him which is showed forth in power, and does not boast in a vain appearance. For when we all were in fear, and her own mistress according to the flesh, who also herself was one champion among the martyrs, was in agony for her, lest she should be unable to make even one bold confession from the weakness of her body, Blandina was filled with such strength, that even those who tortured her by turns in every possible way, from morning till evening, were wearied, and gave it up, themselves confessing that they were conquered, having nothing more that they could do to her. And they wondered at her remaining still alive, her whole body being mangled and pierced in every part, and declared that any one kind of torture was enough to deprive her of life, not to say so many, and so severe. But that blessed woman, like a brave wrestler, renewed her strength in confessing, and it was to her recovery and rest and ease from her sufferings to say, I am a Christian, and nothing vile is done amongst us. Sanctus also, for his part, enduring exceedingly, and above every man, all the cruelties of men with a noble patience, when the wicked hoped that, by the means of the continuance and severity of the tortures, they should hear something from him that ought not to be uttered, set himself against them with such firmness as not to mention even his own name, nor that of the nation or city whence he was, nor whether he were bond or free. But to all questions he answered in the Roman tongue, I am a Christian. This he repeatedly declared to be to him instead of a name, instead of a country, and instead of a family. But no other word did the heathen hear from him. Whence also there was great strife, both of the governor and torturers against him, so that when they had nothing left that they could do to him, 
At last they fastened red hot plates of brass on the tenderest parts of his body. For though his limbs were burning, he remained upright and unshrinking, steadfast to his confession, bathed and strengthened from heaven with that fountain of living water that springs from the well of Christ. But his body bore witness of what had been done, being one entire wound and bruise, and wrenched and deprived of the external form of man in whom Christ himself suffering showed forth great glory, confounding the adversary, and showing, for an example to others, that nothing is terrible where there is the love of the Father, nothing painful where is the glory of Christ. For when the ungodly again, after several days, tortured the martyr, and thought that they should overcome him by applying the same torments while his wounds were yet swollen and sore, and could scarce bear the mere touch of the hand, or that by dying under the torture he would at least alarm the rest. Not only did no such thing befall him, but also, contrary to all human expectation, his frail body recovered and was strengthened in his latter torments, and regained its former appearance and the use of the limbs, so that, by the favour of Christ, his second torture was made to him no punishment, but a remedy. And then the devil thinking he had already swallowed up one woman of the number of those who had denied Christ, named Biblius, led her to the torture, to compel her to say impious things concerning us, as one now easily to be broken without courage. But she came to herself under the tortures, and awoke, so to speak, from a deep sleep, being reminded by temporal punishment of the eternal misery of hell, and declared, in contradiction to the blasphemers, how should those devour children, with whom it is not allowed even to eat the blood of brute animals? And from this time she confessed herself to be a Christian, and was added to the number of the martyrs. But when these tyrannical cruelties were confounded by Christ through the patience of the blessed martyrs, the devil imagined other devices, such as confinement in prison, in the darkest and most loathsome dungeon, and stretching their feet in the stocks, even to the fifth hole, and all such other insults as the underkeepers, when enraged, and these same men filled with the evil spirit, are accustomed to put upon their prisoners, so that many were suffocated in the prison, those whom the Lord willed thus to escape, showing forth his glory. Some there were who had been bitterly tormented, so that it should have seemed that with all possible care they could scarce have lived who stayed in prison, deprived indeed of human care, but revived and strengthened by the Lord in body and soul, and exciting and comforting the rest. But the young and those newly apprehended, whose bodies had suffered no previous mangling, could not endure the pressure of this confinement, but died in prison. But the blessed Potinus, who was entrusted with the bishopric of the church in Lyon, above ninety years of age, and quite worn out in body, scarce able to breathe from his previous infirmity, but renewed in strength by the readiness of his spirit, in his earnest desire of martyrdom, himself also was dragged to the tribunal. His body worn out with age and disease, but his life being still kept in him, that Christ might triumph through it. Who, when brought by the soldiers to the tribunal, all the authorities of the city following him, and all the crowd, as though he had been Christ himself, uttering all sorts of cries against him, bore a good testimony. And when asked by the governor, who might be the god of the Christians, he said, If thou be worthy, thou shalt know. After this he was dragged about without mercy, and suffered all kinds of buffeting, those who were near him assaulting him with their hands and feet without regard to his age, and those at a distance throwing at him whatever came to hand and all thinking any one guilty of a great fault and impiety who should be wanting in insolence towards him. For they considered that they should thus avenge their gods. And he was cast, scarce alive, into the prison, and died after two days. Here, then, there took place a remarkable dispensation of God, and an infinite compassion of Jesus was shown forth, a thing which had rarely occurred in the brotherhood, but is not unsuited to the wisdom of Christ. For those who denied at their first apprehension were themselves also confined and partook of our sufferings. At this time the denial of the faith was of no use to them, 
for those who confessed what they were were imprisoned as Christians, no further charge being brought against them, whereas these were still detained as murderers and impure, suffering double the punishment of the rest. Those, indeed, the joy of martyrdom, and the hope of the promises, and the love of Christ, and the Spirit of the Father comforted. But these, conscience tormented with great vengeance, so that in passing by their countenances might be distinguished amongst all the rest. For the one went cheerfully, great glory and grace being mingled in their countenances, so that their very chains hung on them as a noble ornament, as on a bride adorned with robes embroidered and fringed with gold, at the same time smelling so of the sweet odour of Christ, that some even appeared to have been anointed with earthly perfumes. But the others went abashed and dejected and wretched in their looks, and full of disgrace, and moreover reproached by the very heathen as ignoble and unmanly, bearing indeed the charge of murder, but having lost the honourable and glorious and life-giving name. The rest, seeing these things, were confirmed, and those who were apprehended confessed without hesitation, not even taking any thought of the reasonings of the devil. To conclude, their martyrdoms were distinguished by various kinds of death, for having plaited a crown of different colours and all kinds of flowers, they offered it to the father. It was needful, it seems, that these noble champions who had endured a varied conflict, and being greatly victorious, should receive the great and incorruptible crown. Marturus and Sanctus and Blandina and Artemis were taken to the beasts in the public place for a common spectacle to the inhumanity of the heathen, this day of wild beast fighting being given on purpose to show forth our martyrs. And Marturus and Sanctus again went through in the amphitheatre every torture as if they had absolutely suffered nothing before. Rather, as having now in several combats foiled the adversary and engaged in the contest for the very crown, they supported again the courses of scourging usually inflicted there, and the dragging about by the beasts, and whatever else the mad populace shouted and demanded on this side and that to have done to them. And above all, the iron seat, on which their bodies, being scorched, choked them with the smell. But their persecutors did not cease even with this, but were yet more outrageous, wishing to overcome their patience. And even thus they could hear nothing from Sanctus, beyond the words of confession he had been accustomed to use from the first. These then, their life holding out long through a severe conflict, were at last put to death, being by themselves throughout that day a spectacle to the world, instead of all the variety of single combats. But Blandina, hung up on a cross, was placed to be devoured by the beasts that were turned in. She, thus visibly hanging in the figure of a cross, and engaged in earnest prayer, wrought great readiness in those who underwent the conflict, since they saw in the midst of their sufferings, even with the outward eye, in their sister, him who was crucified for them, to persuade those who believe in him, that every one who hath suffered for the glory of Christ hath for ever communion with the living God. And, none of the beasts having at that time touched her, she was taken down from the cross and carried up again to the prison to be kept for another conflict that, by conquering in yet more encounters, she might bring inexorable condemnation on the crooked serpent. And though by nature little, weak, and easily to be despised, yet having put on Christ, the great and invincible champion, she might encourage the brethren, having overpowered the adversary in many combats, having won in the contest the incorruptible crown. Next, Attalus himself, being much called for by the multitude, for he was a well-known man, came and prepared for the combat by a good conscience, since he was truly exercised in the Christian discipline, and had always been amongst us a witness of the truth. He was led all round the amphitheatre, with a tablet carried before him, on which was written in Latin, This is Attalus, the Christian. And the people, being exceedingly enraged against him, the governor, having understood that he was a Roman, ordered him to be taken back among the rest that were in the prison concerning whom he sent to Caesar, and waited for his decision. But the meantime was not idle nor fruitless to them, but through their patience the infinite mercy of Christ appeared. For the dead members were enlivened through the living, 
and the martyrs showed favour to those who were not martyrs, and there was great joy to the Virgin Mother of the Church in receiving those again living whom she had cast away as dead and abortive. For by those good men, the greater number of those who had denied Christ were renewed, and reconceived, and rekindled, and learned to confess, and now, living and full of nerve, were brought before the tribunal. God, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but showeth goodness to repentance, granting them of his kindness to be again questioned by the governor. For Caesar, having ordered that these should be executed, but that if any deny it, they should be released. And the public festival here began, which is numerously attended by persons who come together to it from all nations. He brought the blessed martyrs to the tribunal for a spectacle, and to make a show of them to the multitudes. Wherefore also he examined them again, and as many as appeared to have had Roman citizenship, he beheaded, but the rest he sent to the beasts. But Christ was greatly glorified in those who denied before, but then confessed, contrary to the expectation of the heathen. For these were even separately examined, as on the idea that they were to be dismissed, but confessing were added to the number of the martyrs. But those remained without, who never had any trace of faith, nor a feeling of the bridal garment, nor a sense of the fear of God, but by their very manner of life brought scandal on the true way, that is, the sons of perdition. But all the others were united to the church, and while they were under examination, one Alexander, a Phrygian by birth and a physician by profession, who had lived many years in the provinces of Gaul, was known almost by all for his love to God, and boldness in declaring the word, for he was not without a share of the apostolic gift, standing by the tribunal and encouraging them by signs in their confession, was observed by those who stood round the tribunal, to be thus, as it were, in travail for them. But the multitude, being enraged at hearing these confess again, who had before denied, cried out against Alexander as if he had been the cause of it. And the governor, turning upon him and asking who he was, he answered, A Christian. Upon which the other, in a rage, condemned him to be given to the beasts, the next day he came in with Attalus, for the governor, to please the people, gave up Attalus also again to the wild beasts. But they, in the amphitheatre, having passed through all the instruments of torture that ever were invented, and endured a most severe conflict, were at last put to death. Alexander, without uttering a groan or a syllable, but conversing in his heart with God. But Attalus, when he was placed on the iron seat and scorched, when the vapour went up from his body, said to the crowd in the Roman tongue, Behold, this is man-eating, which you yourselves do. But we neither eat men, nor do any other evil thing. And when asked what name God hath, he answered, God hath not a name, as a man hath. And after all these things, on the last remaining day of the combats, Blandina was brought in again, with a boy from Pontus, about fifteen years old, who had also been brought in every day to see the tortures of the others, who were commanded to swear by their idols. And because they remained constant and set them at naught, the multitude was enraged against them, so that they neither pitied the youth of the boy nor respected the female. But they put them to all the most dreadful tortures, and made them pass through the whole course of inflictions, demanding of them again and again to swear, by the heathen gods, but unable to make them do so. For the youth of Pontus, encouraged by our sister, so that even the heathen saw that she was forwarding and confirming him, having nobly endured all his torments, gave up the ghost. But the blessed Blandina, last of all, like a noble mother, having stirred up her children and sent them forward victorious to the king, and having herself gone through all the same conflicts with her children, hastened after them, rejoicing and exulting in her departure, as if called to a marriage supper, instead of being thrown to wild beasts. And after the scourging, after the wild beasts, after the scorching, at last she was placed in a basket and thrown to a bull, and died, after having been much tossed about by the animal, having no feeling for her sufferings, through her hope and hold of those things which she believed, and her converse with Christ even the heathen themselves confessing that no woman ever among them bore such and so numerous tortures. 
but not even thus could their madness and cruelty to the saints be satisfied. For those fierce and barbarous tribes stirred up by the dragon were hardly to be quieted, and they made another fierce attack on the bodies of the martyrs, being not ashamed of their former defeat, because they had not the reasonable feeling of men, but it rather inflamed their anger, as though both governor and people had been of some brute nature, showing like unjust hatred to us, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He that is ungodly, let him be ungodly still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. For even they threw those who were stifled in the dungeon to the dogs, watching them carefully night and day, lest any should be buried by us. And then, having exposed what beasts and fire had left, partly torn and partly burned to a cinder, and the heads of the rest with the headless bodies, they kept them in like manner unburied, with military observation and guard many days. And some grinned and gnashed their teeth at them, seeking to wreak some further vengeance on them. Others mocked and jested at them, glorifying their idols, and ascribing to them the punishment of the dead. Even the better sort, and those who seemed to have some compassion, uttered many reproaches, saying, Where is their God? And what has this service profited them, which they chose before their own lives? Such were the various doings of our enemies. But we were in great sorrow, for that we could not commit the bodies to the earth. For neither would night enable us to do it, nor would money persuade, nor entreaty shame them. But they guarded them in every way, as if they gained much in depriving them of burial. The bodies of the martyrs, when they had been publicly insulted and exposed in every way for six days, were at last burnt to ashes by the ungodly and swept into the river Hron, which runs by, that not a fragment of them might appear still on the earth. And this they did as if they could overcome God and deprive them of their resurrection, in order, as they said, that these Christians may not have even that hope of rising again, which persuades them to bring in upon us some strange and new worship, and to despise all terrors, coming readily and with joy to their death. Now let us see if they will rise again, and if their God can help them and take them out of our hands. Such were the sufferings of the blessed saints in early times for Christ their Saviour. Hence we learn how Christ supports all who trust in him, and how far we are below the saints of early times in courage, patience, and love. We learn that our greatest troubles are very slight compared with those which Christians then underwent, and underwent for their very virtue's sake, whereas now we often suffer only for our sins. And we learn beside how blessed it is to suffer boldly in a good cause, for we encourage others to do the same. We are reminded what a short time the fiercest sufferings last, for these cruel trials of the Christians of France took place so long ago that it is as if they had never been, whereas ever since, and now, and so on forever, these martyrs have been rejoicing in heaven in the presence of God. Moreover, we learn how we ought to think of, love, and imitate good Christians, however far off. We are not so far from France as France is from Asia, now this letter was written to the churches of Asia, which shows how anxious the Christians in those parts were to know about the trials of their brethren in France. End of section 52。section 53 of Tracts for the Times, volume 1。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。read by Beeswax Candle。Epistle of Ignatius, the friend of St. Peter, on his way to martyrdom, to the church at Smyrna. Ignatius, who was called also Theophorus, to the church of God, the Father, and the beloved Jesus Christ, which is at Smyrna in Asia, mercifully blessed with every gift of God, fulfilled in faith and love, most acceptable in his sight, and fruitful in saints, deficient in no one of his gifts, hail in the Holy Spirit and in the Word of God. I glorify Jesus Christ, even God, who has made you thus wise unto salvation. For I have perceived that ye are perfected in immovable faith, as though ye were nailed, both in body and soul, unto the cross of our Lord Jesus, and firmly established in love through the blood of Christ, most fully believing upon our Lord, who verily was of the race of David according to the flesh, 
but the Son of God according to the will and the power of God. Truly born of a virgin, baptised of John, in order that all righteousness might be fulfilled by him, who for us was truly nailed to the cross and the flesh under Pontius Pilate and Herod the Tetrarch, of whose fruit we are, through his divine and blessed passion, that he may, by his resurrection, raise a standard for ever for his faithful saints, whether Jews or Gentiles, in one body of his church. For he suffered all these things for us and for our salvation, and he verily suffered, as he in verity also raised himself again, and not, as some unbelievers say, that he suffered an appearance only, being themselves only an appearance. And according to their belief, so shall it be unto them, seeing that they are fantastics and demoniacs. For I know that even after the resurrection he was in the flesh, and believed that he still is. And when he came unto Peter and his companions, he said, Take hold, handle me, and see that I am not an incorporeal spirit. And immediately they touched him and believed, being convinced both by his flesh and his spirit, through which conviction also they despised death and were found to be superior to it. But after his resurrection, he in the flesh ate and drank with them, although being in the Spirit united to the Father. These things I exhort you, my beloved, knowing that thus also ye are disposed of yourselves. But I forewarn you against beasts in human shape. These you must not only not admit to your society, but if possible, not even come in their way. Only pray for them, if by any means they may repent, which yet is a hard matter, but our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our true life, has power even for this. For if, in appearance only, these things were done by our Lord, then are my bonds also in appearance only. But wherefore have I given myself up unto death, to the fire, to the sword, to beasts? And if I am near the sword, I am near God. And if I am among beasts, I am with God also. Only in the name of Jesus Christ I endure all that I may suffer with him, as he who became perfect man gives me strength. Whom some, not knowing, deny, nay, rather are denied of him, being the advocates not of truth but of death, whom neither the prophecies nor the law of Moses nor even the gospel up to this day nor our individual sufferings have converted. For they think the same thing even concerning us. What availeth it to me if any one praiseth me but blasphemeth my Lord, denying that he came in the flesh. But he who denieth this, denieth him altogether, being dead in spirit. But the names of these men it hath not seemed good to me to write, seeing that they are in unbelief. Nay, I would not that I should mention them at all, until they should be turned to belief in his passion, in which consists our resurrection. Let no one deceive himself, even heavenly things, and the glory of angels, and powers, visible and invisible, are condemned already if they believe not in the blood of Christ. He that is able to receive this, let him receive it. Let no one be puffed up by rank, for faith and love, to which nothing is preferable, are all in all. But consider those who hold other doctrines than the grace of God which has come unto us, how contrary they are to the will of God, who have no care for brotherly love, who take no thought for the widow, the orphan, or the oppressed, bond or free, hungry or thirsty. These abstain from the sacrament and from prayer, because they confess not that the sacrament is the body of our Saviour Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins, which the Father in his mercy raised again. They then, denying the gift of God, perish in their disputes. Well had it been for them to accept it, rather with thankfulness, that through it they might rise again. From such, then, it is meet that you should abstain, and not even to speak concerning them, either in private or public, but attend diligently to the prophets, and above all to the gospel in which his passion is made manifest to us, and his resurrection perfected. But avoid divisions as the beginning of evils. Follow your bishop, all of you, even as Jesus Christ the Father, and the body of the presbyters as the apostles. Respect the deacons, as ye would the commandment of God. Let no one do anything pertaining to the church without the bishop. 
let that be esteemed a well-ordered celebration of the sacrament, which is administered either by the bishop or by those to whom he has committed it. Where the bishop is, there let the body of believers be. Even as where Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Without the bishop, it is lawful neither to baptize nor to celebrate the communion. But whatever he judges right, that also is well-pleasing unto God, that all which is done be safe and firm. It is meet that we should return to a sober mind, and while we have yet time, repent and turn unto God. It is good to regard God and the bishop. Whoso honoureth the bishop, he is honoured of God. But he that doeth anything hidden from the bishop showeth the devil. May all things abound unto you in grace, for ye are worthy. In all things ye have refreshed me, even as Jesus Christ has refreshed you. You have loved me when I was present, and ye have loved me when I was absent. God reward you, therefore, for whom ye endure all things. Therefore also ye will attain unto him. Ye have done well, in that ye have received as the servants of Christ, even of God, Philo and Rheus and Agathopus, my followers in the word of God, who also bless the Lord for you, because ye have in every way refreshed them. None of these things shall perish. My soul be as your souls, and my bonds, which ye despised not, neither were ashamed of. Wherefore he who was perfect faith, even Christ Jesus, will not be ashamed of you. Your prayer has come unto the church, which is in Antioch in Syria, from whence, coming in bonds, which are acceptable to God, I salute you all. Nor am I worthy to be called one of that church, because I am the last of them. But by the will of God I was deemed worthy, not as being myself conscious thereof, but through the grace of God, which I pray may be given unto me perfectly, that through your prayers I may attain unto God, that therefore your work may be perfected, both on earth and in heaven. It is right for the honour of God that your most sacred church should elect someone to go into Syria to congratulate them that are at rest, and that their numbers have been regained, and their body re-established. It seems to me befitting that you should send some one of your members with an epistle, that he may with them glorify God for the quietness which he has vouchsafed unto them, and for their having reached the harbour through your prayers. As ye are perfect, so let your sentiments be perfect. For to those who wish to do well, God is ready to vouchsafe it. The love of the brethren at Troas salutes you, from which place I send this epistle by the hands of Burrus, whom you sent with me, along with your Ephesian brethren, and who has in every way been a comfort to me, and would that all imitated him as a pattern of God's ministry. The grace of God will fully reward him. I salute your holy bishop, your most sacred presbytery, and my fellow servants the deacons, individually and together in the name of Jesus Christ, in his flesh and blood, his passion and resurrection, both of body and spirit, in the unity of God and of you. Grace be with you, mercy, peace, and patience evermore. I salute the households of my brethren, their wives and children, the virgins and widows. Farewell through the Spirit. Philo, who is with me, salutes you. I salute the household of Tabia, and pray that she may be established in body and soul, in faith and love. I salute Elche, my well-beloved, and the incomparable Daphnus and Eutechnus, and all of you by name. Farewell in the grace of God. End of section 53「Section 54 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Epistle of Ignatius, the friend of St. Peter, on his way to martyrdom, to the Romans. Ignatius, which is also Theophorus, to the church which hath found mercy by the greatness of the Supreme Father and of Jesus Christ his only Son, beloved and enlightened by the will of him who willeth all things, according to the love of Jesus Christ our God and which is established in the place of the Romans, all godly, all gracious, all blessed, all praised, all prospering, all hallowed, enthroned in love, with the name of Christ and with the name of the Father. Salutation in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, 
so that ye, being united in flesh and spirit according to all his will, ever filled with the grace of God, and cleansed from all outward pollution, may have a plenteous and blameless joy through the Lord Jesus Christ our God. Since through prayer to God it hath been granted unto me to behold your godly countenances, an event I have very greatly desired, bound as I am in Jesus Christ, I have a hope of saluting you, if by God's will I be deemed worthy to attain unto my end. For my progress has begun successfully, if I but find grace to come unto my consummation without hindrance. For I have fears from your love, lest even it should bring injury upon me. For to you it is easy to work your purpose, but there will be a difficulty in the way of my going unto God if your affection interfere for me. I desire that ye be not men-pleasers, but pleasers of God, which ye also are. For never shall I find such an opportunity of gaining the presence of God, nor can you have any deed reported of you more glorious than your silence now. For if you abstain from interfering for my safety, I shall go unto God. But if you attach yourselves to my temporal welfare, I shall have to run my course in you. You can give me no better gift than my immolation to God, while yet the altar is ready, that becoming a choir in love, ye may sing to the Father in Jesus Christ, for that it hath pleased God to call the Bishop of Syria out of the east, and that he should be brought into the west. It is well for me in learning the world that I should set unto God, that in God I may rise. Ye have spoken evil of no man, ye have taught others. It is my desire that the lessons ye have given may find a firm foundation. Do ye only ask for me power from within and from without, that I may not only speak, but also feel, not only bear the name of Christian, but approve myself one. For if I approve myself one, I shall be entitled to the name, and shall be reckoned to have been faithful when the world seeth me no more. For nothing visible is abiding. Visible things are temporal. Things invisible are eternal. For our God, which is Jesus Christ, assumes a more visible reality in his union with the Father. This is no time for holding peace. When Christianity is hated of the world, it calls for high exertions. I write to the churches and charge you all that I die willingly for God, unless you prevent me. I exhort you not to show me an unseasonable kindness. Suffer me to be devoured by wild beasts, for by their means I am permitted to go to God. I am food for God's service. Let me be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts, that I may be found pure bread unto Christ. Yea, encourage ye them, that they may be my grave, and may leave no part of my body, so that when I am fallen asleep, I may burthen no man. Then shall I be a true disciple unto Christ, when the world seeth my mortal body no more. Pray ye to Christ for me, that by their instrumentality I may be found a sacrifice unto God. I make not my commands unto you, as though I were Peter or Paul. They were apostles. I have been condemned. They were free. I hitherto am a slave, but if I suffer unto death, I shall become the freed man of Jesus, and shall have a resurrection unto liberty in him. Now am I learning, while in my bonds, not to set my affections on anything that is worldly and fallacious. From Syria unto Rome I carry forward my sufferings, by land and sea, night and day, enchained of ten leopards, which are the soldiers ranked around me, who by kindness are made harsher, but I take a lesson from their misdeeds. Yet not herein am I made perfect. I long for the wild beasts that are prepared for me, and I pray that they may be found ready. Nay, I will encourage them quickly to devour me, and not to spare me with the timidity which they have shown to others. If they do it not of their own will, I will put a force upon them. I claim of you to bear with me. I have discovered my true interest. I am just becoming a disciple. All things, whether seen or unseen, are tasteless to me, so that I go to Christ. 
Fire and cross, the assault of beasts, the rending of my bones, the laceration of my limbs, the crushing of my whole frame, dire tortures of Satan, let them come upon me, so that I but go to Christ. In the enjoyments and the ambition of this present world, my hopes repose not. I had rather die in Jesus Christ than reign unto the ends of the earth. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I am seeking him who died for us. I am longing for him who rose for our sake. This is the gain which I have before me. Have pity on me, my brethren. Do not prevent me from living. Do not wish for me to die when I desire to live with God. Enter not into the sympathies of this world. Permit me my portion in the spotless light. For when I arrive thither, I shall belong to God. Suffer me to imitate the sufferings of my God. If any man hath him in himself, let him perceive what are my wishes, and sympathize with me, knowing what is that constraineth me. The prince of this world desireth to tear me away, and to corrupt the purpose that I have to Godward. Let none of you who are at my side give him your help. Adhere rather to my cause. It is the cause of God. Talk ye not of Jesus Christ while your affections are set on the world. Let no hatred dwell within you. If, when I come among you, I claim of you to interfere for my preservation, yet listen not to me. Keep faith rather with the terms in which I now write to you. I live, but while I am writing to you, I long to die. My affections are crucified. I have in me neither their flame nor its fuel. But there is the living water that speaketh in me, and saith from within, Come hither unto the Father. I have no taste for corruptible food, or for the pleasures of this world. I long for the bread of God, heavenly bread, bread of life, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was of the seed of David in the latter days. And I long for the drink of God, his blood, which is love without corruption, and life for evermore. I desire no longer to live after the manner of men, and no longer shall I live so if you concede to me this favour. Favour me, therefore, that yourselves may find favour. I have written to you in a few words. Place confidence in me. Surely Jesus Christ shall make this manifest unto you that I have spoken truly. He is that mouth that cannot lie, whereby the Father spoke truly. Pray for me, that I may attain. I have written to you, not according to the flesh, but according to the counsel of God. If I suffer, let it have been with your good will. If I am a castaway, let it have been at the expense of your regard for me. Remember in your prayers the church that is in Syria, which hath God for its shepherd instead of me. Its only bishop now will be Jesus Christ and your love. I feel unworthy to bear the name of my flock. I am the last among them. I am one born out of due time. But by the mercy of God, I shall be of some small account if I go unto him. My spirit saluteth you, as doth the love of the churches which received me in the name of Jesus Christ, not as a chance traveller. For even the cities that lay not on my road have in every instance forwarded me on this journeying of my outward man. I write this unto you from Smyrna, by the hands of the truly blessed Ephesians. Crocus, a well-beloved name to me, and many others are with me. I suppose you to be not unaware of those persons who have preceded me from Syria to Rome, to the glory of God. Make it known to them that I am now at hand. They are all meet for God, and deserve your kindness, and you ought in every manner to assist them. I write this to you on the day preceding the ninth of the calends of September. Be strong unto the end, in the patience of Jesus Christ. End of section 54。section 55 of Tracts for the Times, volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. The martyrdom of Ignatius, the friend of St. Peter and St. John, and Bishop of Antioch, at Rome. 
Not long after the accession of Trajan, Emperor of Rome, Ignatius, who had been the disciple of St. John the Apostle, and who himself shone forth in his conduct all the features of the apostolic character, was actively engaged in the task of superintending the Church of Antioch. He had been recently directing its affairs, but it was struggling through those frequent days of storm and persecution which occurred during the reign of Domitian, and, like a skilful pilot, with rudder and with cable, he had borne up against the swelling and insurgent billows, by prayer, by fasting, by assiduous teaching, in dependence on the Holy Spirit, as one who was deeply concerned that not one soul should perish among the weak and the simple that were entrusted to his care. It was not, therefore, without satisfaction that he witnessed the calm which the Church enjoyed during the temporary cessation of persecution, though at the same time, for himself he had much misgiving, that he as yet fell short of the perfect love of Christ, and had not arrived at the highest elevation which is offered to a disciple's hopes. He felt that, were he to make the confession of martyrdom, he would attain a more close similitude to his divine master. For the few succeeding years he continued at the head of the church, a burning and shining light, and truly the expositions which he gave of the Holy Scriptures spread a bright reflection upon the hearts of all around him. At length he attained the object of his hopes. It was in the ninth year of Trajan, when that monarch, elated with his recent victories over the Scythians, Dacians, and several other nations, appears to have regarded the pious brotherhood of Christians as forming the only exception to the universality of his conquests, and he accordingly issued his threats of persecution against any person who should refuse to perform the customary worship to the heathen gods so that all who professed the Christian religion were either reduced by their fears to acquiesce in this worship, or were exposed to the prospect of death if they refused it. Alive to the danger which had fallen on the church of Antioch, this valiant soldier of Christ permitted himself to be brought before Trajan, who was residing at that time in that city, and was on the eve of an expedition against Armenia and the Parthians. When brought into the imperial presence, he was thus addressed by Trajan. Who art thou? he said. And what evil spirit is exercising its malice upon thee, that thou hast thus adventured to transgress the commands which I have given, and even to exercise such persuasion upon others, as has brought them to a miserable end? Ignatius answered, I bear the title of Theophorus. Evil spirits cannot influence the acts of those who bear that name. The servants of God are protected from the approach of demons. But if, in supposing the malice of such beings towards me, you imply my hostility against them, I admit that you are not mistaken. For I am the subject of a heavenly king, whose name is Christ, and by his help I bring to naught the counsels of the evil spirits. What signifieth the title Theophorus? inquired Trajan. To whom belongs it? It belongs replied Ignatius, to all who carry Christ Jesus in their bosoms. Then, said Trajan, do you think we have not gods in our minds, that we employ them to fight with us against our enemies? Ignatius answered him, you do wrong to designate as gods the demons whom the heathen worship. There is one God who made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. And there is one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of whose kingdom I am an expectant. Do you mean, inquired Trajan, that person who was crucified in the time of Pontius Pilate? Him, replied Ignatius, I mean, who nailed upon his cross both the sins which I have committed, and the being that led me to commit them, and who has decreed that all spiritual craft and malice shall be put under the feet of them who carry him in their bosoms. Do you then, asked Trajan, carry a crucified man within you? Ignatius answered, I do, for it is written, I will dwell within them, and I will walk among them. Trajan then issued this sentence, We command that Ignatius, who says that he carries about within him one who has been crucified, be carried by soldiers in chains unto the great city of Rome, there to be devoured by wild beasts for the public gratification. When the holy martyr heard this announcement, 
he cried out with joy, I thank thee, O my master, that thou hast permitted me to show forth in the penalty I am to suffer the perfect love I have toward thee, and hast associated me with thine apostle Paul and these iron bonds. So saying, he gladly put on the chains, and after offering up a prayer for the church and commending it with tears to the Lord, he was withdrawn like some leader of a goodly flock, the foremost of its associates in grace and stature, being destined, under the conduct of a harsh and savage soldiery, to become a prey for the wild beasts at Rome. Maintaining a tone of mind thus elevated and happy in the prospect of the closing scene, he travelled from Antioch to Seleucia, and proceeded forward by sea, and on arriving after a troublesome voyage at Smyrna, he gladly took the opportunity of disembarking to visit the holy Polycarp, who at that time was bishop of the Smyrnaeans, and who was his own fellow disciple, both having at a former period received instruction from St. John the Apostle. After having continued some time the guest of Polycarp, having communicated with him his spiritual gifts, he declared the joy he found in his bonds, and invited him to give all diligence at assisting the main object of his desires, which was that the wild beasts might make him an early prey, and so, retiring from the sight of this world, he might pass into the presence of Christ. To assist him in this object, he more particularly invited St. Polycarp, but he extended the request to the church in general, for the churches and cities of Asia had, through their bishops, presbyteries and deacons, received the holy man, and all were pressing forward to meet him from their anxiety to partake in the spiritual gifts which he distributed. It was in terms like these, which have been stated, that he gave evidence of the integrity of that love for his Saviour, which was now leading him through a good confession to his heavenly inheritance, and he was assisted herein by the zealous prayers offered up by the persons who were with him with a reference to the season of his trial. In repayment of the kindness shown him by the churches, which received him on his journey, he sent by their rulers certain letters of thanks, which breathed forth the graces of a Christian spirit in the language of supplication and warning. And, noticing what kindness of feeling was exhibited on all sides toward him, he began to fear that now, while the glorious gate of martyrdom lay open before him, the affection of the Christian brotherhood would lead them to interfere with his devotion to the Lord, and he therefore addressed the church of the Romans in an epistle on the subject. Having by that epistle engaged in his own view those of the brethren at Rome, whose intentions had been opposite, he left Smyrna and proceeded on his voyage. The object of his military guard in thus hurrying him forward was to arrive at Rome in time for the games, which are publicly held in that great city, so that the populace might see him when he gained his crown of martyrdom by being thrown to the wild beasts. He touched at Troas, and then crossed to Neapolis, and traversing Macedonia by the way of Philippi, advanced to the parts of Epirus near Epidamnus. Here, finding a vessel on the coast, he crossed the Adriatic and entered the Tyrrhene Sea. As he was coasting in sight to the various islands and towns, the city of Putioli was pointed out to the holy man, and he expressed a strong desire to disembark there, in order that he might tread in the very footsteps of the Apostle Paul. But as the wind arose violently, and the vessel was running before it, he was prevented from doing so, and therefore passed straight onward, not without remarking how good and blessed a love was once exhibited by the brethren in that spot. Acts chapter 28 verses 13 and 14. Taking advantage of the wind, which during the whole day and ensuing night continued favourable, we hurried forward, unwillingly ourselves, for we wept at the thought of that just man's separation from us. But he, on the other hand, was well satisfied with an early removal from this world, in the hope of being sooner joined unto the Lord he loved. We landed at the Roman havens, nearly at the close of the unhallowed games, soldiers expressed impatience at the tardiness of our arrival, and the bishop was glad to acquiesce in their demand to hasten forward. The party was therefore hurried on from the place of landing called Portus, and reports concerning the holy martyr having gone before his arrival, he was met by certain brethren, whose minds were in a mingled state of fear and joy. Of joy at being counted worthy to meet with him, whom the Saviour had taken up in his arms, 
while at the same time they shuddered at the thought of such a man being dragged away to death. To some of them he expressed a wish that they should hold back from interference, as in the ardour of their feelings they declared an intention of inducing the populace to ask that this good man might not be killed. Knowing this, he implored all, after saluting them, to show him a true love, expressing himself more largely on the point than in his epistle, and entreating them not to injure the prospects of one who was hastening to his lord. And so, with all the brethren on their bended knees, he besought the Son of God for the churches, that he would remove from them this persecution, and confirm the brotherhood in all mutual love. After which he was hurried off to the amphitheatre, and straightway cast down into it, as the emperor had ordered, nearly as the games were going to close. It was on that high day which the Romans called the thirteenth, and the multitudes were accordingly assembled. He was thrown to the wild beasts at a spot close to the temple, and so was speedily carried into effect the desire of this holy martyr Ignatius, according to that which is written, The desire of the righteous shall be granted. For thus he was a burthen to none of his brethren from the trouble of gathering up his remains, a consummation and correspondence with a wish which he had previously expressed in his epistle. The harder parts were alone left, and these were gathered up and carried to Antioch, where they were wrapped in a linen cloth and deposited with the brethren of that holy church, a treasure rendered invaluable by the Christian graces which had adorned the martyr's life. This event took place on the 13th day before the calends of January, that is, on the 20th of December. The consuls at Rome were Cyrus and Senecius for the second time. We personally witnessed everything, and passed the following night within doors in tears, and often we knelt down and addressed to the Lord a prayer that he would strengthen that reliance in him which the event of the day had tended to disturb. For a little time we reposed in sleep, and on our doing so some of us presently saw him leaning over and embracing us. Others saw our blessed Ignatius praying over us, as he had previously been doing, while to others he appeared with the marks of recent struggles and exertions upon him, but now come up and standing before his Lord, his labours over, and rejoicing with exceeding gladness. After comparing the visions which thus presented themselves in our dreams, we sang a hymn to God, the giver of all good, and uttered the language of benediction over the departed saint. And now we make known to you the day and time at which this event occurred, that at the season of his martyrdom we may gather together and collect a portion of the spirit which animated this courageous champion and martyr of Christ, who trod down Satan beneath his feet, and finished, according to his hope, his career of love and zeal, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom, with the Father and the Holy Ghost, be glory and power throughout all ages. Amen. From this narrative we learn to make the most of our time, wherever we are and however circumstanced. We are always on our trial, always have duties, always can be promoting God's glory. Ignatius wrote his letters when he was a prisoner, travelling a weary way across a whole continent to his death. And of all his labours through forty years, these letters alone have been preserved to us. When then we are in pain or trouble and begin to despond, and think our labour has no fruit. Let us think of this blessed martyr, praise God, and take courage. End of section 55section 56 of tracts for the times volume 1 this librivox recording is in the public domain read by beeswax candle epistle of ignatius the friend of st peter on his way to martyrdom to the philadelphians ignatius which is also theophorus to the church of god the father and of our lord jesus christ that is in philadelphia of asia that hath obtained mercy and remaineth steadfast in godly concord, and exalteth continually in the passion of our Lord, and hath in his resurrection been richly furnished with all mercy. Even this church do I salute in the blood of Jesus Christ, which is our everlasting and abiding joy, especially if it be in unity with the bishop and his fellow presbyters and deacons, appointed after the mind of Jesus Christ, whom he hath, according to his will, established in all confidence, 
by his Holy Spirit. This your bishop, I know well, hath obtained his public ministry, not of himself, nor by the means of men, neither out of vain glory, but in the love of God the Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ. His moderation I do greatly admire, as he by silence doth more prevail than others with their idle disputations, for he is exactly fitted to the commandments, even as a harp to the strings. Wherefore my soul esteemeth his mind toward God most happy, knowing it to be perfect in all virtue, as also his unmoved and dispassionate temper, according to the moderation of the living God. Do ye then, being children of light and truth, avoid division and corrupt doctrines? But where your shepherd is, thither follow ye as sheep. For there may be many wolves, held worthy to be trusted, who captivate by corrupt pleasure those that are running a godly course. But in your unity they shall have no place. Abstain from the evil herbs that Christ Jesus dresseth not, for as much as they are not the Father's planting. I say not this because I have found you divided, but rather sifted from evil. For all that are of God and Jesus Christ, these are with the bishop, and all that shall repent and turn to the unity of the church, these also shall be of God, that they may live after the example of Jesus Christ. Be not deceived, brethren. Whosoever followeth one that createth schism, he inheriteth not the kingdom of God. Whosoever walketh by another man's opinion, he consenteth not to the passion of Christ. Endeavour, therefore, to use one and the same Eucharist, for there is but one body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and one cup, that his blood may make us one. There is but one altar, also there is one bishop, together with the presbytery and deacons, my fellow servants, that so whatsoever ye do, ye may do all according to the will of God. My brethren, I abound in love toward you, even to overflowing, and in my exceeding joy I fortify you, and yet not I, but Jesus Christ, for whom, though I am in bonds, I have therefore the more fear, inasmuch as I am not yet made perfect. But your prayer to God shall make me perfect, that I may obtain that portion with which I was in mercy blessed, flying for refuge to the gospel as the blood of Christ, and to the apostles, as to the presbytery of the church. Let us love the prophets also, for they that have taught us, both to look with hope to the gospel, and to await it, as they also believed in it and were saved, being in the unity of Jesus Christ, holy men, worthy to be loved and had in wonder, who have received testimony from Jesus Christ, and have been reckoned in the gospel of our common hope. Now should any one expound Judaism unto you, Hearken not unto him, for it is better to hear Christianity from a man that hath circumcision than Judaism from one that is uncircumcised. But as they speak, neither one of them concerning Jesus Christ, they are unto me but as monuments and sepulchres of the dead, wherein is nothing written but the names of men. Fly, therefore, from the evil arts and snares of the prince of this world, lest at any time, being oppressed by his devices, ye grow weak in love, but join all of you together with an undivided heart. I thank my God that I enjoy a good conscience toward you, and that no one can profess, either privately or in public, that I have been burdensome to him in much or little. And I pray all, among whom I have spoken, not to entertain such profession as a testimony against me. For though some would have deceived me according to the flesh, Yet the Spirit is not deceived, being of God. For it knoweth whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, and reproveth all the secrets of the heart. I cried out while I tarried with you, spake with a loud voice, Give heed to the bishop, to the presbytery, and the deacons. Now some suspected that I spake things as knowing beforehand that among them was a spirit of division. But he is my witness, he for whom I am in bonds, that I knew it not from any living man. But the Spirit proclaimed, saying, Keep your body as the temple of God, love unity, avoid divisions, be ye followers of Jesus Christ, even as he is a follower of his Father. 
Wherefore I did my part, as a man fitted to the reserving of unity. For where there is division and wrath, there God dwelleth not. The Lord therefore forgiveth all when they repent, if in repentance they turn to godly unity in the counsel of the bishop. I have faith in the grace of Jesus Christ, that he will loose you from every bond, and I exhort you to do nothing with contention, but according to the instruction of Christ. And this I say, because I heard some affirm that I have not faith in the gospel unless I find it written in the records. And when I told them, It is so written, they answered, Nay, it doth not so appear. But my records are Jesus Christ. My uncorrupted records are his cross and death and resurrection and the faith which is by him, in the which I desire to be justified through your prayers. The priests indeed are good, but far more excellent is the high priest, who hath received charge of the holy of holies, who hath alone received charge of the hidden things of God. He is the door of the Father, through which enter in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and the prophets and the apostles and the church. All these things tend to godly unity, but the gospel hath an especial gift, namely the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ with his passion and resurrection. For the beloved prophets brought tidings of him, but the gospel is the fulfilment of immortality. All things are good together if ye have faith with love. Now, as I am told that, through your prayer and the hearts ye bear in Christ Jesus, the church which is in Antioch of Syria is in peace, it is fitting for you, as a church of God, to elect a deacon, who shall there exercise the office of God's ambassador, so that you may take part in their joy when they are met together, and may glorify the name of God. Blessed in Jesus Christ is he who shall be thought worthy of such a ministry, and ye also shall obtain glory. Now if ye be willing, it is not impossible to do this for the name of God, seeing that all the neighbouring churches sent some bishops, some priests and deacons. Touching Philo, the deacon from Cilicia, a man of good report, who serveth me even now in the word of God, together with Rius Agathopus, one of the elect, who followeth me from Syria, having taken leave of life. These also do bear testimony unto you. And I thank God for your sakes that ye received them, even as the Lord will receive you. But for those who showed them dishonour, may they be redeemed through the grace of Jesus Christ. The brethren who are in Troas salute you with all love. Whence also I write unto you by the hand of Burrus, who was sent with me by the Ephesians and Smyrnaeans for respect's sake. Our Lord Jesus Christ will honour them, on whom they hope in body and soul, in faith, in love, in concord. Fare ye well in Christ Jesus, our common hope. End of section 56. Section 57 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Account of the martyrdom of St. James the Apostle, who was called the Lord's brother, and was the first bishop of Jerusalem. From the Church History of Eusebius. The Church was delivered over to the Apostles, and especially to James, the Lord's brother, who was surnamed the Just, by one consent, from the Lord's time, even to our own. James was the name of many besides him, but this man was holy, even from his mother's womb. He drank no wine nor strong drink, neither did he eat any living thing. The razor came not on his head. He anointed not his body with oil, nor indulged in the luxury of the bath. He alone had leave to enter into the holy place, his garment being not of woolen stuff, but of linen. So he used to go alone into the temple, and was found continually kneeling on his knees, and praying for the forgiveness of the people, insomuch that his knees became hard, even as a camel's knees, because he was continually kneeling, worshipping God, and praying for the forgiveness of the people. Wherefore, by reason of his exceeding righteousness, he was called Decius and Oblius, which mean, being interpreted, the just man and the defence of the people, as the prophets declare concerning him. 
It came to pass that certain of the seven sects of the people inquired of him how Jesus was the door. And he said that this Jesus was the Saviour, whence some believed that Jesus was the Christ. Now the sects, whereunto the aforementioned persons belonged, believed neither in the resurrection, nor that Christ should come hereafter to render to every man according to his works. But all who believe, believed through James. So when many of the rulers also believed, there arose a disturbance of the Jews and scribes and Pharisees, saying, There is danger, lest all the people look to Jesus as the Christ. And when they were come together, they said unto James, We pray thee, stop these people, for they have been deceived with regard to Jesus, as if he indeed were the Christ. We pray thee, therefore, persuade all people concerning Jesus, when they are come together on the day of the Passover. And this we pray, because that all will be persuaded of thee, inasmuch as we and all the people bear witness to thee, that thou art a just man and no respecter of persons. Do thou then persuade the multitude not to be deceived concerning Jesus, for also we and all the people are readily persuaded of thee. This do, therefore, stand upon the pinnacle of the temple, that thou mayest be conspicuous from on high, and that thy words may be well heard by all the people. For by reason of the Passover all the tribes are assembled, together with the Gentiles also. So the aforementioned scribes and Pharisees set James upon the pinnacle of the temple, and cried unto him, and said, Thou just man, of whom we ought all to be persuaded, the people is deceived, and followeth after Jesus which was crucified. Do thou therefore declare unto us how Jesus is the door. And he answered with a loud voice, and said, Why ask ye me concerning Jesus the Son of Man? Behold, he sitteth on the right hand of great power, and he shall come hereafter upon the clouds of heaven. And when many were fully convinced, and believed on the testimony of James, and cried, Hosanna to the son of David, then came again those same scribes and Pharisees, and said among themselves, We have done ill, in that we have afforded such testimony to the name of Jesus. Come, let us go up and cast him down, that the people may be afraid, and not believe his words. So they cried aloud, saying, Oh, the just one also hath been deceived. And they fulfilled the word which is written in the book of Isaiah. Let us away with the just one, because he is displeasing unto us. Wherefore they shall eat the fruits of their deeds. Then they went up and cast down the just one, and said one to another, Let us stone James the just. And they began to cast stones at him, because that after he was cast down he died not, but turned and fell upon his knees, saying, O Lord God, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But while they were thus casting stones at him, one of the priests of the sons of Rechab, the son of Rechabiam, who hath the witness of Jeremy the prophet, cried out, saying, See, see, what are ye doing? Behold, this just man prayeth for you. And one of them, of the company of fullers, took the board with which he was wont to press the clothes, and struck therewith the head of the just one. And thus James bore witness to the truth, even to martyrdom. And they buried him in that place, and his monument doth still remain hard by the temple. This man became a true witness and martyr, both to Jews and Gentiles, that Jesus is the Christ. And straightway Vespasian besieged the city of the Jews, and carried them away captive. Footnote. Eusebius, it may be added, proceeds to declare that among all intelligent Jews an opinion prevailed that the murder of James was the cause of the siege of Jerusalem, which so soon followed. Josephus, says he, scrupled not to assert directly in his history, these things happened to the Jews in signal vengeance for the death of James the Just, brother to Jesus, who was said to be the Christ. For notwithstanding his extraordinary character for justice, he was barbarously murdered by the Jews. End of footnote. Hence we learn that even the holiest life will not shield good men from the envy and malice of those who hate their Lord and Saviour, so that we must depend upon God alone, 
not upon an arm of flesh. The world admires true Christians for a while and makes much of them, and then on a sudden turns round and persecutes them. But they will calmly go through evil report and good report for the name and cause of Christ, and be surprised neither when flattered nor evil and treated by sinners. They will make use of the good opinion the world has of them while it lasts, but will fear to shrink ever so little from a bold Christian profession in order to preserve it to them. End of section 57. Section 58 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Martyrdom of Polycarp, the Disciple of St. John, and the Bishop of Smyrna. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna and Martyr, was a disciple of St. John. He was placed over the church at Smyrna by the Apostle and presided in it at least seventy years. Some persons have supposed that he was the angel or bishop of Smyrna mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 to 11. Shortly after St. John's death, he was visited by Ignatius, bishop of Antioch, who had, as well as himself, attended the teaching of St. John, and was then on his way to martyrdom at Rome. It was from Smyrna that Ignatius wrote several of his epistles, especially that to the Romans, and when he had left the place and got as far as Troas, he wrote his epistles to Polycarp and the church at Smyrna. We owe it to Polycarp that these important epistles were preserved to after ages. Among the disciples of Polycarp was Irenaeus, who was Bishop of Lyon in France after Potinus, his predecessor, had been martyred in the great persecution there. He gives the following account of his master in one of his works. I remember, he says, what happened when I was a boy, more vividly than what takes place now. For what we learn in our youth grows up with us, and at last becomes part of our mind itself. Thus I can describe even the place where the sainted Polycarp used to sit and discourse, in his goings forth and comings in, in his manner of life, in his personal appearance, in his discourses to the people, and his account of what passed between him and St. John, and the other disciples who had seen the Lord, and his recollections of the sayings of those who were eyewitnesses of the word of life, of their account of his miracles and his teaching, which was all agreeable to what is related in the scriptures. To all this I used to listen with earnestness, through the mercy of God vouchsafed to me, recording them not on paper but in my heart, and through God's grace, I ever have them accurately in mind. Irenaeus says this when writing against a friend of his, who had been formerly taught by Polycarp, but had fallen away from the true faith into heresy. He adds, I protest in the sight of God, that if that blessed and apostolical elder had heard any such doctrine as thine, Florinus, he would have cried out and stopped his ears, and said after his manner, O oh my God, unto what times hast thou reserved me that I should hear such words, and would have even fled the place in which he heard them? So far, Irenaeus. Now let us hear the account of Polycarp's martyrdom, which took place under the emperors Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, A.D. 169. Epistle from the Church at Smyrna to the Church at Philomelium. The Church of God, which dwelleth in Smyrna, to the Church of God, which dwelleth in Philomelium, and all the members in every place of the Holy Catholic Church, mercy, peace, and love from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be multiplied. We have written to you, brethren, the history of those who have been martyred, and more particularly of the blessed Polycarp who closed the persecution, setting a seal, as it were, upon it by his own martyrdom. For almost all that happened before was done, that the Lord from on high might in him set forth to us this example of a true Christian confession. For he abode where he was, as also our Lord did, that he might be delivered up, in order that we too might be followers of him, and not look only to our own good, but to the good of our neighbours also. For it is the part of a sincere and steadfast charity for a man to desire not only his own salvation, but also of all the brethren. Noble, therefore, and blessed 
are all those testimonies which have been offered up according to God's will. For to God must we, with especial reverence, attribute the power over all things. For who but must admire their nobleness, their endurance, their faithfulness to their Lord? For when torn with scourges, till their whole frame, even to the veins and arteries within, was laid open, they bore it so patiently that the very bystanders pitied and bewailed them. Yet they had attained to such a noble spirit that not one of them uttered a cry or a groan himself, showing plainly to us that in that hour of torment Christ's witnesses were absent from the flesh, or rather that our Lord stood near and held converse with them, and they, intent on Christ's favour, despised this world's torments, that they might by one hour's anguish purchase redemption from eternal chastisement. The fire of their cruel tormentors felt cold to them, for they had before their eyes the fleeing from the eternal fire that shall never be quenched. And with the eyes of their heart, they looked to the good things reserved for them that endure, the things which ear hath not heard, nor eye seen, neither hath they entered into the heart of man, but which were already half shown by the Lord to them who were men no more, but already angels. In like manner, also, did those who were condemned to the wild beasts endure long time in their confinement fearful punishments. For they lay long stretched on sharp shells, and were buffeted with diverse other torments, that, if he were able, the tyrant might, by continued punishment, turn them into a denial of the faith. For many were the contrivances which the devil wrought against them, but, thanks be to God, he prevailed not over them. For the heroic Germanicus gave courage to their fearfulness by the patient endurance that was in him, who fought with the wild beasts notably. For when the proconsul endeavoured to persuade him and besought him to compassionate his years, he provoked the animal and drew it upon himself, wishing to be sooner freed from an unjust and lawless race. Upon this, the whole multitude was struck with wonder at the Christian's noble love and devotion to their God, and shouted, Away with the godless men! Look for Polycarp! But one Phrygian, Quintus by name, who had newly arrived from Phrygia when he saw the wild beasts, played the coward. Yet this was the man who had prevailed upon himself and others to offer themselves voluntarily for apprehension. Him, the proconsul, after much urging, persuaded to take the oath and offer sacrifice. Wherefore, brethren, we commend not those who give themselves up, since the gospel doth not so teach. Now the truly admirable Polycarp, when he first heard of these clamours, was no wise troubled, but wished to remain in the city. The greater part of us, however, persuaded him to withdraw, and he withdrew to a small villa not far distant from the city, and there remained with a few brethren, doing nothing else night and day but praying for all men, and for the churches throughout the world, as was his practice. And as he prayed, three days before his apprehension, he saw his pillow, in a vision, on fire. Turning, therefore, to those who were with him, he said prophetically, I must be burned alive. His pursuers, persevering in their endeavours, he removed to another villa. And immediately they came to the first place, and when they found him not, they took hold of two young slaves, one of whom, being put to the torture, confessed. And truly, it was impossible that he should remain concealed when they who betrayed him were his own servants. And the Ironarch, who was also called the distributor of lots, Herod by name, hastened to bring him to the theatre, that Polycarp might accomplish his lot, being made partaker of Christ. But they who betrayed him might undergo the penalties of Judas. Taking therefore the lad with them, on the day of preparation, about the hour of supper, the search officers and horsemen set forth with their ordinary weapons, as though they were pursuing a felon. And entering late in the evening, they found him lying down in a small chamber at the top of the house. From thence he might have got away to another place, but would not, saying, The Lord's will be done. But on hearing that they were come, he descended from his chamber and conversed with them. And they who were there, marvelling at his age and vigour, 
Some said, Was there such a mighty work about arresting an old man like this? And he gave orders immediately to set before them meat and drink, as much as they would, and besought them to give him an hour's free space to pray. And when they permitted him, standing up, he prayed, being full of the grace of God, so that for two whole hours he could not cease. And they that heard him were astonished, and many repented that they had come out against such a divine old man. After he had done praying, having made mention of all with whom he had ever met, great and small, noble and obscure, and of the whole Catholic Church throughout the world, when the hour of going forth arrived, they set him on an ass and led him into the city, it being the day of the great Sabbath. As he went, the Arunach Herod and his father Nikites, who were driving forth, happened to meet him and transferred him into their chariot, and sitting by him argued with him, saying, what harm is there in saying, Lord Caesar, and in sacrificing, and so saving your life, with the other usual sorts of arguments? At first he gave them no answer, but on their persevering he only said, I will not do what you counsel me. So they, when they found their endeavours to persuade him fruitless, railed at him, and pushed him down from the chariot so hastily that in his descent his shin was laid open. But he, no eyes moved, passed on readily and speedily, as though he had received no injury, being led by the attendants to the theatre. As he entered it, though the tumult there was so great that many heard not, a voice came to Polycarp from heaven. Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. Him that spake, not one of us saw, but the voice, those of ourselves who were present, heard. On his being led to the tribunal, there was immense clamour at the news that Polycarp had been apprehended. At last, when he was brought near, the proconsul asked him if he were Polycarp, and on his acknowledging it, he began to persuade him to deny the faith. Impassionate thine years, and other similar expressions, which it is their wont to use. Swear by the fortune of Caesar, think better of the matter, say... Away with the godless men. But Polycarp regarded with a sad countenance the whole multitude of lawless heathen in the theatre, and waving his hand towards them, groaned, and looking up to heaven said, Away with the godless men. And when the governor urged him further and said, Swear, and I will dismiss thee, revile Christ. Polycarp replied, Eighty and six years have I been his servant, and he hath wronged me in nothing. And how can I blaspheme my king and my saviour? And on his pressing him again, saying, Swear by the fortune of Caesar, Polycarp replied, If ye vainly suppose that I shall swear by Caesar's fortune, as ye call it, pretending to be ignorant of my real character, let me tell you plainly, I am a Christian. And if you wish to hear the Christian doctrine, appoint me a time and hear me. The proconsul answered, Persuade the people. Polycarp replied, To you I thought it right to give account, for we have been taught to give to rulers and the powers ordained of God such fitting honour as hurteth not our souls. But them I deem not worthy that I should defend myself before them. The proconsul said unto him, I've wild beasts in readiness. To them will I throw thee, if thou wilt not change thy mind. But he said, Bring them forth, then, for the change of mind from better to worse I will never make. From cruelty to righteousness it were good to change. Again he said unto him, I will have thee consumed by fire, since thou despisest the wild beasts, except thou change thy mind. Polycarp answered, Thou threatenest me with a fire that burneth for an hour and is speedily quenched. For thou knowest not of the fire of future judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why tarriest thou? Bring what thou wilt. As he spake these and other words, he was filled with confidence and joy, and his countenance was overspread with grace, so that not only was he not overthrown and confounded with what was said to him, but the proconsul, on the contrary, was wonderstruck, 
and sent the herald to proclaim three times in the middle of the stadium that Polycarp had confessed himself to be a Christian. When this had been announced by the herald, the whole multitude, both of Gentiles and of Jews who were settled in Smyrna, shouted with uncontrollable rage and in a loud voice, This man is the teacher of all Asia, the father of the Christians, who pulleth down our gods, who teacheth many neither to pay incense nor homage to them. With these words, he called upon Philip the Asiarch to let out a lion upon Polycarp, but he answered that he could not do that, as the show of wild beasts was concluded. Then it occurred to them with one accord to demand that he should burn Polycarp alive, for it was necessary that the vision which had been shown to him upon his pillow should be fulfilled. When he saw it on fire as he prayed, and turned to the believers who were with him, and prophetically declared, I must needs be burned alive. This, therefore, was no sooner said than done, for the multitude collected immediately wood and faggots from the shops and the baths, the Jews especially, as is their wont, being very zealous in assisting to this end. But when the pile was ready, without any aid he laid aside his garments, and after unloosing his girdle, endeavoured to unbind his sandals too. A thing he had never done, because that each of the faithful was ever pressing to be the first to touch his person, for he had ever been highly honoured on account of his virtuous conversation, even before his head had grown hoary. Straightway they arranged about his person all that was requisite for the pile. But when they were about also to nail him to the stake, he said, Leave me as I am, for he who giveth me to endure the fire will also give me power, without the security of your nails, to remain untroubled upon the pile. They forbore, therefore, to nail him, but only bound him with cords. He therefore placed his hands behind him, and being bound to the stake, even as the chief ram taken from a large flock to be a burnt offering acceptable to God, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, O Lord God Almighty, Father of thy well-beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have attained to the knowledge of thee, thou God of angels and of powers and of every creature, and of the whole generation of the just who live before thee, I bless thee that thou hast accounted me worthy of this day and hour, that I might receive my portion in the number of thy witnesses, and drink of the cup of thine anointed, unto the resurrection of both body and soul, unto eternal life, through the incorruption of the Holy Spirit, amongst which blessed martyrs may I be accepted before thee this day for a rich and acceptable sacrifice, even as thou hast foreordained, foreshown, and now accomplished the true and unfailing God. For this, and for all thy doings, I praise thee, I bless thee, I glorify thee, through the eternal High Priest, Jesus Christ, thy well-beloved Son, through whom be glory to thee with him in the Holy Spirit, both now and for evermore. Amen. And when he had pronounced in a loud voice his Amen, having finished his prayer, they whose office it was kindled the fire, and a great flame flashed forth. And we, to whom the sight was vouchsafed, beheld truly a mighty marvel, who have been to this end preserved, that we might declare to the rest the things which were done. For the fire, taking the shape of a dome, like the sail of a ship when filled with wind, compassed all round the body of the martyr. And he appeared in the middle, not like burning flesh, but like gold and silver tried in the furnace. Yea, we perceived too such a sweet odour as from the breath of frankincense, or some other precious perfume. In the end, therefore, when the ungodly saw that his body could not be consumed of the fire, they commanded an executioner to go near to him and thrust his sword into him, which, when he had done, there issued forth such a stream of blood that it quenched the fire, and all the multitude marvelled that there was such a difference between the unbelievers and the elect. Of them this man won, and the most remarkable in all our time, being bishop of the Catholic Church that is in Smyrna, and an apostolic and prophetic teacher. For never word came from his mouth, but it has been, or shall be, fulfilled. But the envious and wicked adversary of the generation of the righteous, when he saw the mightiness of his testimony, and his blameless conversation from the first, 
and how that he was now crowned with the crown of immortality, and had borne away a prize that could not be spoken against, contrived that his poor body might not be obtained by us, though many much desired to secure it, and to communicate over his holy remains. For some suggested to Nicetes, the father of Herod, and brother of Elche, that he should persuade the governor not to give up his body. Lest, said he, they leave the crucified and take to worshipping this fellow. And these things they said, as instigated and supported by the Jews, who even watched us when some of us were about to take his body from the fire. For the little knew how impossible it was for us either to forsake the worship of Christ, who suffered for the salvation of the whole world of them that be saved, or to pay worship to any other. For to him truly we pay adoration, for as much as he was the Son of God. But the martyrs, as the disciples and followers of the Lord, we revere as they deserve, for their incomparable loyalty to their King and Master, praying that we may be made their partners and their fellow disciples. Then the centurion, seeing the earnestness of the Jews, laid out the body and burnt it, as was their custom. And so we afterwards gathered up his bones, more valued than stones of much price and purer than fine gold, and laid them up in a fitting treasure house. There, assembling, as we may, in joy and in triumph, the Lord shall grant unto us to celebrate the birthday of his martyrdom, both to the remembering of them who wrestled before in the cause, and the training and preparation of those that shall come after. Such is the story of the blessed Polycarp, who being, with them of Philadelphia, the twelfth who has given his testimony in Smyrna, is made alone the especial subject of all men, so that even by the Gentiles is he spoken of in every place, having been not only a notable teacher, but also a chief witness, whose confession, rendered as it was according to the gospel of Christ, all men desire to imitate. For by his patient endurance he triumphed over the unjust ruler, and thus having won the garland of immortality and rejoicing with the apostles and all saints, he glorifieth God and the Father, and blesseth our Lord, who is both the governor of our bodies and the shepherd of the Catholic Church throughout the world. You requested, therefore, that these circumstances should be detailed to you at length, and we have now briefly signified them through our brother Marcus. Therefore, after ye have understood these things, send our letter about to our brethren also in the regions beyond you, that they too may glorify the Lord, who maketh choice out of his own servants, who is able by his grace and free gift to bring all of you into his eternal kingdom through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory, honour, dominion and greatness for ever. Amen. Salute ye all the saints. They that are with us salute you. Neverestus, who hath written this, with all his house. The blessed Polycarp gave his testimony on the second of the month Xanthicus, on the 26th of March, on the great Sabbath, at the eighth hour. He was apprehended by Herod in the high priesthood of Philip of Trales, in the proconsulship of Stratius Quadratus, in the everlasting reign of Jesus Christ, to whom be glory, honour, greatness, and a throne eternal, from generation to generation. Amen. We pray you, brethren, to be strong, walking by the gospel of Jesus Christ, with whom be glory to God, both Father and Holy Spirit, for the salvation of the elect saints, even as the blessed Polycarp suffered, in whose steps may we be found in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. This letter Gaius took from Irenaeus, the disciple of Polycarp, being himself also a friend of Irenaeus. And I, Socrates of Corinth, have transcribed it from the copy of Gaius. Grace be with all men. And I again, Peonius, have copied from the above written, Polycarp himself in a vision having showed me where the manuscripts were, as I shall declare in the sequel, after I had long sought for them. And so I gathered them, when now by length of time almost worn out, so that the Lord Jesus Christ may gather me also with his elect, to whom be glory with Father and Holy Ghost, for ever and ever. Amen. Thus ends this ancient history. It appears that one Peonius suffered martyrdom at the same place, Smyrna, in the Decian persecution, which happened eighty years after this in which Polycarp suffered. 
The name and death of this martyr are mentioned by Eusebius in connection with that of Polycarp, and it seems probable that the full account of his sufferings was appended to the manuscript which has been here translated. We may therefore infer that this was the man who had so diligently and faithfully transcribed the history of his fellow countrymen, and that having carefully conned his sacred lesson, and thus given courage to his fearfulness and strength to his weakness, he at length, by God's grace, was enabled to withstand the like tortures, not accepting the deliverance that he might obtain a better resurrection. End of section 58《セクション59 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. Justin Martyr Justin, surnamed the Martyr, was born at Sichem in Samaria, where was Jacob's well. His parents were heathens, and he grew up to man's estate, ignorant of the true God, yet dissatisfied with what the wise men of this world taught on the subject of religion. He was of an inquiring turn, and successively attached himself to various sects of philosophers, beginning with the Stoics, who are mentioned in Acts chapter 17, verse 18. At length he fancied he was making progress in the discovery of the unseen world, when one day he wandered out to the seaside to enjoy his meditations undisturbed. To his surprise, he found himself joined by an old man of grave but mild countenance. Justin stopped and steadily gazed on him. The other asked him if he knew him, that he eyed him so earnestly. On Justin's expressing surprise at meeting anyone in so solitary a place, the old man accounted for the accident, and then fell into conversation with him, which ended in his preaching to him Jesus Christ and Justin's receiving impressions which led to his conversion to the true faith. This took place A.D. 132, about thirty years after St. John's death. About eighteen years after, he fixed his abode at Rome, where he employed himself in various writings in defence of the gospel. At length, he was called upon to die for it, under circumstances which are detailed in the following ancient account. Narrative of the Martyrdom of Justin the Philosopher, A.D. 167 while the persecution raged against the Christians for their refusing to sacrifice to the idols, the holy men, Justin and his companions, were arrested and brought before Rusticus, the prefect of Rome, who bade Justin believe in the gods and obey the emperor. He answered, It is safe and unexceptionable to obey the commands of our Saviour Jesus Christ. The prefect asked, What department of learning do you pursue? Justin answered, I have essayed all, but I have attached myself to that true philosophy which the Christians profess, however displeasing it may be to mistaken reasoners. Miserable man, said Rusticus, is that your learning? The other replied, yes, verily, I profess it in all truth of doctrine. What doctrine? A reverent acknowledgment of the God of the Christians, whom we account to be the one original maker and framer of the whole world, visible and invisible and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was foretold by the prophets as the herald of salvation, and the instructor of dutiful disciples. For myself, mortal as I am, I cannot hope to speak adequately of his infinite majesty, which is a gift peculiar to the prophets, for they foretold his coming, whom I have declared to be the Son of God. The prefect said, Where is your place of meeting? Justin answered, Where each chooses, and is able to come. Do you think that we all meet at the same place? Not so, for the Christian's God is not bound by space, but though invisible, fills both heaven and earth, and everywhere receives the homage and praise of the faithful. The prefect, Rusticus, replied, Tell me where you meet together, in what place thou assemblest thy disciples. Justin answered, That he lodged near one Martinus, at the baths called Timiotim, that this was the second time he had sojourned in Rome, that throughout the whole period he had known no other place of meeting, that he had communicated the words of truth to anyone who chose to visit him. Rusticus said, Art thou not, in short, a Christian? Justin answered, Yea, I am a Christian. 
Then the prefect said to Charito, Say thou too, Charito, art thou a Christian? Charito answered, By God's command, I am a Christian. Then he said to Charitino, And what says thou, Charitino? She answered, By God's gift, I am a Christian. He next addressed Evelpistus, and said, And what art thou? He, being a slave of Caesar's, made answer, I too am a Christian, being made free by Christ, and am partaker by Christ's favour of the same hope. The prefect said to Hyrax, And art thou a Christian? Hyrax said, Yea, I am a Christian, for I reverence and adore the same God. Rusticus said, Hath Justin made you Christians? Hyrax answered, I was a Christian, and I will continue one. Then Pian stood up and said too, I too am a Christian. The prefect said, Who was he that taught thee? Pian answered, From my parents I received this good confession. Elpistus said, I too, though I have listened gladly to the preaching of Justin, was taught by my parents to be a Christian. Rusticus said, And where are thy parents? Elpistus answered, In Cappadocia. The prefect asked Hyrax where his parents were. Hyrax made answer in these words. Christ is our true father, and faith in him our true mother. My earthly parents are dead, and I myself have been brought hither from Iconium and Phrygia. The prefect Rusticus addressed Liberianus. And what dost thou say? Art thou a Christian? Art thou too an unbeliever? Liberianus said, I too am a Christian. For I am a believer and a worshipper of the only true God. The prefect said to Justin, Listen thou, who art accounted an orator, and supposest thyself skilled in true doctrine. If I should have thee scourged and beheaded, what is thy belief? That thou wouldst descend into heaven? Justin said, I do trust that if I endure these things, I shall receive rewards from him. For I know that for them who have so lived, there remaineth the divine gift, till the times of the consummation of all things. The prefect Rusticus said again, Dost thou imagine that thou shalt go up into heaven and there receive a recompense? Justin answered, I imagine it not, for I know, and am entirely persuaded that I shall. Rusticus said, It remains then that we come to the matter in hand which presseth us. Come, therefore, all of you together, and with one mind do sacrifice to the gods. Justin answered, no man of right judgment falleth from religion to irreligion. Rusticus answered, If ye will not obey me, you shall be tortured without mercy. Justin replied, We ask in prayer that we may be tortured for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. For this shall be our salvation and our confidence, that at a more terrible tribunal whereat all the world must appear of our King and Saviour. In like manner said the other martyrs also, Do what thou wilt. For we are Christians, and do no sacrifice to idols. And the prefect Rusticus gave sentence, saying, Let such as refuse to do sacrifice to the gods, and to obey the decree of the emperor, be scourged, and then led away to capital punishment and pursuance of the laws. So the holy martyrs, giving glory to God, were led forth to the accustomed place, and were beheaded, giving full completion to their testimony by the confession of the Saviour. And certain of the faithful, when they had secretly taken up their bodies, deposited them in a meet place, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ working with them, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Justin's account of baptism, the Lord's Supper, and the public worship of God. We will state in what manner we are created in you by Christ, and have dedicated ourselves to God. As many as are persuaded, and believe that these things which we teach and declare are true, and promise that they are determined to live accordingly, are taught to pray, and to beseech God with fasting, to grant them remission of their past sins, while we also pray and fast with them. We then lead them to a place where there is water, and there they are regenerated in the same manner as we also were. For they are then washed in that water in the name of God the Father and Lord of the universe, and of our Saviour Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. For Christ said, Except ye be born again, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
and that it is impossible for those who are once born should again enter into their mother's womb is evident to all. Moreover, it is declared by the prophet Isaiah, in what manner they who have sinned and repent may escape the punishment of their sins. For it is said, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil from your souls, learn to do well, do justice to the fatherless, and avenge the widow. And come, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Even if your sins should be as scarlet, I will make them white as wool, and if they should be as crimson, I will make them white as snow. But if ye will not hearken unto me, the sword shall devour you, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken these things. The apostles have also taught us for what reason this new birth is necessary, since at our first birth we were born without our knowledge or consent, by the ordinary natural means, and were brought up in evil habits and evil instructions, in order that we may not longer remain the children of necessity or of ignorance, but may become the children of choice and judgment, and may obtain in the water remission of the sins which we have before committed. The name of God the Father and Lord of the universe is pronounced over him who is willing to be born again, and hath repented of his sins. He who leads him to be washed in the labour of baptism, saying this only over him. For no one can give a name to the ineffable God, and if any man should dare to assert that there is such a name, he is afflicted with utter madness. And this washing is called illumination, since the minds of those who are thus instructed are illuminated. And he who is so illuminated is baptised also in the name of Jesus Christ, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, by whom the prophets foretold all things concerning Jesus. We then, after having so washed him who hath expressed his conviction and professes the faith, lead him to the brethren, where they are gathered together, to make common prayers with great earnestness, both for themselves and for him who is now illuminated, and for all others in all places, that having learned the truth, we may be deemed worthy to be found men of godly conversation in our lives, and to keep the commandments, that so we may attain to eternal salvation. When we have finished our prayers, we salute one another with a kiss, after which there is brought to the brother who presides bread and a cup of wine mixed with water, and he, having received them, gives praise and glory to the Father of all things, through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and gives thanks in many words for that God hath vouchsafed to them these things. And when he hath finished his praises and thanksgiving, all the people who are present express their assent, saying, Amen, which means in the Hebrew language, so be it. He who presides having given thanks, and the people having expressed their assent, those whom we call deacons give to each of those who are present a portion of the bread which hath been blessed, and of the wine mixed with water, and carry some away for those who are absent. And this food is called by us the Eucharist, thanksgiving, of which no one may partake unless he believes that what we teach is true, and is washed in the laver, which is appointed for the forgiveness of sins and unto regeneration, and lives in such manner as Christ commanded. For we receive not these elements as common bread or common drink, but even as Jesus Christ our Saviour, being made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation, even so we are taught that the food which is blessed by prayer according to the word which came from him, by the conversion of which into our bodily substance our blood and flesh are nourished, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. For the apostles, in the memoirs composed by them, which are called Gospels, have related that Jesus thus commanded them, that, having taken bread and given thanks, he said, Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. And that, in like manner, having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, this is my blood, and that he distributed them to these alone. After these solemnities are finished, we afterwards continually remind one another of them, and such of us as have possessions assist all those who are in want, and we all associate with one another. And over all our offerings we bless the Creator of all things, through his Son Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Spirit. And on the day which is called Sunday, there is an assembly in one place of all who dwell either in towns or in country, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as the time permits. Then, when the reader hath ceased, the head of the congregation delivers a discourse, in which he reminds and exhorts them to the imitation of all these good things. 
we then all stand up together and put forth prayers. Then, as we have already said, when we cease from prayer, bread is brought and wine and water, and our head, in like manner, offers up prayers and praises with his utmost power, and the people express their assent by saying, Amen. The consecrated elements are then distributed and received by everyone, and the portion is sent by the deacons to those who are absent. Each of those also who have abundance and are willing according to his choice gives what he thinks fit, and what is collected is deposited with him who presides, who succours the fatherless and the widows, and those who are in necessity from disease or any other cause, those also who are in bonds, and the strangers who are sojourning among us, and in a word, takes care of all who are in need. We all of us assemble together on Sunday, because it is the first day in which God changed darkness and matter, and made the world. On the same day also, Jesus Christ our Saviour rose from the dead. End of section 59. Section 60 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by B. Swax Scandal. Irenaeus. Irenaeus was Bishop of Lyon in France. He is supposed to have been a native of Asia. He was born, at latest, about forty years after St. John's death, and died A.D. 202. The following is his account of the faith of Christians, and of the Church as the pillar and ground, the appointed witness of that faith. The Church, although extended through the whole world, even unto the ends of the earth, has received from the Apostles and their disciples the belief in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, and in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who was made flesh for our salvation, and in the Holy Ghost, who by the prophets proclaimed the merciful dispensation and the coming, and the birth from a virgin, and the passion, and the resurrection, and the ascension into heaven in our flesh of the beloved Christ Jesus our Lord, and his appearing from heaven in the glory of the Father, to gather together all things in one, and to raise from the dead all flesh of humankind, that to Christ Jesus our Lord and God and Saviour and King, according to the good pleasure of the invisible Father, every knee may bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue may confess him, and that he may recompense just judgment upon all, sending into everlasting fire wicked spirits and angels that transgressed and became apostates, and irreligious, unjust, lawless, and profane men. But upon the just and holy, who have kept his commandments, and persevere in his love, whether serving him from the first, or turning by repentance, may bestow immortality by the free gift of life, and secure for them everlasting glory. This is the message, and this the faith, which the Church has received, as was said above, and which, though dispersed throughout the whole world, she sedulously guards, as though she dwelt but in one place, believes as uniformly as though she had but one soul, and the same heart, and preaches, teaches, hands down to posterity, as harmoniously as though she had but one mouth. True it is, the world's languages are various, but the power of the tradition is the one and the same. There is no difference of faith or tradition, whether in the churches of Germany, or in Spain, or in Gaul, or in the East, or in Egypt, or in Africa, or in the more central parts of the world. But as the sun, God's creature is one and the same in all the world, so also the preaching of the truth shineth everywhere, and lighteth every one who will come to the knowledge of the truth. Among the rulers of the church, neither he who is powerful in words speaks other doctrine, for no one can be above his master, nor does the weak in the word diminish the tradition. For whereas the faith is one and the same, neither he who has much to say concerning it hath anything over, nor he that speaketh little any lack. What a lesson does this passage furnish to the inquiring Christian of this day? Irenaeus was the disciple of Polycarp, the friend of St. John. Here, then, is a witness, only one removed from the apostles for the Catholic faith, such as we hold it, such as we declare it in church unto this day. Wanderers and disputers, perplexed inquirers and weak brethren, 
come home to this true doctrine of Christ, clearly conveyed to us from Christ himself and his apostles. And observe, this holy bishop tells us that it was received as such, preached as such, delivered as such, all over the world. There is no room for disputing. It is one and the same truth, as Christ is one, and as the Holy Spirit and the Church is one. Yes, and as the Church itself is one. The one faith is held in the one Church. Wanderers come home to it, come home to the Church Catholic, of which Irenaeus spoke, which is still upon earth of which the English church with its bishops, priests and deacons is a true and living branch. And at all events, even if you are not persuaded to the suitable religious deed, yet at least you cannot refuse to take up a humbler judgment of the Christianity of this day than is generally taken. For is not unity the chief blessing which Christ prayed his church might possess? Was it not, as the above extract shows, marvellously instanced, in the state of the primitive church? Is it not lost now? Surely this is undeniable. Whatever our knowledge, our exertions, our various gifts, Christians have lost their peculiar privilege, have transgressed their peculiar duty, that they should all be one, as Christ and the Father are one. Anecdote of the great St. Basil, Archbishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia. The holy Basil visited one day a sacred brotherhood, and, after such discourse as was fitting, said to the head of it, Hast thou a brother here who has the grace of obedience? And he answered him, My lord, we be all thy servants and are endeavouring after salvation. Basil said a second time, Yea, hast thou one so gifted? And he brought unto him a brother the holy Basil employed him to minister to him as he dined. After he had eaten, the other brought him water to wash. But Basil said, Come hither, and I too will give thee water to wash. And the other suffered the bishop to pour out the water upon his hands. Then said Basil, When I enter into the chancel, come before me, and I will make thee a deacon. And afterwards he made him priest, and took him with him to his own house, in account of his obedience. End of section 60 Section 61 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Temporal Condition and the Principles of Christians From the Epistle to Diognetus the writer of the Epistle to Diognetus was either Justin Martyr or some disciple of the Apostles themselves, a contemporary of Justin Martyr, i.e. about A.D. 130. Christians differ not from other men in country or language or customs. They do not live in any peculiar cities or employ any particular dialect or cultivate characteristic habits of life. The truths which they hold result not from the busy ingenuities of human thought, the counsels of man in them possess no champion. They dwell in cities, Greek and barbarian, each where he finds himself placed. And while they submit to the fashion of their country in dress and food and the general conduct of life, they yet maintain a system of interior polity, which beyond all controversy is full of admiration and wonder. The countries they inhabit are their own, but they dwell like aliens. They take their part in all privileges as being citizens and in all sufferings they partake as if they were strangers. In every foreign country they recognise a home, and in their home they see the place of their pilgrimage. They marry like other men, and exclude not their children from their affections. Their table is open to all around them. They live in the world, but not according to its fashions. They walk on earth, but their conversation is in heaven. They obey the established laws, but in their lives transcend all law. They love all men, and are persecuted by all. They are unknown, and yet are condemned. Death to them is life. Of their poverty they make many rich, and in the extremity of want they still possess all things. They are treated with dishonour, and by dishonour are made glorious. 
Their integrity is ensured by the insults which they suffer. When cursed, they bless, and reproaches they pay with respect. When doing good, they are punished as evildoers, and when they are punished, they rejoice as men that are raised unto life. By Jews, they are treated as aliens and foes. By Greeks, they are persecuted, and none of their enemies can state a ground for their enmity. In good truth, Christians are to the world what the soul is to the body. The soul is transfused through the members of the body, and Christians through the cities of the world. The soul dwells in the body, but it is not of the body. And Christians dwell in the world, but are not of the world. The soul unseen is treasured up in the visible body, and Christians visibly are in the world, but their faith is a guest unseen in it. The flesh hates the soul and wars against it without provocation, because it forbids the enjoyment of its pleasures. And the world hates Christians without provocation, because they are at enmity with its enjoyments. The soul loves that flesh and those limbs that hate it, and Christians love all that hate them. The soul is shut up in the body, but itself is to the body a protector. And Christians are included in the world as in a prison house, and yet they are the guardians of the world. The immortal soul rests in a mortal tabernacle, and Christians dwell amidst corruption, but are waiting for incorruption in heaven. By loss of meat and drink, the soul is strengthened, and Christians abound more and more through suffering every day. Such is the station in which God has planted them, and it is not lawful for them to retire from it. I have already said that their faith was not a discovery of this world. It is not a human counsel which they support with this anxiety, nor are they entrusted with the stewardship of mysteries which proceed from man. But God himself, the almighty and invisible creator, has sent down from heaven to men his holy and incomprehensible truth and word, and fixed it in their hearts, not as might perhaps be anticipated, sending any minister to man, angel or principality, whether of those whose functions belong to the earth, or of such as are engaged in the economy of heaven, but him who was the very maker and builder of all, by whom he built the heavens and marked the bounds of the ocean, whose mysterious ordinances the elements all faithfully obey, from whom the sun receives the measure of its daily career, and at whose will the obedient moon puts forth her mighty luster, with the stars that move attendant on her course. He is the universal counsellor and lawgiver and monarch. His are the heavens and all that is in heaven. His the earth and all in the earth. The sea and all that is in the sea. Fire, air and depth. The height above and the deep beneath. All are his. Him God sent to man. But was it, as man might anticipate, to overrule, to terrify and to strike? Not so but in meekness and in mercy. He sent him as a king might send his royal son, as God he sent him, as a messenger and a saviour to mankind to persuade, but not to compel. Violence is not an attribute of God. He sent him in love, not in judgment. In judgment he will hereafter send him, and who will bear his coming? See you not how Christians are cast to the beasts, that they may be made to deny their Lord, and are not overcome? See you not how they are bound, in proportion with the increase of their sufferings? These things seem not like the work of man, but they are the power of God, and indications of his presence. What mortal man could tell what God was before he came among us? Would you admit the vain and trifling fables of such empty philosophers as say that the deity is composed of fire, calling that a deity to which themselves attending, or of water, or of any other of those elements which God has created? And yet, if any of these fables is admissible, each and every of the creatures might similarly be called a god. These things are the trickery and deceit of impostors, Man had never seen or known him, but he manifested himself. He manifested himself by faith, by which alone it is possible to see God. 
For that God, who was the master and architect of all, who made all things and disposed them in their place, was found not only benevolent, but also patient. Such, indeed, he has always been, and is, and will be, kind and good and mild and true. And only he is good, and having conceived that great and unspeakable counsel which he communicated to his son alone, so long as he retained the project of his wisdom, and reserved it in concealment, he seemed to be without care or consideration for us. But when, through his beloved son, he revealed and made manifest the things which, from the beginning, were prepared, he at once presented to us all the scheme, so that we partake and behold his benefits. Who among us could conceive these things? But he, in himself and with his son, foreknew the course of his providence. For the time past, therefore, he suffered us to be borne along, as we would by irregular impulses, led astray by pleasures and desires. Not that he feels complacence in our sins, but he permits them, from no gratification in the times of unrighteousness, but because he is working out the purposes of his justice. That, during the time past, convicted by our own works of unworthiness to enter into life, we might now be rendered worthy through the goodness of God. And being proved of ourselves unable to enter into the kingdom of God, we might, by the power of God, be made able. But when our unrighteousness was assured, and it was clearly manifested that the wages of sin is punishment, and death was before our eyes, then came the time which God foreordained for the manifestation of his goodness and power, for as much as, in the abundance of his beneficence, love was alone displayed. He hated not, nor rejected us, nor remembered our guilt, but showed himself long-suffering and forbearing, and, in his own words, bare our sins. He gave his own Son as a ransom for us, the just for the unjust, the guileless for the guilty, the righteous for the wicked, the incorruptible for the corrupt, the immortal for the dying. For what other thing except his righteousness could cover our guilt? In whom was it possible for us lawless sinners to find justification, save in the Son of God alone? O oh, sweet exchange! O oh, counsel untraceable and mercies out of thought! that the guilt of many might be covered by one that was righteous, and the righteousness of one may justify many who were guilty. Having then, in the times past, ensured the capacity of our nature for the attainment of life, and sending a Saviour afterwards, who is able to save those who of themselves are incapable of salvation, he is pleased, from both these truths, to make us rely on his goodness, and regard him as our guardian, our father, our teacher, our counsellor, our physician, our mind, our light, our honour and glory and strength and life. And so take no thought for raiment or for food. If then you are anxious to know and accept this faith, first learn that God has love for mankind, and for their sake made the world, and gave them dominion over all things in it. He gave them reason and perception. Them only he permits to look upward towards himself, and made them in his own image, and sent to them his only begotten Son, announcing a kingdom in heaven, which he will give if they love him. When you learn this, with what joy, think you, will you be filled? Or how will you love one who first loved you so well? And if you love him, you will imitate his kindness. Nor wonder that man can be an imitator of God, by God's gift he can, for happiness does not rest in the possession of authority over others, or in aiming at advantages which others possess not, or in wealth or superior power. In these things it is not possible for man to imitate God, but he who bears a brother's burden, and shares of his abundance to them that want, does the work of God towards those who at his hands receive what God has given him, and that man is an imitator of God. Thus shall you discover, while you dwell on earth, that God works his purposes in heaven. You will begin to tell of the hidden things of God, and will love and admire those who are punished for refusing to deny him. You will discern the deceitfulness and crafts of the world, for you will learn truly to live in heaven, and despise that seeming death here, 
when you are afraid of the very death which is kept for those who are condemned to eternal fire, the endless punishment of all who were cast to it. And you will esteem such as endure this world's fire for righteousness' sake, and reckon them happy when you know of the other fire. I deal not in vain or foolish questions, but whereas I was a disciple of the apostles, I teach the Gentiles. I administer those doctrines which have been granted to all worthy disciples of the truth. For what man has been taught aright and nurtured in the kindly word does not feel an increasing desire clearly to know those things which by the word were directly spoken to the disciples, and which he manifested fully to them, not being understood by unbelievers, but explaining them to his disciples, for they were reckoned worthy by him to learn the mysteries of the Father. And for this cause the word was sent forth, that he might be manifested to the world, and when his nation rejected him, he was believed in by the Gentiles through the preaching of the apostles. This is he that was from the beginning, and appeared in the latter days, and his advent is continually renewed in the hearts of his saints. This is he that is from everlasting, the Son this day declared, and of his riches the church receives, for his expansive grace is shed abundantly among the saints, conferring wisdom, declaring mysteries, enouncing the times, rejoicing with the faithful, and giving to all that ask, and these break not the rule of faith, nor transgress the rule of the fathers. And thus the fear of the law is proclaimed, and the inspiration of the prophets acknowledged, and faith in the gospels confined, and the apostles' tradition secured. And the church rejoices in her grace. Wherefore, if you grieve not that grace, you shall be taught the truths which the word communicates by those whom he chooses in his own good time. For those things which we have been moved to declare by the will of the word commanding us, we will, with all diligence, communicate to you, because we love the lessons which have been revealed to us. Ye then who are admitted to these truths, and accept them with a ready heart, shall learn what God has prepared for them that truly love him, how that they grow into a paradise of pleasure, and lift within themselves a rich, luxuriant tree, adorned with many fruits. It is in such ground that the tree of knowledge and the tree of life are planted, and knowledge is not that which brings death, but disobedience in the way of gaining it. For we are taught in plain words that God in the beginning planted the tree of life in the midst of paradise, showing that it knowledge is the way to life, and they who did not use it aright at first were robbed by the deceits of the serpent, for life cannot be separate from knowledge, nor can any knowledge be perfect unless the true life be with it. For this cause they were planted side by side, and the apostle, perceiving this intent, and condemning all knowledge that is pursued otherwise than with a view to discovering the conditions of eternal life, says, Knowledge puffeth up, but love edifieth. For he who thinks that he knows anything, apart from the true knowledge which is attested by having the life within it, is without knowledge, deceived by the serpent, and a hater of life. But he who learns with fear and studies to attain unto life, plants in hope, and may look for the fruit. Let your heart be a heart of knowledge, and in life perceive that understanding is granted, true and simple. Its tree shall rise within you, and of its fruit you shall be filled with those enjoyments which are in the hand of God, which the serpent never touches, nor does any deceit come nigh. No Eve betrays them, but she to whom they are committed is the virgin church. Hereby is salvation manifested, and hence the apostles find wisdom. While the Easter feast of our Lord is solemnized, and congregations are gathered together in decency and order, and the word, by whom the Father is glorified, teaches his saints with joy, to whom be glory everlasting. Amen. End of section 61. Section 62 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Address of St. Clement of Alexandria to the Heathen. The Holy Spirit says, Despise not thou, my son, the training of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Surpassing condescension. How gently does he deal with us. 
not as a teacher with his disciples, nor as a master with his servants, nor as a god towards his creatures, but as a father instructs his sons. Moses confessed that he exceedingly feared and quaked when he heard concerning the word of God. But thou, who hearest that word himself, hast thou no dread, no distress of mind? No reverence and earnestness withal to learn the truth? Earnestness for salvation, fear of his wrath, delight in his promises, anxiety for acceptance, to rescue thee from condemnation? Come ye, O come, my band of young ones. Young ones, I say, for unless ye be born again as children, regenerated, as Scripture says, ye will not receive him who is your own father, nor will ever at any time gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. To a stranger this is impossible. But when he who has been enrolled by name and made a citizen, and submits to a new father, then shall he be in the number of that father's sons. Then nurslings of our God, true friends by kindred of the first begotten, as being the first of all men, to have discerned almighty God, saved ourselves from sin, and abjured the devil. This is his sole work, to save man. Therefore he cries aloud, as urging us himself, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He converts men by means of fear. His apostle, in like manner exhorting the Philippians, takes up his holy tidings and repeats them. The Lord is at hand, he says. See well that we be not found wanting. But alas, ye are all so fearless, nay, unbelieving, that ye listen neither to the Lord nor to holy Paul, though he prays you in Christ's stead to taste and see that Christ is God. It is faith that must bring you in. Experience must teach you, and the scripture must lead you on in knowledge according to its word. Come, ye children, hearken to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Then it briefly addresses those who have already believed. What man is there who lusteth to live, who would fain see good days? We make answer. It is we, who worship him who is our happiness, and who copy those that are like him. Hear then, both ye who are afar off, and ye who are nigh. The word is hid from no one. It is a light in common. It lighteth every man. In it there is no darkness. Let us hasten to our salvation, even to our regeneration, so that, many though we be, we may be brought close together by one love, according to that oneness which the one God imparts. Let us hasten, as having received a benefit, as seeking out our sole happiness. Let us follow after unity, till from many voices, loud and scattered to and fro, one divine harmony arises, led by one guide and teacher, the divine word, finding rest and fullness in the truth itself, and saying, Abba, Father. Ye who thirst, come to the water, says the Lord. Or ye that have no silver, come and buy, yea, drink without silver. Thus does he exhort men to the holy bath, to their salvation, to their illumination, almost crying out to them, Child, I give thee earth and sea and heaven, yea, all that is therein, I freely grant to thee. Only, O oh my child, thirst for thy father's presence. God will reveal himself to thee without price. Truth is not dealt out as by a trader. He gives thee all things that fly and swim and walk the earth. All these things is thy father framed for thy enjoyment. So take and be thankful. Those who are but spurious born are forced to buy their possessions with silver, sons of perdition, willing slaves of mammon. But into thine hands he gives thine own. Thus speaks he to his true seed, to him who loves his father, for whose sake he worketh still, to whom alone he pledges, that the earth shall be given as a lasting foundation, which is not promised to corruption. For mine is all the earth. It is thine, if thou receive thy God. And therefore scripture proclaims as good tidings to those who have believed, the saints of the Lord shall inherit the glory of God and his power. Hope in him, it is written, all the assembly of the people, pour out your heart before him. He speaks to those who have newly turned from wickedness. 
he pities and fills them with righteousness. Trust, O mortal, in him who is both God and man, who suffered and is worshipped, even a living God. Ye servants, put your trust in him who is dead. Yea, all men, trust in him who out of all men alone is God. Believe and receive salvation as your reward. Seek out God and your soul shall live. The most sublime philosophers could but guess and speak darkly about wisdom, but the disciples of Christ have seen and proclaimed it. Nay, and Christ in all portions of him, so to say, is one and the same, undivided, so that there is neither barbarian, Jew nor Greek, male nor female, but one man refashioned by the Holy Ghost. I do but ask you to accept salvation. What does Christ desire? but freely to give you life. But who is he? The word of truth, the builder of the inward temple that God may dwell with men. Sanctify that temple. Pleasures and comforts leave them as flowers of the day, to the wind and to the fire. The word of God shall guide thee, and the Holy Spirit settle thee in the peaceful dwelling of the heavens. There thou shalt enjoy the presence of the Christian's God, and be initiated in his holy mysteries. Come, O heathen reveller, lean not on thy thrysus, bind not on thine ivy, cast away thy turban and thy fawn skin, put off folly. I will show to thee the word of God and his mysteries, accommodating my account to thine own fashions. Here is the mount, beloved of God, not the scene of tragic miseries, as Catherian, but a stage for truth to act upon. A holy mount, overshadowed with chaste and temperate groves. No Bacantes revel here with cruel rites, but the daughters of God hold festival, the pure, the gracious, divine songstresses of the awful mysteries of the word, with their modest band of worshippers. That band are the just ones, the song is a hymn in honour of the Almighty King. Virgins are singing it. Angels are heralding it. Prophets are repeating it. The chant sounds abroad. Those who are called hurry to the gathering. They hasten on, desiring to regain their father. Thou too, aged one, thou too must join us, leaving thy Thebes, adjuring thy soothsaying. Put out thy hand, and let us lead thee to the truth. Hasten, O Tiresias, believe. He shall shine upon thy blind eyes more cheerily than the sun, through whom the eyes of the blind see. O mysteries of truest holiness, O unsullied light, the sacred torches go before me, while I am brought into the presence of the heavens and God himself. My initiation places me among the holy ones. The Lord instructs me in his sacred rites, he seals his teachers with his illuminating guidance, and delivers over such as trust him to his Father, to be preserved forever. He is everlasting, Jesus the one Saviour, the great High Priest of the one God his Father, who intercedes for men, and who is their teacher. End of section 62《セクション63 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle。Tertullian's Account of the Rule of Faith, Part 1 。Tertullian was born at Carthage in Africa, a heathen. But when he grew up, he was converted to Christianity. At length he became a priest, either of the Church of Carthage or of Rome, it is uncertain which. That is, it is uncertain whether, as we now speak, he took orders in Carthage or Rome, whether he was ordained by the Bishop of Carthage or of Rome. For at that blessed time the whole extent of Christendom was as closely united as the different parts of England are, so that it was all one from which of the bishops of the Church Catholic a Christian was ordained for the ministry. Rome was at that time not more divided from Carthage, or from Corinth, or from Ephesus, or from Jerusalem, than Winchester from London, or Durham, or Oxford, or Norwich. It was natural, indeed, for many reasons, that a man should receive orders from the church in which he lived. But on fitting reasons, a Carthaginian, like Tertullian, 
might receive as commission from the Bishop of Rome, just as now a native of London, for instance, might become a priest of the Church of Oxford. This one Christian body, sometimes called Christendom, which means the Kingdom of Christ, sometimes the Church Catholic, which means the incorporate society of Christians in all lands as descended from the apostles and governed by the bishops, their representatives, consisted in the early times of two great portions, those who spake Greek and those who spoke Latin, which are sometimes familiarly called the Greek and the Latin churches. Not that they were really divided, more than the Welsh diocese are from the English, but for convenience sake they are considered as two, according to their respective languages. Writers from whose works extracts of his yet been made in these records all spoke Greek, or, as it is said, were of the Greek church, Ignatius, Polycarp, Justin, and the rest. As to the Christians of Lyon, etc., they were Greeks living in France, at that time a barbarous country. But Tertullian is a writer of the Latin church. Indeed, he is the oldest of those whose works have come down to us, having been born about A.D. 160, only sixty years after St. John's death. Tertullian's works, which have come down to us, are partly defences of Christianity and of the Orthodox faith, and partly moral treatises. They are chiefly valuable as witnesses of the state of the Church so short a time after the Apostles, as witnesses of what the Church then believed, taught, observed, as witnesses to the Creed as we hold it at this day, to episcopacy, to apostolical succession, the ceremonial of religion, etc. His own authority, indeed, is small, for though very powerful as a writer, he was not a sound divine, was extravagant, nay, even heterodox in some of his opinions, and at length fell away into one of the heresies of his time. But all this, of course, does not interfere at all with the value of his writings as bearing testimony to facts, to the existing condition of the Church. And moreover, as he writes ably, he is instructive on particular subjects, even though he is not a safe guide on the whole. The work from which an extract follows was written when he was about 40 years old, and may be called, in English, The Church's Plea, or Demure, Against Dissenters. Tertullian's argument is this. You who dissent from the Church, he says, are confuted by the very novelty of your doctrine. The true doctrine must be old and cannot be new. Now the church and its doctrines, which you despise, are much older than all your sects and their respective doctrines. Nay, the church is as old as the apostles. It was founded all over the world by the apostles, and transmits down from age to age the doctrines which it received from them. But from whom did you receive your doctrine? Not from the church, for you have gone out of it. Trace it up even for a few years if you can. Much less can you trace it up to the apostles. In truth, your doctrine began with you, or at least with your immediate teachers. Where was it before? Was it hidden from the church? That doctrine which Christ commanded should be set up on high among the faithful like a light within a house? Impossible. It plainly began with you. We can put our finger on the date of its birth, and therefore it is false. For Christ and his apostles planted, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the true gospel, according to the will of the Father. And he says, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Such is the argument of the work from which the following passages are extracted, which obviously contained an instructive lesson for this day. First, the separatists of Tertullian's age urged the words of our Lord, Seek and ye shall find, in proof that they might allowably strike out their own views, though novel, from the sacred text. He says upon this, Let us grant it has been said to all, Seek and ye shall find. Yet even as to these very words it is convenient to discuss their meaning with some guide of interpretation. No divine saying is so vague and extended, that its mere words are to be adhered to, and their real drift not determined. Now in the first place, I lay down this proposition, that doubtless some one certain faith was instituted by Christ, which the nations ought by all means to believe, and in seeking to find it, to seek with the purpose of believing when they had found it. 
The inquiry after one certain definite appointment of God must surely have an end somewhere or other. You are to seek until you find, and believe when you have found. After this, there is no more to do but to keep what you have believed, this being, in fact, one part of your belief, viz., that there is nothing farther to be believed, nor, therefore, to be sought. Inasmuch as you have found and believed that which was appointed by him, who does not set you to seek anything else but what he has appointed. I will presently make good, to the satisfaction of all doubters, that we have that in our possession which was appointed by Christ. In the meantime, from confidence in the proof, I anticipate so far as to admonish certain persons that they have nothing to seek beyond what they have already accepted, that that is what they were bound to seek, so that they must not interpret, without consideration of the import of the words, Seek and ye shall find. But the import of this saying is determined by three particulars, the matter, the time, the manner. By the matter, you should consider what is to be sought, by the time, when it is to be sought, by the manner, how far. Now that is to be sought, which Christ instituted. Then, of course, when you do not find it, so long, of course, until you find it. But you have found it when you have attained to belief, for you would not have believed if you had not found, as neither would you have sought unless that you might find. For where shall inquiry come to an end? Where faith take her stand? Where discovery gain her discharge? With Marcion? Nay, Valentinus also sets up seek and ye shall find. With Valentinus? Nay, Apelles too will beset me with the same declaration, and Hebion, and Simon, and all, one after another, have nothing else but this same text by which to insinuate themselves into my approbation, to bind me to their cause. I shall therefore come to no result, when I meet on every side, seek, and ye shall find. To understand the above argument, it must be borne in mind that at baptism the creed was committed to and accepted by the new Christian. Thus the time of belief was a certain definite date to which Tertullian refers. It must be observed also that the persons he speaks to were separatists who had been baptised in the church, not regular hereditary dissenters. Second, although we were to be for ever inquiring, yet where ought we to seek? Among heretics, where all is extraneous and adverse to the truth we hold, whom we are forbidden to approach? What servant expects food from one who is a stranger, not to say an enemy to his master? What soldier looks for presents and pay from unallied, not to say hostile princes, unless he be a downright deserter and rebel? Even she who sought diligently sought her piece of money in her own house. He who asks for loaves knocks at a friend's, not a stranger's door. And the widow interceded with a hard judge, but not an enemy. Let us then seek at home, and from those who are our own, and of that which is our own, and inquire respecting that only which may be called in question without injury to the rule of faith. But the rule of faith, that we may now profess what we mean to defend, is this, that there is one only God, and no other creator of the world beside, who brought all things out of nothing by his word sent forth before all things, that his word, called his Son, appeared in the name of God to the patriarchs in different ways, was always heard in the prophets, and at last conveyed by the Spirit and the power of God the Father into the Virgin Mary, became flesh in her womb, and lived as her Son, Jesus Christ, afterwards proclaimed a new law and a new promise of the kingdom of heaven, wrought miracles, was crucified, rose again on the third day, was taken into heaven, and sat down at the right hand of the Father sent the power of the Holy Spirit in his stead to guide believers, will come with glory to take his saints to the enjoyment of eternal life and his heavenly promises, and sentence the profane to eternal fire, bringing to life again good and bad, together with the resurrection of their flesh. This rule, instituted as it shall be proved by Christ, has no questions raised about it among us, except such as heresies introduce, 
and such as constitute men heretics. Oh, novice, it is better to be ignorant, lest you should learn what you ought not, now that you know what you ought. Thy faith, he says, hath made thee whole, not a perverse troubling of the scriptures. Faith has for its object the rule. The law of life is given you. Keep it, and you are made whole. But this cross-examining of scripture springs from restlessness. Pursue it, and it brings, not salvation, but mere credit for cleverness. Let restlessness yield to faith. Fame among men to salvation of the soul. Third, Next, he shows the futility of arguing with men who mutilate and alter the scriptures. But this topic does not so nearly concern us at this day, that we cannot tell what is coming upon us. He then proceeds as follows, to show that there is nothing gained in arguing from scripture when God has given us so clear a guide in the rule of faith, i.e. the creed preserved in the church. For though that rule is also contained in scripture and may be proved from it, yet heretics will say it cannot whereas they cannot deny the creed came from the apostles. But for that person, if there be such, for whose sake you descend to a comparison of scriptures, to confirm him when in doubt, will he incline to truth, or rather to heresies? Influenced by the very fact that he sees you have hitherto gained no ground, and stand even with your adversary in denying this point and defending that, he will undoubtedly leave this even contest in still greater uncertainty, not knowing which he is to judge to be heresy. For surely nothing can hinder them retorting upon us if they are minded the charges we bring against them. Nay, they must, in self-defence, say that we rather introduce corruptions of scripture and false expositions, inasmuch as they claim truth for themselves. Therefore I do not advise appeal to the scriptures. It is a ground in which there can be either no victory, or a doubtful one, or one as good as doubtful. For although the comparison of scripture did not end so as to place either party on an equality, the order of things requires that this point should be first advanced, which is now the only question, viz. To whom belongs the faith itself? Whose are the scriptures? By whom, and through whom, and when, and to whom? was that system of instruction committed, by which men are made Christians. For there, whatever the truth of Christian instruction and faith shall be proved to be, there will be the truth of the scriptures and of expositions and of all Christian traditions. This ground of the truth is, of course, the church. Tertullian does not mean to decry arguing from scripture. He only says it will not silence a subtle and perverse disputant. Whereas the rule of faith must silence them, it is so clear. Again, he argues, were not the scriptures committed to the church? Therefore the church is the appointed interpreter of them. Since his time, the church has gone wrong, but what he says is quite true of the primitive church, and this is the rule of the Church of England, to interpret scripture according to the usage of the first centuries. To be continued. End of section 63. Section 64 of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Tertullian on the Rule of Faith, Part 2. Fourth. By the rule of faith is sometimes meant the canon or document containing the faith, e.g. scripture or ascertained apostolical tradition. Sometimes the collection of articles of faith is in a confession, or, as it is sometimes called, the summa fidei. In the former sense, of course, the rule is the authority. In the latter, it is the very doctrine to be proved. Tertullian uses the word in both senses in this treatise. Christ Jesus our Lord, whatever is his nature, so to express myself, whatever is that God who is his Father, in whatever way he is God and man, whatever his doctrine, whatever his reward, certainly declared all this himself, during his sojourn on earth, his present and pre-existent nature, his father's will in which he was fulfilling, his commands to man, declared it either openly to the people or apart to his disciples, of whom he had especially selected twelve as his companions, and the destined teachers of the nations. Accordingly, 
On his departure to his father, after his resurrection, he gave them their commission, i.e. the eleven, for one had fallen away, and bade them go and teach the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. They then, without delay, apostles as they were called, or missionaries, chose a twelfth by lot, according to the direction of the prophetic psalm. And when they had been visited by the promised spirit of miracle and tongues, first preached faith in Jesus Christ, and founded churches throughout Judea. Next went forward into the wide world, publishing the same doctrine to the Gentiles, and establishing churches in every city. From these in turn the faith has been, and still is, propagated continually for the creation of new churches, which, as well as the first founded, are called apostolic, as being the offspring of those which were really such. Every family must be referred to its first original. Therefore these churches, many though they be in flourishing, yet are but one, that one original which the apostles established, and from which they all spring. So they are all original, and all apostolic, all being one. That oneness is evidenced by their loving intercommunion, and the name of brotherhood, and the interchange of hospitality. These common rites are secured solely by their unanimous tradition of one and the same sacred covenant. From this point, therefore, we begin our plea against all who preach a new doctrine. If the Lord Jesus Christ sent the apostles to preach, it follows that no other preachers are to be received but those whom Christ appointed, because no one knoweth the Father but the Son, and he to whom the Son hath revealed him. And it seems that the Son has revealed him to no others than the apostles, whom he sent to preach that doctrine, of course, which he revealed to them. But what they preached, that is, what Christ revealed to them, I shall here also plead should be proved in no other way than by means of those same churches which the apostles themselves founded by preaching to them, as well as by word of mouth, as afterwards by epistles. If these things are so, it follows immediately that all doctrine that agrees with those apostolical churches, the depositaries and sources of the faith, is to be reckoned for truth, preserving, as they doubtless do, what they received from the apostles, the apostles from Christ, Christ from God. But that every other doctrine is to be presumed false, that savours of contradiction to the truth of the churches, and of the apostles, and of Christ, and of God. It only remains then to prove whether this our doctrine, the rule of which we have given above, is to be considered of apostolic tradition, and from this very fact, whether the rest come not of falsehood. Now our very intercommunion with the apostolical churches, which is matter of fact, is an evidence that our doctrine does not differ from theirs. This is the witness of the truth. Fifth. To get rid of the above plain argument, the separatists used to argue that the apostles had a private doctrine over and above that which they taught in open church, or again that they were not fully instructed in Christian truth, alleging for example, St. Peter's error in conduct at Antioch, etc. The following passage is an answer to the former of these suppositions. Sometimes they maintain not that the apostles were ignorant or discordant in their preaching, but with a like wildness that they did not reveal all things to all, for that they entrusted some truths openly to all, but some secretly to a few. Now St. Paul uses this expression to Timothy, O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thee. And again, keep the good thing committed to thee. What is this thing committed, so proper as to be assigned to some different doctrine? Is it of that declaration of which he says, This charge I entrust with thee, son Timothy? Also of that precept of which he says, I charge thee before God, who giveth life to all things, and Jesus Christ, who witness before Pontius Pilate a good confession, that thou keep the precept. But what precept, and what charge? To be understood from what is written before and after, that there is not anything secretly pointed out by this expression relating to more abstruse doctrine, but that rather a charge is given concerning, not admitting any besides that which he had heard from himself, and I think openly. He says, before many witnesses. 
Who these many witnesses were, supposing they do not choose to understand the church, makes no difference, since nothing can have been secret that was brought out before many witnesses. As to his admonishing him to commit these things to faithful men who are fit to teach others also, this is not to be interpreted as any proof of some hidden gospel. For when he says these things, he says it of those at which he was at present writing. But concerning hidden things, as concerning things not mentioned but tacitly understood, he would have said not these, but those. His direction about committing to faithful men did not imply a secrecy. But of course, care to choose such men for the commission as would preach the gospel with judgment and discrimination. Not casting pearls to swine, or holy things to dogs, as the Lord speaks. Our Lord himself spoke forth openly, without the least hint of any hidden covenant. He himself had ordered that if they had heard anything in darkness and in secret, they should proclaim it in the light and on the housetop. If then it is incredible that the apostles either were ignorant of the fullness of the gospel message or abstained from publishing it to all in its completeness, let us see next whether, though the apostles spoke with plainness and fullness, yet the churches, by their own fault, received other than the apostles declared. You may find all such means of exciting scruples put forward by heretics. They take hold of the correction of the churches by the apostles, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? And ye did well, who hath hindered you? And the very beginning, I wonder that ye are so soon departed from him who called you into grace, into another gospel. Of that too, written to the Corinthians, that they were yet carnal, who ought to be fed with milk and not yet fit for meat, as they thought they knew something, when as yet they knew nothing as it ought to be known. But surely the fault found with the churches, which is their very objection, is a ground for believing it was corrected. Besides, let them also recollect those in whose faith and knowledge and conversation the apostle rejoices and gives thanks to God, which, be it observed, to this day share the rights of the one instituted body with those that were then blamed. However grant all have erred, Grant even an apostle has been so mistaken as to impart his message only to a few. Grant that the Holy Spirit is not vouchsafed to lead any church into the truth, though for this cause sent by Christ, and for this cause asked of the Father, that he might be a teacher of the truth. Grant that the steward of God, the vice-regent of Christ, has neglected his office, suffering the churches meanwhile to understand and to believe otherwise than he himself declared by the apostles, is it likely that so many and so large churches should have run by mistake into one belief? Different courses have different issues. The teaching of the churches must then have varied in their form. But what we find the same throughout many is not a mistake, but a tradition. Let a man then be bold and say that they erred who first delivered it. But however the error arose... I suppose it rained on as long as heresies were unknown. Truth awaited her release by some Marcionites and Valentinians. What well, meanwhile the gospel was preached amiss, men believed amiss, as so many thousands were baptized amiss, so many works of faith were done amiss, so many miracles, so many spiritual gifts were wrought amiss, so many priesthoods, so many ministries discharged amiss. Finally, so many martyrdoms crowned amiss. Or well, if not altogether amiss and in vain, what a thing is it that the cause of God should be in progress before it was known of what God? That there should have been Christians before Christ was found? Heresy before true doctrine? Nay, but in all things the truth precedes the image. The likeness comes after the reality. But it is absurd enough to suppose heresy to have come first in that teaching even because it is that same teaching which foretold that there should be heresies. It was written to a church holding that doctrine. Yea, the doctrine itself writes to its church. And if an angel from heaven preach another gospel to you, beside that we have preached, let him be accursed. Sixth. He next proceeds to show more fully that apostolicity is the test of truth. But if any heresies dare to place themselves in the apostolic age, that they may seem, therefore, to have been delivered by the apostles, 
because they existed under the apostles, we may say, let them then show the rise of their churches, let them unroll the line of their bishops, so running down by successions from the beginning, that their first bishop may have had for his authority and predecessor some one of the apostles, or such apostolic men as continue to hold with the apostles. For in this manner the apostolic churches deduce their lines, as the church of the Smyrnaeans produces Polycarp, appointed by John, as that of the Romans, Clement, in like manner ordained by Peter, and as the others, in like manner, point to those who were appointed as bishops by the apostles, to deliver down for them the apostolic seed, that the heretics forge any such records, for what is unlawful for them after blasphemy. But though they should have forged them, they will gain nothing. For their doctrine itself, compared with that of the apostles, would declare by its own diversity and contrariety that it has neither apostle nor any apostolic man for its author. Because as the apostles would not have taught different things among themselves, so neither would the apostolic men have put forth things contradictory to the apostles, excepting such men as revolted from the apostles and preached otherwise. This is the challenge they will receive from those churches, which though they can show none of the apostles or apostolic men for their authority, as being much later, those even that are rising every day, yet conspiring in the same faith, are held no less apostolical on account of their kindred doctrine. Thus let all heresies, challenged by our churches to either trial, prove themselves apostolic in whatever way they think right. However, they are not so. Nor can prove themselves what they are not. Nor are they received into peace and communion by churches in any sense apostolical. For as much as for the difference of their faith, they are in no wise apostolic. Let all heresies challenged and convicted by us on these terms, whether such as are later than or contemporary with the apostles, so that they differ from them, whether generally or specially marked by them, so that they have been condemned beforehand by them, dare to offer and answer any similar plea against our system. For if they deny the truth of it, they ought to convict it of heresy, by the same method by which they themselves are convicted, and to show at the same time where that truth is to be sought, is now sufficiently proved not to be with them. That which we maintain is not later. Nay, it is before all others. This will be the testimony to the truth, as everywhere having the precedence in time. What in fact is not condemned, nay, is defended by the apostles, this carries proof of its being theirs. For what they do not condemn, who condemn every alien system, they show to be their own and therefore even maintain. Come now, you that wish to turn this restlessness to profit in the search after salvation. Run over the apostolic churches, in which the very chairs of the apostles still hold place of honour, in which the very letters they wrote are recited, echoing the voice and imaging the person of each of them. Is Achaia nearest to you? You have Corinth. If you are not far from Macedonia, you have Philippi. You have the Thessalonians. If you can reach Asia, you have Ephesus. But if you were in the neighbourhood of Italy, you have Rome, whence we also draw our own authority. How happy is that church, where the apostles poured forth their whole doctrine together with their blood, where Peter is likened and suffering to the Lord, where Paul is crowned with an end like the Baptists, where the apostle John, having been plunged in heated oil and suffered nothing, was banished to his island. Let us see what this church has learned what she has taught, what tokens she has sent of doctrine to the African churches. She knows one God, the creator of the universe, and Christ Jesus of the Virgin Mary, the son of the creator, and the resurrection of the flesh. She unites the law and the prophets with the evangelical and apostolical writings, and thence brings her faith. This she signs with water, clothes with the Holy Spirit, feeds with the Eucharist, encourages by martyrdom, and therefore will acknowledge no one who opposes it. This is the teaching, I say not now, which foretold future heresies, but out of which heresies have arisen, though they cease to be scions of it from the time that they opposed it. Even from the kernel of the mild, rich and serviceable olive, a harsh, wild olive springs, even from the seed of the most delicious and sweetest fig, a wayward and barren wild fig tree arises, 
Thus also heresies are from us, not of us, degenerate from the stock of truth and running into the weeds of falsehood. End of section 64. End of Tracts for the Times, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman, et al.